This is just a general overview of how I organize this video. I have an intro after this, which explains a few things. Then I'll go through an updated timeline. Then I'll review Kagan Klein about him, his affidavit. Then I go through his police interview from 2020, his headline news interview, and then a long list of questions I have for him. Then I'll go through a review about his dad, Tony Klein. Next will be the ski mask incident. Then some potential motives for the clients to be the killer, reasons for and against the clients as the killer. And then I have a section about whether Ron Logan could be the killer. And then I finish with some various topics. So do you have your scuba gear ready? Cause I'm about to do another Delphi deep dive with the latest updates from this past few months. For people who don't know me, lucky you, but I became obsessed with the Delphi murders in February, 2021 for the four year anniversary. And over the next two and a half months, I spent like 300 hours just obsessing about it, trying to solve it. Obviously I failed, but after I was finished, I didn't really feel like just deleting all my files. So I made a YouTube video. And since then people have said some nice things about it. And quite a few people subscribed to my channel and I felt bad. So I said I would do another true crime video and I spent like 600 hours looking into the murder of Missy Beavers. So since I finished that video, I spent the past five months looking into the clowns, AKA the Kleins, Kagan and Tony, and also Ron Logan, trying to figure out could those three guys have been the murderer of Abby and Libby. I don't just do summary videos. I foolishly think I might be able to find one thing that could solve these cases. And so far I'm 0 for 2 for Delphi and Missy Beavers. But some people find my research helpful. So that's why I make these videos because I spend hundreds of hours and these videos are all that research consolidated into, I know this one is four and a half hours and people are like, ain't nobody got time for that. But there's some helpful things to do in YouTube. You can watch up to two times as fast. Also, I make different chapters so you can jump to a section that you want. And during this video, I review Kagan's 2020 police interview, which is 194 pages. And it ended up being a one hour and 52 minute recording. So if you have already read that, you can forget about it. You don't have to watch it again. But I did include some of my thoughts as I was reading through it. So if you want to know what my thoughts are, you can go to my website that I created where I upload my previous Delphi files to be helpful to other people. And I have updated that. And in the Word document for the interview, just look for the yellow highlighted stuff. That's my comments and thoughts. If you want a quick overview of the Delphi updates, this video ain't for you because it's four and a half hours long. There's plenty of other videos that are shorter, but this is more for people who really want deep dives. So I do a lot of stuff that's research based on who are they, what has been in their past. So some people might be turned off like that has nothing to do with Delphi, but I'm trying to paint a picture of whether these guys could be the killers of Abby and Libby. I've never asked for likes or subscribers or hit that notification bell. Because honestly, every time I make a video public, I'm always afraid I'm waking somebody up, like notifying them on their cell phone. I have a few hundred videos on my channel and they're mostly ridiculous. But if you find this video informative, maybe you can click like and comment because I think that moves videos up higher in the search results. And there seems to be a lot of Delphi videos these days and I'm sure there's a lot more coming. So if you think other people would find this helpful, maybe click like and maybe comment. That's all I'm saying, but I'm not begging for it. But don't subscribe and do not hit that notification bell. I don't want to wake you up. On my two other true crime videos, people leave comments like, how do I contact you privately? And I always think, well, like picking up restaurant food during COVID, I'm contactless. But I will reply to most comments under the video. And I have reluctantly decided to do two more live chats so they're going to be Sunday, September 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern and Thursday, October 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for all the nice comments on my Delphi video, the first one. Who knows if there's gonna be nice comments on this one and my Missy Beavers video. Hopefully you will find this helpful. If you do watch this entire video, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff and probably more than you wanna know about Tony and Kagan and a little bit about Ron who, spoiler alert, he ain't the killer. So good luck and somebody please solve this. I made this timeline to try and make it easier to follow all the different events. So on February 1st or 2nd is when Kagan said, I met them in the beginning of February, like the 1st or 2nd. I never spoke to her beyond February 1st or 2nd. I looked on the calendar and February 1st, 2017 was a Wednesday. So if he said he talked to them during a sleepover, a Wednesday doesn't really line up. I believe this is a reference to his 2017 interview where an officer said, look, we know you spoke to her the day she was murdered. Kagan said, absolutely not. I blocked her. She was annoying me after the first or second. If she only knew who she was really talking to, she would have blocked him. Date unknown is when Libby added Anthony shots on Instagram. I'm pretty sure, although not certain, there were two different sleepovers with Libby and her friend. But I think this other girl was somebody other than Ski Mask Girl. 
And I think the sleepovers were one in early February and then the Saturday before Monday's murder. People talk about Libby resetting her phone. Her family said it was because it kept freezing. And I believe it was the weekend before the murders, which would have been February 4th and 5th, which was Saturday, Sunday. On February 10th, which was a Friday, Libby spent the day with her grandmother for her job doing home inspections. Then she bought a new pair of green Converse shoes. Then she went to a basketball game, her aunt's house for a while, and a late movie. On February 11th, Saturday, she spent the night with another friend. I'm not sure if this is the same girl who had a sleepover when Libby was first introduced to Anthony Schatz. On Sunday, February 12th, Kelsey, Libby's sister, picked her up from her friend's house. Later, Abby's mom picked up Libby and they practiced softball at a park. Then she dropped them off at Libby's house for another sleepover. Also on February 12th, Kagan posted on Facebook that he started a new job as a table games dealer in Las Vegas. This was the day after he was chatting with Libby and her friend. So did Kagan reveal something or decided to do something based on what was said during one of those communications with the girls on Saturday night? Kagan's Facebook post does not seem to have been edited later, like some of his other posts. So did he know that the following day, on Monday, he and his dad, or another accomplice, were going to murder Libby and he wanted an alibi? Why would he post that he started working in a Las Vegas casino if he was sitting in his dad's house in Indiana? He told HLN in 2021 he was not a casino dealer. Kagan also told HLN that he and his father watched WWE pay-per-view wrestling the night of February 13th, but my research revealed that event was February 12th. February 13th was the day of the murders. Anthony Schatz, aka Kagan, chatted with Libby and knew that they had a day off if Libby or another girl from Delphi told him. Kagan said he was with his father all day in Peru at home, then his grandparents, then at home watching WWE. Kagan told law enforcement in February 2017 that he went to his grandparents, quote, 12 to 2 or 12 to 3, and then you came back home. Kagan told HLN in December 2021, we watched a wrestling pay-per-view that night, and he, Tony, was at my grandparents' house with me around 5 and 6, and then the rest of the night. So what is it, Kagokio? At 2.13 p.m. was when Libby's 43-second video was taken with the killer saying, down the hill, near the end of it. It takes about 35 to 40 minutes from Tony Klein's house to the bridge. Kagan said law enforcement showed him his GPS phone locations from February 13th, and it connected to Wi-Fi at another Peru home, not his grandparents. But Kagan said none of the locations were anywhere near Delphi. Kagan said the home was a friend who gave him drugs. Some people speculate that the house may belong to Kagan's male cousin. Police said phone data showed that Kagan was watching adult videos on his phone at this house. It has not been revealed where Tony's phone pinged. If it pinged in Delphi at the bridge, why hasn't Tony been arrested? This is a screenshot of Tony's Facebook check-in, so he brings his phone everywhere and is active, including in February 2017, although you can see there's a gap from June 18th, 2016 until the next time is February 21st, 2017 in Vegas, where he was sure to check in six times. Date unknown. After the murders, Anthony Schatz messaged a friend of Libby's, I'm not sure if it was Ski Mask Girl or not, that he was supposed to meet up with Libby, quote, but she never showed up. It's unknown when this message was sent and which date or location any meeting was supposed to occur. Most people assume it was February 13th at the bridge, but he could have been talking about a prior date or location. Kagan denies ever sending this message. February 19th, Anthony Schatz slash Kagan chatted with a girl, possibly Libby's friend, from Galveston, which is 35 minutes from Delphi, and got her address pretending to be Anthony Schatz to come over for a hookup after she got home from school the following day. Kagan searched her relative's accounts on Facebook on the 19th. This girl is the sister of some guy that Kagan was friends with in middle school. February 20th was a Monday, which again is a day that Tony Klein has off. I have a whole nother document and section just for this gay mask incident, which I'll get to later. In Kagan's 2020 police interview, the detective said, that's the incident that started everything else last time. Referring to the ski mask incident causing the February 25th, 2017 search warrant of Kagan's home with his father. On February 21st, Kagan and Tony flew to Las Vegas for a trip that they said had been planned before the murders. Tony posted photos from the Nevada desert during the day and on top of the stratosphere in Las Vegas that night. On February 23rd in Las Vegas, Kagan was supposed to meet a guy to buy marijuana and later sell it for thousands of dollars. 
At least that's according to him. If he was going to sell marijuana for thousands of dollars, how much money did he bring to Las Vegas to buy it? I wonder if Kagan was high on weed during both of his interviews. <laughs> Supposedly, he found a phone in a rental car and kept it. On February 25th, the clients returned from Las Vegas and their home was raided soon after, and they were interviewed. Kagan failed a polygraph about knowing about the Delphi investigation. He said he gave DNA and a hair follicle. When Kagan got home from his interview that night, his main phone was in the kitchen because law enforcement had missed taking it. So he deleted Snapchat, Instagram, and Meet Me apps. He also deleted his search history from February 10th to the 15th, but then he searched how long does DNA last? Kagan has said that he moved to Las Vegas in June of 2017, but according to the mother of his Las Vegas roommate, who had previously lived next to the Kleins for a while and did drugs with Kagan, she said that they moved in March 2017, a month after the murders. She said that Kagan went to the friend's mom's house and helped him pack stuff into a U-Haul, and Kagan said he was moving there also, but they said that they were going to Colorado, but they moved to Las Vegas instead. In July 2017, the roommate, who is a single father, his two young kids moved in with them in Las Vegas. There is no evidence that Kagan abused them. The mother said that she visited in February 2018, and Kagan was still in Las Vegas, and Tony, Kagan's father, arrived soon after she left for a visit. Kagan had a padlock on his Vegas bedroom door, and the mother said Kagan doesn't drive and stayed in his room most of the time. In July or August of 2018, the friend moved back to Peru, and Kagan also came back and said something happened with his grandfather, and Kagan never went back to Las Vegas. On August 12, 2018, Kagan posted a photo showing that he was flying from Las Vegas back to Indiana. The mother said that police did not interview the friend until after the August 2020 arrest because Kagan did not blame the friend in his earlier 2017 interview. The mom did not think that the killer's voice could be Kagan and said he's too lazy to be able to kill two girls. She said Tony has a higher pitched voice, but she did not have a lot of interaction with him. The interview with the mother was on the YouTube channel, It's a Criming Shame, which I think used to be called Sunny Justice which my idiot brain always comes up with nicknames for people, and I do like the opposite. So whenever I hear Sunny Justice, I think Cloudy Injustice. <laughs> but it's no shade against her. She has an interesting channel, and she definitely... What does she definitely do? Let me think of something nice to say. <laughs> she definitely tries to investigate different ways that people are not thinking about. Did that sound nice? No, I'm totally kidding. Let's just move on, but no shade against her. On August 19th, 2020, Kagan was charged with 30 felonies based on the photos of underage girls he received using fake online accounts. In that year's interview, Kagan said that police told him that they thought his father, Tony, was involved and were seemingly trying to get Kagan to admit it. A year and a half later, on December 6, 2021, police revealed Anthony Shaw's online accounts were catfishing young girls and asked for tips to the Delphi line. Three days later, on December 9th, Kagan gave an interview with Headline News and denied involvement in Delphi. In August 2022, the Murder Sheet podcast said a source told them that Kagan searched the Delphi Marathon gas station on the day of the murders. Kagan's trial was also moved from September to January 2023. On August 19th, Kagan was transferred from the Miami County Jail into temporary custody of the Indiana State Police. Some people are assuming that Kagan may be revealing more details about his possible involvement in Delphi to receive a lighter sentence in the CSAM or Delphi cases. But Kagan is also allegedly text messaging or sext messaging podcasters and women, and the sexual tone of his text doesn't really sound to me like someone about to admit to his involvement in a murder for Delphi. I think he said he wants people to get him off, but I don't know if he means charges or something else. At the end of August, the Murder Sheet podcast also said that police were looking in the Wabash River under a bridge a few minutes from Tony Klein's house and that it's related to the Delphi investigation. The search has lasted over a week. People are wondering if this is where maybe Tony or Kagan threw evidence from the Delphi murders, possibly as they were driving back from Delphi to their home. But there has been no clarification from law enforcement about what they were looking for, and locals were told it was just a training exercise, to which everyone replied, Sure, Jan. Legal documents from when police were looking into Ron Logan as a potential suspect were leaked, and they contain some new information about the case. It stated Libby and Abby were walking the trail near this latitude and longitude at approximately 2.13 p.m., which was the time of last contact by cellular device. Libby and Abby are presumed to have made contact with the unknown male at approximately 2.13 p.m. based upon analysis of Libby's cell phone video, which was 43 seconds. Near the end of the video, the suspect speaks to the victim saying, down the hill. A large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene. 
Because of the nature of the victim's wounds, it is nearly certain that the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his person slash clothing. Articles of clothing of one of the victims were missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. Since the beginning of this case, there were rumors that a police scanner said underwear was in or near the creek and they're presumed to have belonged to Libby. I'm not sure if one of the items was her shoe that was found on the opposite side of the creek. Why would Libby's clothing be removed and not Abby's? I'm kind of confused about this wording and I'm wondering what other people think. So it says articles of clothing of one of the victims were missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. Do they mean that clothing was missing from her body at the crime scene, but that those same pieces of clothing were found elsewhere somewhat near the crime scene, but not exactly where the bodies were? If the two items were taken away by the killer, I wonder if he accidentally got his DNA on her clothing and took it with him. Some people online said that the unredacted document said that it was underwear and a sock. Obviously Libby was missing her shoe, so why was her sock taken off that foot? And if her underwear was missing, where were her pants and how did they come off? It appeared that the girl's bodies were moved and staged. I wondered if the killer pulled Abby by her sweatshirt hood using his gloves, but he could not pull Libby the same way, so he had to use his hands under her armpits and his jacket touched her clothing. How would the killer have gotten her pants off and her underwear without getting his DNA at the scene? Was he wearing gloves? Don't people usually drag somebody by under their armpits or their feet? Is it possible that one of Libby's shoes came off when the killer was dragging her and then the killer threw it to the other side of the creek? I talked about this in my first video, but more about a struggle scenario. In the photo of Abby on the bridge, it looks like her sweatshirt has a hood. So I'm wondering if the killer pulled her hood at some point to move her body. But maybe he could not pull Libby in the same way since her sweatshirt did not have a hood. So did he have to pull her by her feet? Libby and Abby had no visible signs of a struggle or fight, which is kind of unbelievable that one person could have gotten them across the creek and somehow stabbed them with a knife without either of them struggling. Approximately 5.30 p.m. was the last successful ping of the cellular phone by AT&T. The victims were located deceased on February 14, 2017, at approximately 12.17 p.m. Investigators located unknown fibers and unidentified hairs, which may later be used for comparison of similar fibers or hairs. Ron Logan owns numerous weapons, including handguns and knives, that were observed by law enforcement officers during the execution of a search warrant that took place at his home on March 6, 2017. Logan's home was searched as a result of a probation violation. The search was limited to the discovery of firearms and included only his main residence. Why did they initially only look for firearms at Ron's house? Did Libby's video reveal that the killer mentioned something about a gun? Video from the transfer station shows Logan driving his white Ford pickup truck between 11.53 and 11.58 a.m. If you saw my first video on the Delphi murders, I included a section about an abandoned white truck on the side of Indiana Packers and wondered if it was used by the killer or an accomplice. So according to this, there is video at the transfer station which would have shown somebody walking to and from the bridge to that truck, so it seems unlikely that that was true. The affidavit was signed on March 17, 2017, and it was signed by Curtis Fouts, who was the judge that some people thought might be a suspect. In this section, I'm going to talk about Kagan and some facts about him and try and clear up maybe some of his lies that he's told and maybe provide some insight into whether he is capable of committing these murders. His full name is Kagan Anthony Klein. In an interview, his half-brother pronounced his name Kagan, not Keegan. So I'm going to go with Kagan. Like, there's a keg in the frat house. His nickname is apparently Keggy, but I gave him the nickname Kegokio because he lies more than Pinocchio, only instead of his nose getting bigger each time, his stomach does. <laughs> He was born May 27, 1994, and was 22 at the time of the murders. In an August 2020 legal document, it showed that his height was 6 foot and 275. But they may have gotten that information from a driver license, even though he said he did not have one, or an ID card, or just asked him, and obviously he's known to lie, so I'm not sure about these stats. During his headline news interview, he said, I'm like 5'11", 6 foot, and if somebody says 5'11", 6 foot, it means they're maybe 5'10", or 5'11". He said he was 300 to 310 pounds in February 2017 at the time of the murders, but if he is the killer, you would assume that he's lying to make it seem like he was not the same body weight as the killer. He said his dad is about the same height, but in pictures, his dad seems taller. He said he weighs 280 pounds. 
In some pictures, his dad looks like he could be two to three inches taller than Kagan. I did a height comparison that I'll show in a different section. Kagan suffers from anxiety, epileptic seizures, and bad haircuts. Instead of super cuts, he goes to super bad cuts. I created this list of his residences. On February 13th, 2017, he was in Peru, Indiana with his father. Even though on February 12th, the day before, he wrote on Facebook that he had started a job in Vegas. March 2017 to August 12th, 2018, he lived in Las Vegas with his friend, who he later falsely accused of doing horrible things. So he left Indiana about a month after the murders, and was he leaving just to get away from the police due to CSAM and Delphi charges? June 9th, 2018, he tweeted that he was at the Las Vegas airport and went to Colorado and returned to Vegas. In spring and summer 2018, he tweeted that he was on the Warped Tour in a variety of states and finished on August 5th, 2018. On August 11th, 2018, Tony's Facebook said, My son is coming home for a week tomorrow. Hasn't been home in two years. Can't wait to see him. March 2017 to August 2018 is one year and five months. I don't know, this family isn't really known for their math or English skills. On August 12th, Kagan tweeted that he flew from Las Vegas to Indiana. And on Facebook, he posted a photo saying, Lol, I hate Frontier Airlines. Lol, WTF am I supposed to do with this? So he has a Rolex and brags about being rich, but he flies economy on Frontier Airlines. Okay. After his visit back to Indiana, he did not go to Las Vegas. He moved in with his mom and his new stepfather. Apparently, somehow he found an actual girlfriend, and he was living with her until he was arrested August 19th, 2020. Since then, he's been currently living in a jail cell. On March 25th, 2017, Kagan tweeted, All alone in a wallless prison. So... At least his dream came true, and now he's in a prison cell with four walls surrounded by other criminals. So he was arrested on August 19th, 2020, and charged with 30 felonies. I have another section where I go through all of that information. His trial has been postponed at least twice, and the latest was from September 2022 to January 2023. He may be working on a plea deal with police. I wonder why Kagan's parents have not bailed him out. Apparently the bail would be about $26,000. Why did it take three and a half years to arrest him? Police told him it was because he started one of the biggest CSAM ring investigations in Indiana history. It seems kind of dangerous that they found so much abuse material on his phones and they still let him go around. Were police hoping that he was going to lead them to the Delphi killer if it's not him or his father? By tracking all of his phone communications after his 2017 raid? Three and a half years just seems like a really long time for something like this. I created this list of all the online profiles I found for Kagan, and I'm sure this is not all of them. Homeboy sure was busy. No wonder why he couldn't have a job. He's always busy on the internet. Apparently, he had a profile on the personal site, Badu. Dropbox, I cannot access or verify this. He had at least two Facebook accounts. On Instagram, he had one that was ddkline 77 He had the Anthony Shots. He had another one that was Switch and Swishers. Another one, I am Kagan Klein. On Kick, he had Anthony Shots and also the Emily Ann 45. I did a search and he last updated his profile photo on January 29th, 2017, which was a Sunday. I wondered, was this around the time of the sleepover with Libby and her friend? In my last video, I showed how I found Libby's Kick update in her photo, and it's obviously her looking very young, and it's no wonder why Kegan was trying to talk to her. The YouTube channel Fig Solves has a video that shows Anthony Shots liked a post Libby made on Instagram on December 20th, 2016. He obviously could have liked it in February and not December. When was this screenshot taken? Apparently he maybe unliked it later on. On this Facebook message, the person said, I'm weirded out. I went to Liberty's Instagram yesterday and noticed that a really strikingly attractive teenager had liked a couple of her posts. I back searched his profile photo and it was an old photo of a male model, not a real person as he was claiming to be but he claimed to have just moved to Lafayette. His profile was private and a typical phishing profile, but he only had like 50 followers. Today, the likes from him are gone and either his name is changed or he's deleted his profile. So was he removing Instagram likes so he would not be linked to Libby's murder or just because of CSAM underage charges? As I said in other places in this video, I don't know why Kegan only deleted the apps on his phone, but not the actual profiles. Is it possible that Kegan did delete the Anthony Schatz profile on Instagram and then the police recreated it to see who would message the account and the police are just pretending to be him? He said he used the Meet Me app the most to meet girls online. He had a MySpace back when that was actually a thing. 
he had a Pinterest where his screen name was I Love School, Not 45. Again, the usage of the 45. There are two Poshmark accounts. One is Kagan Klein, and he's following 699 people, but almost all of them are females. The other is Kagan Klein 420, but the profile photo is of Tony. Some people said that there was a Reddit account, it's Allison, but I did not confirm this and it is deleted. This may have been his girlfriend from 2020. He had a lot of different Skype accounts, Anthony Schatz, Kagan Klein 765, Kagan Klein 45, Kagan Klein 420, and Kagan Klein. Apparently Tony Klein also has Skype accounts. He had at least two Snapchats, obviously Anthony Schatz and another one for Kagan Klein. On SoundCloud, he had two accounts, one for Switch and Switchers and one for Kagan Klein. There's a Spotify account, which apparently has his music, which I still have not been able to figure out who that is. I refuse to believe that's him. But people have said, do not click on his Spotify because he might get money every time somebody clicks. He apparently had a TikTok account. On Twitter, he had about 2,100 tweets, which I ended up reading through every single one. It was so much fun. His screen name was Switch and Swishers, which might be a reference to BDSM and also Swishers might be for basketball he was a fan of. He has a Venmo account, Kagan Klein, and apparently there's also another one for Anthony Schatz. Police mentioned Yellow and Yubo apps, which I was not able to find any accounts on those. And on YouTube, he created the profile Klein Photography on March 27th, 2011, when he was 16 years old. And it has the username DJ Keggy. This is a list of his reported email addresses I love school not at AOL.com, Kagan Klein 420 at Hotmail, Kagan Klein at Hotmail. Kagan Klein at Gmail, Kagan Klein 45 at iCloud, and Kagan Klein 45 at Hotmail. Some usernames are obviously Kagan Klein, Emily Ann 45, I Hate School Not 45, and Anthony Schatz. This is a listing of some of the search terms Kagan looked up. He deleted his main phone search history from February 10th to the 15th, 2017. After that, he searched Delphi murders before and during his February 21st to 25th Las Vegas vacation. He looked up articles with the titles, Tips Pour In After Suspect Identified in Delphi Double Homicide, New Details in the Delphi Killings to be Released, and the audio clip. I will not read some of these search terms out loud because they're inappropriate, but they do reveal somebody very interested in young girls. So he looked up 12-year-old, 12-year-old body, 12-year-old girl stomach, 13, 14, 16 years old. He was looking for preteen pictures that were saved off of Snapchat. Beautiful young teens on webcam. Preteen body. He looked up bestiality, which is doing the nasty with animals. Photos of Sandy Hook bodies, which is that mass murder of young kids. Murder of John Benet Ramsey. O.J. Simpson. How long does DNA last? He searched that term after his 2017 interview and DNA test. Can law enforcement trace IP addresses from social media? He said he searched that because he was chatting with underage girls, not because of Delphi. He also searched server information to see how much information gets stored on servers. He said this was due to his work. What work? On February 19th, the day before the ski mask incident, Kagan searched Facebook for the names of the family members of the ski mask girl. The murder sheet revealed on August 23rd, 2022, that sources told them that Kagan searched for the Marathon gas station in Delphi on the day of the murders, but the FBI failed to get the surveillance video from the station. Apparently, the FBI brought a portable thumb drive, which did not work, so they took the entire hard drive, but it also did not successfully provide the video from that day, which made me think, like, could they not just look at the video while they were there and use their cell phone to videotape it as backup? Just a quick, helpful tip about thumb drives. One time I had a thumb drive in a desktop computer. I closed my Word document and waited about 10 seconds and it seemed to have finished. And so I pulled the thumb drive out of the desktop computer. About a week later, I tried to open the document and lost about five weeks of work because I did not properly eject the thumb drive. So to avoid that, always make sure you properly eject any kind of drive. So this is a street view from Google Maps from August 2018 of Marathon Gas Station in Delphi. There's a security camera up here. So why would Kagan search this gas station? Did Libby suggest that they meet at the gas station? Over here, you can see it says pizza, but it may not have been there in 2017. I recently called this gas station and they answered the phone as Marimart. The person who answered the phone said they have not done pizza in a while and there are no tables to eat inside. I mean like to sit at, not to actually eat a table. As I'm sure everybody else is, I'm really curious to know what kind of conversation 
Libby and Anthony Schatz had on the 13th. Did it mention meeting? Where? I also wondered, did Kagan possibly go to the gas station to meet the killer and get weed or cash as payment for giving Libby's contact information and location to him. Kagan admitted to using Craigslist in Las Vegas for weed, so he was probably using Craigslist in Indiana for weed and other things. If I was in law enforcement, I would have Craigslist search all posts Kagan made and replied to, which might show communication with the killer if it truly is somebody other than the clients. I noticed in the back over here there's a dumpster and wondered maybe if he searched this to put the duffel bag with the murder weapon and clothes in after the crime. There was some talk about the killer maybe having a duffel bag with the murder weapon and bloody clothes after the crime. I'm not insinuating that the killer dumped that stuff in this dumpster, but I was just trying to think of ways why Kagan might search this gas station. I also noticed over here there's a payphone which I think the only people who still use payphones also use MySpace. On the left side of the gas station, it looks like there might be one or possibly two more security cameras. And here's another security camera on this side for the gas pumps. This is just a 360 view. Just trying to think of other ways why Kagan might have searched this. Was there a product or a signature used in the murders that could have been purchased at a gas station? I just went through a long list of items that police said Kagan searched, but if he had searched for the Marathon gas station on the day of the murders, why did they not bring that up in his 2020 interview and ask him why? Unless he was asked that question in his 2017 interview. Why did police show his phone GPS from that day and Delphi and the gas station was not on it? Did law enforcement know of this search early on? Did the gas station provide records showing who used a credit card to pay for gas that day? Who walked into the store to pay cash that day? Apparently they don't know because they don't have the video surveillance. I googled Marathon Gas in Peru and there is one just across the water from Tony's house. Did Tony or Kagan search to see if there was a Marathon Gas in Delphi as a way to look on a map to find out how to get to Monon High Bridge without having googled Monon High Bridge in their history? Kagan's music has really nothing to do with the Delphi murders, but I'm sure some people have wondered about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it in this video because, like I said, it has nothing to do with the murders. But I've probably spent 20 hours trying to figure out if these songs are truly him or not, and I cannot figure it out. There's an app called Shazam, where if a song is playing, you turn on the app and it will tell you the song and the artist's name. So I wanted to see if Kagan stole somebody else's songs and just put his name on it. And when I Shazam his songs, they come back as his songs. Also, I googled some of his lyrics and they did not come up as belonging to anybody else. He posted lyrics a lot on Twitter. I don't know if they were his or not. Like on September 2nd, 2014, he posted, Your girl say my dick is in her dream. I just tell that hoe, shut up and go to sleep. I think that one was a Neil Sedaka song. <laughs> <laughs> this is a waste of time, pretty much, and not going to solve the murders, but it adds to the huge list of Kagan not being truthful or in touch with reality. So, in case you were wondering, he has a wiki page, which I think he wrote the entire thing. It said he's an inspiring musician. I think he meant aspiring, or perspiring is more like it. It said he got an offer while playing poker in Las Vegas for a job with the Red Bull signed band Beartooth. I mean, that was kind of hard to say without laughing. It's like he's at a poker table and they're like, hit. Stand. Would you like to work with us? Before his big break, he was a blackjack dealer, liar, professional poker player, liar, and he co-owned a marijuana delivery service in Las Vegas. He told HLN that he was not a casino dealer. Like somebody's really going to be like, oh, I can't wait to see him live. I love to hear people rap who co-own a marijuana delivery service. <laughs> he is set to go on tour late 2020 to kick off his album, Real Lease, he spelled that wrong, not me. And he has a tour scheduled with Dizzy Wright and Paris Shadows. In reality, in late 2020, he ended up touring his new jail. I also checked ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and the Library of Congress for copyrights for registering songs, and there are none with his name. Most of the songs sound like the same guy, but it does not sound like Kegan talks. But I could not find any evidence of a lyric or song he stole, so it was very frustrating and I refuse to believe that it's him. If anybody who knows him is watching and you know the answer to this, please write down in the comments. I tried to contact a lot of the artists and management companies referenced in his quote unquote bio and did not hear back from a lot of people, but one guy replied, those are not my songs, two exclamation points. I do not know anyone by that name, Kagan Klein. Also his album cover is a photo from Shutterstock. 
His Spotify bio says, the 26-year-old Native American musician born and raised in Indiana, now residing in Las Vegas. Is he a Native American, or does he think that is the way to describe somebody who was born in the USA? Stay away from weed, kids. Also, stay away from Kagan. I did get a reply from a member of a band that Kagan said he wrote with, and the guy replied, I met him once around 2006. I think it was when he came and saw a band I was in at the time at a Hot Topic with his dad. I've never met him again in real life, and we definitely never wrote any music together. To be honest, the songs are not horrible. That's why I don't think it's Kagan. So if the killer on the bridge is Kagan, how did he get to Delphi? On August 26, 2018, Kagan posted a photo on Facebook showing him standing in front of a red Jeep, taking a photo of a movie poster. So did he drive that Jeep? There's another photo around that time inside the Jeep from the driver's seat. But in August 2020, he told police both, I don't have my license, and also that he was currently driving a 1998 Grand Am. I contacted one of Kagan's high school friends and asked him, did Kagan have a license? And also if he had to stop driving due to any kind of seizures. He replied, no, he didn't have a license, but that's just because he was too lazy. I remember seeing him one time have a very random seizure, but it never happened again after that. So no, I don't believe that at all. People have random seizures just from lack of oxygen to the brain and never have one again. It's happened to me even, so yeah, he's just a liar. Plus, if he made it all those years getting rides from people, I don't know why his dumbass self thinks to lie, like he couldn't have gotten a ride then, shaking my head, in reference to getting a ride to Delphi. I've never seen Kagan operate any motorized anything. On Twitter, he had 2,100 tweets, and I had the pleasure of having to read every single one of them. Like I said, I don't think this is going to help solve the Delphi murders, but it does give an insight into what kind of person Kagan is. On January 25th, 2017, he said, Thank you, President Trump, for the impact you've done on my stocks. Love my president. How did he afford stock if he didn't have a job? He liked a tweet on January 28th, 2017, and did not like another one until September 4th, 2017. He tweeted before and after the murders, including twice the day the girls were found, but the tweets were links to his Facebook account, which is no longer active to see what he posted. On February 15th, 2017, the day after the girls were found murdered, he tweeted, What is going on in our world? On February 9th, he tweeted, I hope you're okay, Sam. I have no clue who Sam is. So he did not stop posting on Twitter after the murders. He posted two days after his house got raided on February 27th. On May 26, 2017, he tweeted, Eating dinner with my love at Nobu Restaurant. He brought his bong to the restaurant? Nobu is a restaurant in Las Vegas, and Kagan said he moved to Las Vegas in June after his birthday. But his birthday is May 27th, the day after this. Kagokio. He tweeted a lot that he was on the Warped Tour in a lot of cities. He would retweet girls saying they need someone new to text and that they've never been on a date. He once tweeted, I need a girl. I miss the feeling of being in love. Hashtag where you at girl. I need a girlfriend. November 19th, 2012. He only tweeted the word catfish. He posted a photo of a tattoo, which I don't know if you have to be 18 to get a tattoo, and he got one two days early. It looks like his skull tattoo got hungry and ate his toenail. It missed a few. I just want to show a few more of his notable tweets. About two weeks after he returned from Las Vegas to Indiana, he tweeted that he had two seizures in two days. In 2013, he said his dad said, I'm going to rock out with my c**k out. F*** it. He tweeted a photo of this dog that says, The only girl I need. And after hearing that he searched bestiality, I'm concerned for this dog. In June 2016, he said, Think I won't choke no till the vocal cords don't work in her throat no more? No wonder why his only girlfriend is a dog. Even after the murders, he still seemed to be implying that he had a Ferrari where he tweeted, When people won't move out of your way, you let the Ferrari yell instead. This was a collection of his hats from 2013. And like I said, none of these really match what Bridge Guy is wearing. April 2013. Oh, how I love Snapchat with a smiley face. Who knows what he was up to. In July 2014, he tweeted, I wish I could die already. You call both my phones twice and wake me up. Don't expect a call back. So that shows that he's had multiple phones for quite a few years. There were a lot of marijuana-related tweets. His last tweet was January 24th, 2020, but the Facebook link was removed. Next up, I'm going to review Kagan's Facebook activity. When did he first and last post? He first posted June 9th, 2012, when he turned 18, until February 21st, 2020, about seven months before he got arrested. On April 30th, 2015, he posted that he started at UNLV, which is a college in Las Vegas, 
In 2018, he posted that he graduated. No, he didn't. Kagokio strikes again. I contacted UNLV, and they replied saying they had no record of him enrolling or graduating. Like I've said in other sections, on February 12th, 2017, the day before the murders, he posted that he started a new job in Las Vegas, which was another lie. So what is missing from his Facebook? According to the way his current Facebook is, there are no posts from February 13th, 2017 until July 17th. But like I just said on Twitter, he did post some links to Facebook, so I don't know what happened to those. Kagan used photos of other guys as his Kagan profile pictures. His November 6, 2019 Facebook photo with a side view of a guy in a hoodie is way too skinny to be him. I compared the hoodie guy's fingers to Kagan's and it's not him. Kagan has Jimmy Dean sausage fingers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's another photo in a dark alley with a guy with thin legs. That's definitely not Kagan. He had a fairly long list of jobs on Facebook, including a blackjack dealer at Wynn Casino and Vegas bail bonds. I looked at Kagan's Facebook and saw that he posted a video from the Warp Tour from the side of the stage. He posted on July 10th, 2018, supposedly from the fairgrounds in Nashville, and posted several videos. So I wrote down the day and I used Shazam to try and find the name of the band and song so I can maybe look on YouTube to see if I could find a video from the audience perspective to see if it was him on the stage filming. I did not recognize the band or the song, but they did sing I Do Anything, so I googled that with the word lyric and found out that it was a simple plan song. So I looked on YouTube, but I could not find the July 10th, 2018 concert date, but I did find the video and discovered it was from July 6th in Dallas, and the audience video showed it is not Kagan taking the video. He didn't specifically say it was him taking the video, but it's kind of insinuated that he posted it on his Facebook. Like his father, Tony, recently editing some of his older Facebook posts, I found that Kagan edited three posts. His post, started new job at Vegas Bail, was dated July 31st, 2016, and said he was in Calabasas, California. But if you click to view when it was edited, it shows that it was edited twice. On October 16th, 2017, and also November 20th, 2017, removed a location from this post, added a location to this post. Why would he do this if it was over a year later that he edited it? Kagan Klein is in Las Vegas, Nevada, February 18th, 2018, which kind of rang a bell in my head, and I just found that that was when Tony flew from Indiana to Las Vegas to visit Kagan, start a new job at Area 52 Marijuana Delivery, business owner slash engineer, edits May 18th, 2018, three months later, at 12.25 a.m., added a location to this post, removed a location from this post. So why is he adding a job the day his dad visits him in Las Vegas? And why is he editing it three months later? On December 31st, 2016, he wrote that he started a job as table games dealer at Wynn Las Vegas. This was not edited later. The very next day, on January 1st, 2017, started a new job at CBD Saves as a designer. A menu designer? March 31st, 2019, he added a location to that post. Like I said in a different section, he posted on February 12th, the day before the murders, that he started a new job in Las Vegas when he was sitting in Indiana. So I'm not sure if he did this because he thought he was going to need an alibi for what happened on February 13th. Does anybody else have another idea why he would have lied and posted this on February 12th? On June 20th, 2018, he said, last few hours at home, and on the bottom right there, it looks like his Kagan Klein, either Snapchat or Instagram, he posted, before warp tour, I'm loading up some half ounces. He has a warped mind. I have a warped sense of humor. August 5th, 2018, he posted, pretty crazy that this is the last warp tour event of my life. How did he know he wouldn't be there in the future? Big thanks to Kevin Lyman, who is the founder of Warp Tour, who I tried to contact and he didn't reply. <laughs> Silverstein, Beartooth, Charles Trippy, We the Kings, and Motionless in White, I love you guys. August 12th, 2018, he said he flew from Las Vegas back to Indiana on Frontier Airlines. When he got back to Indiana, he posted on August 25th from the driver's seat of a Jeep. His dad has a red Jeep, but Kagan said he doesn't have a license, so I don't know what's going on with this. You can see the reflection of Kagan's body in this movie poster, as well as the red Jeep and he's wearing shorts that are almost down to his ankles. So after spending hundreds of hours over the past few months looking into the clients, both Tony and Kagan, and reading his 194-page interview, I have a serious question. Does Kagan have a mental illness? I'm curious to know what people who have more experience than me think about this. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Paging Dr. Grande, cappuccino. Somebody once said I look like Michael C. Hall, who played Dexter. No one has heard from that person since. He wishes he looked like Sleuther Vandross. 
It's been reported that Tony Klein is bipolar. Is Kagan also bipolar? Is he a pathological liar? Does he have multiple personality disorder? Did his low self-esteem cause him to create alternate personas like Anthony Schatz so he could feel good getting compliments and his active imagination turned into a reality where he thought he was Anthony? Because in a police interview, he's like, yeah, I have a Ferrari. And it's like, no, the fake Anthony Schatz posted a picture of a Ferrari. I mean, something isn't right here, and I would know. <laughs> so what's your diagnosis of Kagan, not me? I'm not trying to steal other people's content, but I think this interview with a teenager who goes by the name Kayla, who said that she met Kagan once a few years ago in a park, is important to know for people who are looking for more information on the case. If you want to hear the full interview, go to Murder Sheet on a podcast and just look for the episode that says Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A. So this girl said she was 12 years old and got a Facebook friend request from a girl, possibly Emily Ann 45, although I've never seen an Emily Ann 45 Facebook page. And the girl, quote unquote, said that Kayla should meet her and her boyfriend. Guess who the boyfriend was? Kagan. Then she got a message from Kagan, and she said his messages were perverted. He told her he was 17 when she was 13 years old. When she was 14, he said he was at Foster Park in Kokomo with his girlfriend and asked her to come see him. Kayla brought her female friend as security. When they met at the park, she said he looked different from his pictures, which surprised her. He did not yell at her at the park, and he was kind of sweet in person. Her friend said, my dad is texting, we have to go because she had a weird feeling about Kagan. She said there were a lot of people at the park that day. She said in person Kagan was nice, but afterwards he sent a message and was very mad. He said, I should cut your throat for this and watch you bleed out. Why would you bring someone with you? He later apologized for snapping at her, but obviously that's a very violent message to send to a young girl. One day she woke up to more than 25 messages from him and said he knew where she lived and I could kidnap you if I really wanted to. At one point in the interview, she said, I have not met him face to face, but then she said that they met in the park, so I was kind of confused about that one part of the interview. She may have said, I had not met him previously. She played the down the hill audio and said it does sound like Kagan. She did not see a close up of the bridge guy to determine if it looked like Kagan. She had never talked to the police about her experience at the time of this interview, but she may have since. She said Kagan made a lot of Facebook accounts. He would send her pictures of guns he said he owned. In one of Kagan's legal documents, it said that he sent pictures of guns. I found these two tweets from 2013. I think I blew my eardrum out shooting my gun. Also, he said, my 380 is too loud. My ears are still ringing after one hour. These are images of a 380 gun. They stopped communicating around 2019 when she got married at 18 years old, and she blocked him on Facebook. She said Kagan hasn't changed a bit from his mugshot to from when she knew him, and estimated him at around 200 pounds, maybe more. Maybe? So what do you think? Is Kagan capable of being the guy on the bridge who killed these two girls? Next up, I'm going to review the probable cause affidavit. What? Affidavit? Beckham? Next up, I'm going to review the probable cause affidavit. I transferred this over to PowerPoint to make it easier to show. He was charged with 30 different felonies, and as you can see, some of them are repeat of the same type of charge. This is the first set of 15 charges, and this is the second set. It ranges from child exploitation to possession of CSAM, obstruction of justice, child exploitation disseminate, which probably means he was using Dropbox or other apps to share these photos and videos. I think this synthetic identity deception is because he stole the photos from that guy to use for Anthony shots. I'm going to review some of the key points from the document. On February 25th, 2017, around 12.30 p.m., in the county of Miami, when I copied and pasted from the PDF, it turned the O into a zero. And for people who say I'm OCD, this just gives you more evidence. I can't have an O looking like a zero. Okay, let's go. So on February 25th, 2017, around 12.30 p.m., in the county of Miami and in the state of Indiana, Indiana State Police and the FBI executed a search warrant at Tony and Kagan's house. While working the Delphi case, the FBI sent information to the ISP Cybercrimes Unit that an adult male was soliciting female juveniles on Snapchat and Instagram. The adult male was using the username Anthony underscore Shots. Subpoenas were sent to Instagram and Snapchat for the Anthony Shots account information. The Instagram and Snapchat returns provided Comcast IP addresses. A subpoena was sent to Comcast for the IP addresses associated with the Anthony Schatz account, and they returned to Kagan's house in Peru, Indiana. The Instagram subpoena advised the Anthony Schatz account was registered on July 20th, 2016, and Snapchat was registered on July 14th, 2016, which was seven months before the murders. Kagan's father, Tony, 
was interviewed and agreed to speak with investigators. He confirmed they had Comcast as their internet provider and it was a secured network and that Kagan did use Instagram and Snapchat. Kagan initially denied creating fake social media accounts, but later in the interview, he admitted to creating the Anthony Shots profile and speaking to underage girls. I mean, it just goes to show that this guy, Kagokio, lies as much as he can until there's evidence, and then he admits to it. He talks to girls he knows personally and girls he doesn't know personally, meets girls on Instagram, knows the age of the girls he communicates with because he talks to them. If a girl told him she was 16 or under, he wouldn't care and would still talk to them. He finds girls on Instagram and then tells them to talk to him on Snapchat because he probably believed that Snapchat messages delete more than Instagram messages. Kagan admitted speaking to approximately 15 girls that were underage and advised he probably received pictures from every one of them. He saved their pictures to his phone gallery. During his February 25th, 2017 police interview, Kagan stated he was effed and he should have left. He said that he packed another bag and took it to Las Vegas. He stated he was going to leave when his dad was asleep. Kagan told investigators the main phone he uses is the white iPhone 5C. So why would Kagan pack another bag to Las Vegas before the police even raided his house or he knew that he would be a suspect? He said in his 2020 interview he didn't have anything to do with the murders and didn't remember talking to Libby. So why would he be concerned he was about to be arrested? I found this article from February 10th, 2017, where this guy named Elliot Schaffner was arrested the Friday before the murders. Elliot was arrested because the FBI was using undercover officers on the app Kick, the same one that Kagan was using. This guy admitted on Kick that he was assaulting a five-year-old girl and planned to do it again on February 10th, which is why police arrested him on that day. And he was also trading CSAM. So Kagan's dad works at Chrysler in Kokomo, the same town this guy got arrested in. I wondered if maybe one of this guy's friends or relatives worked at the Chrysler plant and Tony or Kagan became aware of this guy's arrest for CSAM and using Kick, and either one of them got concerned because they were doing it. Did Kagan pack the extra bag because he knew that maybe Libby had sent him CSAM of herself, and he figured that the police would find it on her phone and discover that he was the one she sent it to, and so he'd be arrested? Libby's sister Kelsey messaged Anthony Shaw's the night of the 13th, and also her friends messaged him, so he knew that her family and friends knew that she was chatting with him. Was Kagan the guy in the ski mask outside of the girl's bedroom window? And later that night, he had to pack for his Vegas vacation. Was he concerned that he would be arrested for the ski mask incident? On page 146 of Kagan's police interview, the officer asked, What were you so concerned about with when you're in Vegas? Or let's even go before you're in Vegas, about being somehow connected to Liberty German. Kagan replied, Because I talked to her friend on the phone. I'm not sure why Kagan said he was effed and would pack an extra bag or even what he would meant like he was going to leave in the middle of the night. Like he didn't even have a car. I'm curious to know other people's thoughts. Why do you think Kagan packed an extra bag and said he was effed even before he knew the police were looking into him? After Kagan's February 25th interview, he was polygraphed, aka a lie detector test. Kagan again admitted to creating the fake Anthony Shaw's profiles and speaking to underage girls. Kagan said the girls ranged from 15 to 17 years old, and he knew their ages because they told him how old they were. He received approximately 100 sexual pictures from underage girls. The document describes some of the CSAM images, but it's a little too graphic. Kagan's polygraph questions were based on, it said redacted, but it was probably the Delphi case. Kagan's polygraph was conducted at approximately 7.30 p.m., and he was transported back to his residence. Multiple electronic devices were seized during the warrant, including Apple iPhone 4, Apple iPhone 3, Samsung Galaxy S5, Samsung Galaxy S4, Nextbook tablet, and an Apple iPod Touch. On February 27, 2017, Kagan contacted ISP Cybercrimes Unit and told them he located his Apple iPhone 5C that was not taken during the warrant. And on March 2nd, they received the phone. I'm curious to know why they did not search every phone in that house, including Tony's. I found this March 26, 2015 post by Tony that said, Thank you for the birthday wishes. My son said I needed a new phone, so I got an iPhone 6, and Lord knows it's going to take me a while. So did police look to see what was on that phone? The document also includes some of these key dates. Three years and two months after the murders on April 24, 2020, the officer who signed the affidavit was assigned as the lead investigator for Kagan C. Sam case. About a month and a half later, on June 12th, they received the digital forensic examination from Indiana State Police. 
and reviewed the information, and below is a summary of the forensic examination. A week later, on June 18th, multiple law enforcement officials met with Miami County Prosecutor to discuss this investigation. Two months later, on August 19th, 2020, Kagan was arrested. The document includes some more details, but I just included some of the main points. So most people want to know, why did it take three and a half years for them to arrest Kagan when they had his phones within two weeks of the murders? In his 2020 police interview, the officer said that his case opened one of the biggest investigations of CSAM in the history of Indiana. So did they not want to put Kagan in jail, hoping that he was going to maybe communicate with the killer in Delphi? The document also included details about what was found on each of his devices. The Apple iPhone 4, this iPhone was named Kagan's iPhone and was last utilized on approximately November 11th, 2016. Kagan would have been 22 years old at this time. The user communicated with female teens and shared media files depicting CSAM, which stands for Child Sex Abuse Material. The user also portrayed themselves as a female teen using the name Emily Ann 45. Many of the communications were recovered from Kick, Messenger, and Snapchat. In another section, they said that the Snapchat messages were not able to be recovered from the iPhone 5C, which is the most recent phone Kagan was using, because he deleted the app from his phone. So it's possible that this older iPhone 4 still had the Snapchat app on the phone, which included some of the older Snapchat conversations he had, but would not include any messages he exchanged with Libby in 2017. There were also still images showing possible drugs and images showing Kagan with a black handgun. So did this show Kagan's face holding a gun? Was this a gun used in Delphi to get the girls to go down the hill? Is this a gun that was thrown over the bridge in Peru that the police are now looking for? On May 14th, 2016, there was a discussion that involved the user of the iPhone and another party sharing Dropbox public links containing CSAM. Descriptions of the files are listed below the chat. The user of the iPhone portrayed themselves as Emily Ann 45. The user had used the Emily Ann identity in 2015 on the Samsung Galaxy S4. There are transcripts of chats that Emily Ann 45 had on the Kick app, but they are heavily redacted. This document also includes all of the different media that was found on the phone, so videos and photos. And you can see here it says the folder is Celebrate, which is some kind of software that police use to extract data from phones. The next device is an Apple iPhone 3G. This iPhone was named Keggy Smiley Face and was last utilized by the user on approximately May 23rd, 2015. Kagan would have been 20 years old at this time. Multiple still images depicting females posing nude and or partially nude and or performing sex acts on themselves were found. The ages of the females were indeterminate. The user saved over 200 still images to this device, which contained location data that was embedded into the file. Some of the 27 images were geolocated in Indiana cities, including Bunker Hill, I believe this is called Galveston, Indianapolis, Kokomo, Monterey, and Royal Center. So even though Kagan said that he was not looking to meet in person, he sure was finding girls local to him. The next device is a Samsung Galaxy S5. This iPhone was named Klein Photography and was factory reset on approximately February 23rd, 2017. This was when Kagan was in Las Vegas with his dad and he said that he found the phone in their rental car. So naturally he kept it for himself and didn't give it back to the person who it belonged to. Kagan would have been 22 years old at this time. This device was not secured with password or pin code. There were numerous usernames and email addresses. There were some chat messages recovered from this device from Meet Me, Facebook Messenger, and Snapchat. It contained conversations that took place between February 23rd and 25th when Kagan's home was raided and discussed them meeting people in Las Vegas and prostitution, which I doubt was him having a conversation with somebody about his favorite lines from the movie Pretty Woman. The next device is a Samsung Galaxy S4. This device was named Samsung SGH I337 and was last utilized on approximately June 25th, 2015. There were many chat conversations recovered from this device. Several conversations appeared to be with a female teen, approximately 12 or 13 years old. The user also used two profiles, Kagan Klein and Emily Ann, which this document said is Kagan's stepsister, to communicate with female teens. I don't think that Kagan's stepsister's name is Emily. He has a half-sister and half-brother that his mom had before she married Tony, but I don't think her name is Emily Ann. I believe the police said this is because conversations were found on this device where, quote-unquote, Emily discussed how she had sex with Kagan and his father at the same time, which is disgusting on all kinds of levels. There were multiple CSAM and erotica media files found saved to this device. Many of the CSAM files depicted female children approximately 12 to 17 years old. 
and contained more still images depicting possible drugs and drug paraphernalia were found on this device. The next device is a NextBook premium tablet. This device's name is unknown and was last utilized on approximately March 9, 2016. Kagan would have been 21 years old at this time. There were numerous chat conversations recovered. The user of this device used multiple communication platforms including Facebook, Facebook Messenger, Kick Messenger, MeetMe.com, Skype, and Snapchat. The user of this device initiated conversations on Facebook Messenger and asked and or suggested the conversation be moved to Kick Messenger or Snapchat. Like I said, some people believe that Kick Messenger and Snapchat have their messages deleted more than other apps. The next device is an Apple iPod Touch. This device was named Kagan with a smiley face and was last utilized on approximately May 30th, 2015. Kagan would have been 21 years old at this time. There were multiple still images found on this device that depicted females posing nude and or partially nude and or performing sex acts on themselves. Four still images of female teens on the device contained location data. The locations of the images were from Hammond or Royal Center, Indiana. Hammond is two hours from Kagan's house and is near Chicago. The next device is the Apple iPhone 5C, which was Kagan's main phone at the time of the murders. This phone was named Kagan's phone and was the phone he turned into the Indiana State Police two days after the police came to his house. The phone was last utilized on approximately February 27, 2017. Kagan was 22 years old at this time. This device was secured with a PIN code. The user of this device used Facebook, Instagram, MeetMe, Snapchat, and Twitter to communicate or chat. Much of this data from these applications was deleted from this device. The examination found multiple still images saved to the device that depicted nude females. On approximately February 27th at 9.48 a.m., the user cleared or deleted the Safari web browser history and website data from this device. During the examination, some information was recovered. The user of the Apple iPhone 5C deleted multiple items off the phone before turning it into law enforcement, and he was transported back to his residence. On February 25th, 2017, at approximately 7.30 p.m., Kagan's polygraph was concluded and he was transported back to his residence. At approximately 9.19 that night, Kagan started to uninstall and delete apps from the phone. At approximately 9.19 p.m., Kagan uninstalled and deleted Snapchat. At approximately 10.14 p.m., Kagan uninstalled and deleted Instagram. The next day on the 26th, at approximately 1.12 p.m., Kagan uninstalled and deleted Meet Me from the phone. Kagan put Snapchat back on the device, and on February 27th, at approximately 1.28 p.m., Kagan uninstalled and deleted it from the phone. Kagan admitted to using these applications to chat with underage girls. The evidence contained in these applications were destroyed when Kagan deleted them from the device before turning it into law enforcement. So it seems like if the police had found the phone during the raid, they would have a lot better case. Why didn't they ask him which phone was his current phone and not leave until they found it? I wondered if Kagan reinstalled Snapchat to maybe send a message to somebody else to warn them, and then he deleted it. Next up, I'm going to read through the majority of the interview that Kagan did with police on August 19th, 2020, after his arrest. This section ended up being one hour and 51 minutes that I recorded. So if you've already read the police interview, I would say don't waste your time. I did add my own thoughts and notes as I went along. So if you're curious to know what I thought, I would suggest you just go to my website, download the Word document for the police interview, and all of my thoughts are highlighted in yellow. For people who are going to listen, you're going to get a special treat that it's like Tom Webster Community Theater, where I try and do my best Kagan or Kegokio impression. You will be able to see on the screen the exact dialogue, but if you're not looking at the screen, it may get a little confusing figuring out if it's the police or Kagan talking. Kagan was first interviewed by police on February 25th, 2017. When he was arrested on August 19th, 2020, he was interviewed again, and a 194-page PDF was released in 2022 of that interview. I'm about to go through the entire interview. A fair amount of it has to do with his CSAM charges, but investigators also asked him about the Delphi case. And since the CSAM might be related to Delphi, I think it's important to also review it. I was not able to copy and paste the entire interview from PDF into Microsoft Word, so I typed up the entire thing. And I'm going to start off with various facts from the interview, or lies. Kagan said he spent time in Los Angeles. He said he was in Las Vegas from June 2017 to August or September 2018. 
but it seems like the truth is he was there from March 2017 until August 12, 2018. He's an ordained minister who performed his mom's 2018 marriage ceremony. He lived in young America, Indiana with his mother, then with his girlfriend, who he said paid for everything. He did graphic design on a website and app called Fiverr, which I think is where they pay $5 for a service. And Kagan said he created menus for restaurants, which he also said he got $1,000 for. Girls he was talking to were 16 at the youngest, but as the interview progressed, he admitted to 12 years old. The interviewer said that some of the images on his phone were of little children, as young as three. No one else had access to his phone. He blamed his friend who lived in Las Vegas, but police refuted that time. Timeline. Emily Ann 45 was a random name that he made up and used to catfish girls. He does not remember chatting with people and talking about very young girls and exchanging photos. He was 22 in 2016 during chats on the iPhone 4. He stayed with his friend in 2016 instead of his father or mother. He did drugs with his friends including PCP, LSD, mushrooms, and he smokes a lot of pot. He said maybe his friend used his phone, quote, I give my password to a lot of people, end quote. During his February 25th, 2017 police interview, he talked to a woman who was an investigator or counselor about his problem talking to younger girls. When confronted about his Dropbox links, he said, that's not me. He then said he had Dropbox, but not that he would use to upload CSAM. He said his friend and roommate in Las Vegas was the only possible person with access to his phone or possibly his girlfriend. Police said it took from 2017 to 2020 to arrest him because his Dropbox account started a huge CSAM investigation in Indiana. Kagan said the police told him he failed a polygraph about Delphi murders and they think it was him or his dad who did the Delphi murders. But police are allowed to lie during this interview. He never remembers his friend having his phone, but his friend could have taken it when Kagan was passed out. But police said that the timestamps place it in Peru, not Las Vegas. In a May 14th, 2016 chat, he said, my dad asked your age. The girl was 16 years old. Kagan said there's no way he said that. In another conversation, he said, my dad asked how often you have sex, then said if she met a 48-year-old, could he look at your private part? Kagan searched online for bodies of Sandy Hook victims, which might indicate he thought a murdered young girl or teenager would be sexually stimulating. After his February 25th, 2017 polygraph, he went home and found his main phone on the microwave. At 9.19 p.m., he uninstalled Snapchat, Instagram, and Meet Me, but he did not inform police until two days later that he found it that night. He said the CSAM raid and arrest was his most real wake-up call in his life from February 2017. He had no clue there were photos or videos of young children on his phone. Just something I wondered as I read this, why did police not tell Kagan in February 2017 that he said he was supposed to meet Libby, but she never showed up? Didn't the police get access to Libby's interaction with Anthony Schatz? Kelsey was messaging Anthony Schatz on Instagram the night of the murder because she saw that they had communicated. So I don't know why it seems like police waited three and a half years to tell Kagan that Anthony Schatz said he was supposed to meet up with Libby that day. So I don't know why it took police three and a half years to tell Kagan that they have information that Anthony Schatz said that they were supposed to meet up. As you can see, I wrote that I was going to compile a list of all of Kagan's lies, Kagokio, but it's just a waste of time because he lies so much. So you can assume that nearly everything that comes out of Kagan Klein's mouth is a lie or marijuana breath. So just a quick review of some of his lies. On page 158, he said, I don't even have my license. But on page 37, they asked, what car are you driving now? Um, it's an old Grand Am, 98 Grand Am. So if he doesn't have his license, why is he driving a 98 Grand Am? I wrote that he lied that he was Anthony Schatz, which that is a lie, but he also denied being Anthony Schatz at one point. Everything he told underage girls was a lie, just to use them for his sexual pleasure. What lies did Kagan tell in his 2017 interview with investigators? On page 49, it says, in his polygraph, he said if a girl said she was under 16, quote, I would probably still talk to her. And then later, Kagan said, 14 and 13 does not mean a little kid, that is three. So he went from saying 16 and then down to admitting 13. At first, he said he did not have a Dropbox. And then he said, I have a Dropbox, but not that I would send nudes and blank through. On page 76, he said he didn't search bestiality on his Samsung phone, but he admitted to it in his 2017 interview, which he said he forgot. On page 178, it was revealed that he initially denied having the CSAM until the officer showed him the picture evidence and he admitted to it. He said he only talked to Libby once and then blocked her. He said, I would never go meet someone. And also in his jailhouse interview, he said he never met girls in person. But the Kayla girl said that they met at Foster Park in a Murder Sheet podcast. He also messaged a girl that he was supposed to meet Libby, but Libby never showed up. It's unclear if he was referring to February 13th or another day. The affidavit said Kagan initially lied to ISP and FBI on February 25th, 
saying he did not create Anthony shots or talk to underage girls, but then he admitted it when they showed him evidence. Police asked where was his Samsung S5. He said it was in the kitchen somewhere. It was like on top of the microwave, I think. But on HLN, he said, and was right on the counter. And I was like, what the hell? He remembered exactly that his dad and grandfather freaked out when he got home from the February 25th police interview. But then he says he can't remember if he found the phone that night or the next day or whether he or his dad called the police. He's such a liar. Like I said, I had to retype this entire interview and some of the quotes are shortened to make sense, but some of his rambling I kept in with grammatical errors. I included some of my thoughts and questions I would ask Kagan in some of these sections, which may be confusing for people. I wasn't really planning on sharing this document with anyone. When I started, I only really typed up what I thought was relevant, and then typed up more of the dialogue between Kagan and the police the further along I got in the interview pages. As you view this, a capital P is the page number in this interview, K is short for Kagan, and anything in parentheses or yellow highlighted text are my thoughts. So this took place on August 19th, 2020, at the Peru, Indiana State Police Post. Starting on page four, Kagan said, I'm like the least most violent person. Okay. Page nine, Kagan said the old CSAM videos on his phones were when he was also underage. He thought he could lie to police. Law enforcement have electronic timestamps showing the files were from when he was older than 18. Page 12, he said, I moved to Las Vegas and I tried to like completely change my life. He said he moved there June 2017 after his birthday. He said he was currently staying with a female girlfriend, but he bounces around a lot. He fell on hard times without a good job. He said he lived in an apartment in Vegas with a friend who also moved there. They had a medical marijuana delivery service, and he moved back because it was expensive, but he said there was a lot of money in the medical marijuana business, so why couldn't he afford his own apartment? After Vegas, he stayed at his mom's house in Indiana. I wonder why he did not stay at his dad's house. On page 27, he said he was in Las Vegas from June 2017 to September 2018 when his mom got married, but he posted on Facebook that he flew back on August 12, 2018. Page 28, he is an ordained minister who performed his mom's ceremony. He said he did two to three weddings in Las Vegas. I emailed the Nevada County Clerk to see if they had any record of him being registered as a minister, and they said he's not in their records. He worked at a hog farm with his stepdad and paid rent to him and his mom until late fall, early winter 2019. On page 30, he said he stayed with his girlfriend and friends after that and stuff in Kokomo. I wonder why he did not move in back with his dad. On Facebook, they seem kind of close. Page 31, he said he did graphic design using a phone app called Canva. He got clients on the website Fiverr, and he would do mom and pop restaurant menus plus websites. He said he's been with his girlfriend since May 2019. His dad works on cars from work at Chrysler, and he gave a car to Kagan. Kagan was driving a 98 Grand Am, and his dad works on motorcycles too. The police asked, what car are you driving now? And he replied, a 98 Grand Am. Like I said, in another spot, he said he doesn't have his license. Page 38, he said the youngest CSAM he knew he had was 16 years old. He said his kick and social media accounts were all his name as the username, and maybe included numbers. He said no one else ever uses his phone. He admitted to making fraudulent accounts on Instagram. Page 41, he said he made up Emily Ann 45. The officer interviewing him said he's gone through every one of Kagan's devices and chats. So he starts to review an Emily Ann 45 chat from May 15th to 17th, 2016. The other person Kagan was chatting with sent a photo of a 13-year-old girl and Emily Ann 45 slash Kagan replied, damn, she's hot. Kagan said he does not remember any of that and he's being 1,000% honest. 1,000% is a red flag someone is being 1 million percent dishonest. He said he talked to a lot of girls. It was four years ago and he doesn't remember. It was a conversation with, likely, another male who was using a fake female name and they exchanged files. The officer says as young as five years old and Kagan said it wasn't him. I swear to God, that is not me. Page 44, the officer said he needs to reveal who else had access to that device. And Kagan said, I don't think anyone. He previously said 16 was the youngest. Then here he says 15, 14 maybe, no kids. He starts saying the F word to emphasize that he wasn't involved. He said the guy he stayed with in Vegas may have had access to his phone, but the officer said it was dated 2016 when he was in Peru, Indiana. Kagan was 22 at the time in May 2016. Police said the phone had a security code the friend would have had to have known. Kagan said he stayed with that friend and Kagan's dad both in 2016. And the friend has kids who were five and seven and they ended up moving to Vegas also. Those kids' mom was a drug addict and moved away. That's why his friend was raising them by himself. Page 47, he said, why would he be looking at images of kids when he was around the kids of one of his best friends? He said, quote, I give my password to a lot of people. The officer asked who else and he said a female roommate also lived with them. He is so stupid suggesting other people used his phone security password, opened Kick, 
and searched and started conversations with strangers and then asked them to send CSAM and then they gave the phone back to Kagan, but he did not notice that it saved CSAM to his camera roll? Eye roll. Page 49 in his polygraph, he said, if a girl said she was under 16, I would probably still talk to her. Kagan said, 14 and 13 does not mean a little kid that is three. So he quickly went from saying he only chatted with girls over 16, and now he's down to admitting to 13. The officer references a chat where someone asked if Kagan had 9 to 13 year old age range CSAM videos, and Kagan replied, I do. He denied it was him in the interview. Page 50, he said, I have nothing to hide, so he gave police all of his phones in 2017, which makes no sense because he knew he had CSAM, which is going to send him to jail, unless he was referencing he had nothing to hide regarding Delphi. The officer said Kagan exchanged Dropbox links and Kagan denies having a Dropbox. The officer says that from the Dropbox account on Kagan's phone, Indiana police have opened one of the largest CSAM investigations ever. Kagan replied, that's not me. Kagan said, I have a Dropbox, but not that I would send nudes and through. The officer said police started looking at the people Kagan shared Dropbox links with, and it just freaking spirals out of control to this major CSAM ring. The officer said Kagan took the Emily Ann content and shared it with his Kagan Klein Dropbox account. The officer said Kagan's roommate could not have also known Kagan's Dropbox account password. Kagan said that he lived with him for a month. Like that means anything. Page 54, Kagan said a lot of times someone shoots someone and another person who was there with them gets charged. Kagan says the CSAM of little kids was not him. Kagan said, quote, literally, that's it. That his male friend is the only person who had access to his phone. There was no mention of the female he tried to blame before. Then he says his girlfriend now could have access to his current phone. The officer reviews a chat exchange and Kagan denies it's him. The officer says that people who have examined the chats believe it was two people who were using the kick from Tony Klein's house because the phonetics and phrasings are different. The phones collected GPS data and pictures that the girl sent were embedded with GPS data. So this is likely Tony, like I said in another section, Tony does not know how to use commas and periods. So I think that police think that Tony was the one who was also chatting. Page 58, Kagan said that if he was doing CSAM, quote, I wouldn't not have VPN blockers, end quote. Police say GPS was to Kagan's dad's house not in Las Vegas with his friends. Kagan said his friend would visit Tony's house, but not sleep there. Police replied to that saying that some of the chat conversations are very long over several days. So it's unlikely his friend would be the person doing this, even though Kagan is totally trying to blame him. Page 59, Kagan said he and his friends took a lot of drugs that could cause him to pass out. PCP, LSD, mushrooms. Kagan admits that what he is saying honestly sounds really stupid. The police say Kagan is a bright guy and usually the smartest in the room. Is that in a kindergarten class? What the f He's so stupid. It's obvious that law enforcement was lying to him to make him feel better and more comfortable. The officer asked why there were two phones in his girlfriend's apartment, and Kagan said he bought her one she never used. The officer asked how he afforded it, and he said he could make $1,000 from one client from his website business. The officer said that Kagan previously said he made about $200. Kagan replied that if he makes the site with videos, he charges more. Page 61, Kagan said he no longer talks to his friend because they had a falling out and the guy still lives in Las Vegas because the guy kept the marijuana business money for himself. The friend was around 29 in 2017-18. The iPhone 3 was named Keggy, which was Kagan's nickname. The officer said Kagan was 20 at the time he was using it, which Kagan denied and said he had that phone in high school. Kagan was 26 at the time of this 2020 interview. The officer said the last time the device was used was five years ago in 2015, and Kagan said that was not true. Page 63, the officer said Kagan lied to investigators three years ago, and Kagan asked why did it take three years for law enforcement to come and get him, and the officer said because the investigation is so large due to CSAM. Kagan asked for a lawyer. Well, I, oh my God, okay, I have no, all right, whatever, I need a lawyer. Page 64, he says, quote, I did not have any images or videos of children at all. I'm telling you that right effing now. There's no way. If I shared a Dropbox, you know how Dropbox works, obviously, you're a smart guy. But if someone sends it to me, the sender, dot, 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 end quote, the officer responds that he's going to jail right now. <laughs> And he says that four child exploitation charges together are 45 years in jail. Page 66, Kagan says the last interviewer said it was either all Kagan or Kagan and someone else and quote, killing two girls, that's what they said to me. They tried to say that I failed a polygraph and that I did it, me or my dad. So do you understand how I kind of have like a kind of like presence where like, wow, these guys are bull****. 
shit artists. You get where I'm coming from? End quote. So I wonder what kind of evidence they have against Tony, other than the signing in and out of two phones on the morning of the murders, and different writing styles in the chats. On page 67, the officer reads another Emily Ann conversation from April 30th, 2016, where the user said, My dad asked your age limit. He asked if it's wrong to like little girls like you, end quote. So it looks like there's several references to his dad in the chats that may cause police to think that Tony is involved. And Kagan replied, quote, that has to be the redacted name of his friend, 1000%, end quote. He's such a liar. Kagokio. On page 69, Kagan admits to having 14 and 15 year old images. Kagan said that he and its redacted, but probably the Vegas friend, never watched or discussed CSAM. Kagan would be in his bedroom when talking to girls in the Vegas apartment. But then the officer said all of these chats are from the Peru house, not in Vegas. Kagan never remembers his friend having his phone. May 14th, 2016, the chat said, my dad asked your age, end quote. The response was 16. Then Emily Ann or Kagan replied, he, presumably Tony, said there's no way, end quote. The person asked what the dad looks like. So did Kagan ever send a photo of his dad through any chat? The user said the dad was 42 years old and the girl was 16. He asked if you'd ever hook up with a 42-year-old. In 2016, Tony Klein was in his late 40s, so I'm not sure why this user said he was 42. Page 73, Emily Ann chatted with a girl who said her sister is four years old. Emily Ann asked for a photo and replied, damn, anymore? That's disgusting. Even if Kagan does some kind of plea deal, I really hope he stays in jail for a long time. Page 74 references exchange of Dropbox links. The officer references Snapchat had the worst videos and describes them. So at the time, I wondered how were these videos saved from Snapchat, but no chat messages with Libby. I don't know if it was the same phone or because Kagan deleted Snapchat off of the phone after the interview before he gave it back to police. Page 75, Kagan said, I don't, can I not hear this? He did not want to hear about the little kid CSAM, even though it seems obvious that he had no problems trading for it. The officer reviewed the website history and searches that were last used in 2015. Beautiful young teens, cute young teen on webcam, high school. Page 76, Kagan got a Samsung Galaxy S5 phone that he said he found in a rental car in Las Vegas. My reaction to that was, who finds a cell phone in a rental car and keeps it instead of notifying the rental agency that the prior driver left their cell in the car? Kegokio, did police contact his wireless provider to see when he bought or activated the Samsung? Did he actually have it in Indiana at the time of the murders and lied about the reason why he reset it on their Vegas vacation to possibly delete things that were related to the Delphi murders? The officer says, and in two days of having the phone, Kagan said, I didn't even use that phone. The officer replies that he factory reset it and the phone was named Klein Photography and had similar young web searches. Kagan said he did not remember looking up bestiality, which appeared to be another lie he admitted to in a polygraph interview in 2017. So was this Samsung wiped on February 23rd? That day was one day after police released the bridge guy photo and down the hill, and there was a headline about, quote, DNA evidence is top priority in Delphi investigation. So why did Kagan or Tony reset the phone before they returned to Indiana? What was on it that they wanted removed? Or was it just reset to wipe the prior user's phone data so Kagan could steal the phone? Kagan said he was supposed to meet a guy in Vegas on February 23rd to make thousands of dollars off the sale of weed, but it didn't work out. So does that interaction have anything to do with this phone or wiping it? Page 77 has a list of all of his and his father's email addresses. The officer reviewed web searches for 12, 13, 14 year olds and photos of Sandy Hook bodies which were children who were murdered. Kagan replied, why is the Sandy Hook in there? The officer said, it's all in his searches. Kagan started to say, yeah, but that's not. And then the officer cut him off when he was answering. I don't know why he never really let him finish his thoughts. Kagan said he found the phone in a car, presumably February 21st when they arrived in Las Vegas, and he reset it on February 23rd, and he loaded his personal accounts and downloaded CSAM on it while they were in Las Vegas. Kagan said, I didn't even use that phone. He's such a liar. On page 79, the investigator said that the obstruction of justice charge was because Kagan had his February 25th polygraph until 7.30 p.m. and then he went home and he found the phone. He said it was in the, quote, kitchen somewhere. It was like on top of the microwave, I think, end quote. The officer asked what he did next. So they had just returned from Vegas when the police raided. So what could Kagan have done with his phone that police did not find his current phone in the home when they were all in there? On page 80, Kagan said, pretty sure I had my dad call the State Department, or maybe I did. I can't remember. 
Then Kagan said he thinks it was the next day when the call was made, and the officer asked, why wait? He said, I don't even think I found it that night, I'm not sure, which he previously just said he found it. The officer said that night at 919, Kagan uninstalled Snapchat and Instagram from the phone. The next day on the 26th, he deleted the Meet Me app. Then he installed and re-deleted the Snapchat. Two days later, he called the police about the phone. Someone took a screenshot of a Facebook post from February 26, 2017, stating they saw Anthony Schatz liked several of Libby's Instagram photos, but when they checked again on February 26, the likes were gone. This was the day after Kagan's raid and police interview, and when he went home and deleted his profiles. Although, the Instagram Anthony Schatz profile is still active, which is kind of odd that Kagan did not delete it. Kagan said he deleted the apps because it was the most real wake-up call I ever had in my life. Page 84, he admitted he talked to 13-year-olds. And I wrote, just add this to the list of ages that keep going lower as he keeps talking. He said, quote, I mean, like the girls that I would talk to, 13 to whatever, yeah, I would talk to them, but yeah, none of the little kid stuff or any of the Dropbox, or no, I had no clue any of that was on my phone. And I have no knowledge of ever sending like Dropbox to anyone, end quote. Kagan seemed to insinuate that the woman he talked to about his CSAM probably told him to stop doing it and delete everything. The officer said she did not tell him to delete everything, all the apps and stuff like that, which would have deleted the evidence. In Kagan's 2017 interview, he said, I'm so effed because she's telling me I just killed two people and I failed my polygraph. And I wrote, there's no way he could ever pass a polygraph. Page 89, the officer asked if it is something Kagan and Tony share regarding CSAM, and he said no. On page 90, it was revealed Kagan and his dad discussed going to the Bunny Ranch brothel while they were in Las Vegas. Kagan said, quote, well, that's prostitutes, that's totally different, end quote. He said he never showed his dad a photo of a girl he was chatting with who had sent him a photo. He said that would be weird to show his dad, but not weird to hear your dad doing the nasty with a prostitute in the next room while you're also doing it. Also, he once chatted as Emily Ann, 45, pretending to be Kagan's step half-sister and told the other user that she had sex with Tony and Kagan at the same time. Kagan continued, I don't know, we never really had that. I don't know. The officer asked why Tony's info was on Kagan's phone, and he said, because Chrysler. I have to do his up work and stuff like that. His, there's a bunch of stuff that he had to fill out for Chrysler and stuff. He's not good with, end quote. Kagan didn't know why Tony's Skype login would be on his phone. I'm not sure. That could be like, maybe he used it to, I don't know. Maybe he talked to my cousin on there or something. I'm not sure, end quote. Then he said, no, my dad wouldn't even be able to do that. I wouldn't let my dad have my phone for long periods of time or nothing like that. He said his dad did not know his passcode to his phones. Page 96, there's stuff on there that I would never want my dad to see. Kagan said he and his dad got in arguments growing up. My dad has a real short temper, so would always freak out on me literally anything, like literally anything. So did Tony have a really short temper with something related to Libby? Page 97, there's pictures and stuff on my phone. I would never want my dad to come across any of that ever in my life. He would never talk to me again. If he found out any of that, I would have no dad anymore. My dad would never talk to me again, end quote. On page 98, the officer asks, what would you see as the point where your dad would never talk to you again? Kagan replied, talking to underage girls like that. So who was telling the girls the stuff about his dad being nearby if Kagan was afraid Tony would know about it? It makes no sense to me why Kagan would reference his dad multiple times if Tony was not involved. Unless Kagan was referring to another man in his 40s who maybe Kagan was trading CSAM with and who could also be the killer. Kagan continued, I mean, after this, I mean, he'll never talk to me again, referring to his 2020 arrest for the 30 charges. The officer replied that Tony knew in 2017 when they first investigated. Kagan said, no, he didn't. I never told him. The officer said, I mean, we did. Page 99, Kagan replies, oh, you did? The officer reminded Kagan that before his 2017 polygraph, Kagan was told, we told your dad all of this. Kagan says, I don't remember her saying that. The officer asked, what was that conversation like when you got home with dad after your polygraph? Kagan said, I told them about how they said I was a possible suspect or whatever for those girls. And that's all I told him. I didn't tell him anything about talking, anything that they found on the phones I was talking to underage girls or anything like that. Never talk, never told him any of that, end quote. So I thought he wouldn't have had to tell him if Tony was aware and participating in the chat. About Tony's reaction, Kagan said, he was freaking out. I mean, he was crying. My grandpa was freaking out. They raided my house. That's really traumatic, like, experience, end quote. So was Tony upset because he was also participating in the CSAM or the murders and thought he was going to jail? Page 100, only 94 more to go. When they talk about Tony knowing about Kagan talking to underage girls, he never said anything to me. He never even brought that up. That's why I thought he never knew the whole time. Why wouldn't a father yell at his son for having CSAM on his phone 
And not just having it, but having communicated and catfished 13-year-old girls to send him CSAM and then shared it with other men. And wouldn't Tony have said, why are you a suspect in the Delphi murders on the news that girl is 13 and 14 years old? Why are you chatting with 13 and 14-year-old girls? I'm sure Kagan would say, I don't know. Kagan said Tony came to the apartment the morning of his August 19th, 2020 arrest and interview, so they were still talking at that point. The officer said it's hard to believe Kagan saying he did not know that his dad knew about underage charges, and since law enforcement told him several times that his dad knew. Kagan replied, if you were in my shoes, okay, imagine you get home from Las Vegas. You're on a trip. Everything went. You get home and you look outside and see SWAT everywhere. Police coming up with guns and stuff. End quote. The officer asked how Las Vegas was. It was great. Kagan said he isn't a big drinker because I have seizures and stuff, and then I get taken down there, aka the police interview. They tell me I killed two people. I failed the polygraph because I'm freaking out, and you know what I mean? I already have have anxiety like crazy. Page 102, the officer and Kagan talk about traumatic experiences, and Kagan says he probably blocked out certain memories of the chats and CSAM of young kids. Page 103, I don't remember 90% of that stuff you just told me. I don't, honestly. I don't remember viewing anything of anyone younger than 13, probably. The officer asked how he met girls online, and he replied, meet me. Yet he said he was never trying to actually meet anyone in person. I don't remember ever really talking to anyone on Instagram, but I could have. But I mean, it was all mostly on meet me the app. The officer says Kagan previously said if he met someone on Instagram, he would try to move the conversation to Snapchat, probably because people think Snapchat is more secure. The officer says you did tell him that you did know a couple of the girls in real life. They just didn't know who you were. I don't remember any of the girls. You said they were some people that you legitimately knew. I don't remember. I don't know. I'm sure there was. I don't remember though. I mean, there were so many people that I talked to. I don't remember anyone in person though ever. Um, maybe people that I knew of or something maybe, or I don't know. The officer said Kagan previously said he went to school with one girl. The officers showed him pictures of the different girls and Kagan replied, inaudible or whatever, yeah. I probably meant like I know of them in person. I don't actually know them or talk to them or nothing like that. Like you went to the school I know of you being, you know what I mean? The officer asked if he knew of families and thought their daughter was hot. Kagan said no. The officer pressed him about knowing a family and Kagan using, quote, some alternate account you had if you would try talking to the daughter of a family that you knew, end quote. I have no clue. I don't know. The daughter of a family? So this is the ski mask girl that police are trying to get him to talk about. Page 106, the officer says, was there anyone that you targeted or stuck out you were seeking out their daughter specifically? No. Seeking out and targeting? No. After this, there is a large redacted section that picks up with Kagan stating 19. The officer says 20. Kagan says 26. Kagan said, I would never hang out with her. She was 17 when me and her like first started talking. She had like one month until she was 18 and I never would hang out with her until she turned 18. Just because of that like past, like I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not sure if this means that ski mask girl was 17, 18 or senior in high school or if it's another girl that Kagan was talking to. Page 107, Kagan said this chat was different because I knew her. More of like a not on the phone type thing. I don't know how to explain that. I mean, she was 17. The officer says, what would happen if a girl told you she was under 16? You said I still talk to him. And when they said... I think the prior officers. How many girls do you think you would have exchanged nude images with? Over 200. All of Kagan's videos and images were underage girls. Page 109. The officer asked why Kagan portrayed himself as a girl and Emily Ann. He said probably because they wouldn't feel as threatened to talk to a girl than a boy. Page 110. The officer said Kagan had a lot of chats and some of them were like boyfriend, girlfriend, and quote, a lot of them you said helped you through a lot of tough times and depression and everything that you were going through. There was a love you'd exchange and things like that, end quote. Kagan replied, yeah, that was just to get what I wanted. You know what I mean? His end goal was to get naked pictures from him. So is this why he said Libby was annoying? He got photos from her and he wanted to move on, but she still wanted to talk with Anthony Schatz. On page 111, Kagan admits to pleasuring himself to the images. Ugh. The officer asked what age he would draw the line, and he says, like, 13. So his lowest age limit keeps going lower the more they show him more evidence. He said there's a difference between 12 and 13. The officer asked what is the difference between a 12 and 13 year old, and he says probably the age of just being like a teenager, probably. The officer asked about Kagan Kagan's phone searches for 12 and 13 year olds. I'm sure I looked that stuff up. The officer says Kagan looked up 12 year old girl's stomach. Kagan said, I don't ever remember searching that, but yeah, I mean, probably that was, yeah, I mean, yeah. 
So that means yes. The officer said, I think you have a thing for girl stomachs. Is that, I mean, so I think during that altercation where Tony dunked his third grade son in the toilet and attacked his ex-wife, Tony may have bitten his ex-wife in the stomach. So was one of the signatures at the murders a mark on Libby's or Abby's stomach? Page 112, Kagan's reply was inaudible. The officer says, we all have. Kagan says, right. After that, they talk about there not being a lot of search results, which probably is for young girls' stomachs on a Google search or something. And they get Kagan to say that is why he had to find girls in chats to get those types of photos. The officer says the redacted relationship that ended in 2018. Kagan says, yeah. The officer next asked if the Vegas searches in iPhone were Kagan. Kagan replied, yeah, I'm guessing. And that really shows how bad it is because I don't even remember ever even searching anything there in Vegas. He meant he did not remember searching all of these things in Las Vegas. Does he have brain damage? Like, seriously, I cannot believe somebody is this stupid or thinks somebody else is stupid enough to believe him. When he was in Vegas, he searched Delphi. He searched for escorts. He searched for the Bunny Ranch. Page 113, the officer asked when he would normally wake up, and he said 8, 9, 10. The officer says 10.30, and Kagan said, yeah. So it's like, is it 8 or 10.30? He said he doesn't remember searching any of those terms past 2018. This may have been misstated by the officer. The officer said these searches were after Kagan and his Vegas friend stopped being friends, so Kagan could not blame the friend for using his phone and searching them. Then on page 114, he says the searches were in Vegas, and Kagan said his dad did not know the password to his phone. Kagan said the falling out with the friend was when we left Vegas. Kagan moved back to Indiana in 2018 on August 12th. The officer said the searches they were talking about were when Kagan and his dad were in Vegas, February 21st to the 25th, 2017. Page 115, Kagan said just he and his dad went to Vegas. We had that plan for almost a year, probably before that. The officer asked if they met anyone in Vegas. Kagan replied, quote, one of his dad's friends, just like a friend we knew, and he's actually a po- was redacted police department. I think he was redacted for a little bit, way back in the day, end quote. The officer says the guy's name. Kagan replied, uh, well, what was his name? Uh, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't even know. That was my dad's friend. I'm not sure. End quote. It sounds odd and guilty that he does not know or doesn't want to reveal the name of his dad's friend. I wrote down what happened that he does not want police to talk to this guy or look into their interaction. Tony's friend's name was Jan Kendall and he's now deceased. Page 116, Kagan said he would have gone to the bathroom in the hotel room he shared with his dad or while his dad was sleeping to search the CSAM girl photos. The officer said, after you, it's inaudible, but I think it's searched. Professional services in the inaudible, but it might be Vegas. Meet me or something or whatever, inaudible. Kagan said, I never did that, man. The officer said it was on his phone. Meeting a girl in Vegas from meet me? Uh Uh-huh. And just other kick was inaudible messages on that and things like the escort service that you were talking to on there. And then they talked about escort prices. Kagan said, I don't even remember that. I probably did, though, because we were talking about going to the Bunny Ranch. So yeah, probably did. Page 117. The officer asked to hear more about the Vegas vacation. Kagan said, we went sightseeing and stuff like that. That was really about it. Just sightseeing about every day, gamble and stuff like that. He said they did not go to the Bunny Ranch because it was far and expensive. Some people question whether the clients even went to Vegas, February 21st to the 25th, 2017, but this seems to indicate that they did if Kagan was on the Vegas section of the Meet Me app. Page 118, the officer said Kagan was unemployed, so his dad was paying for the entire trip and would have paid for the Bunny Ranch. Kagan said, no, I just called him on the phone because his dad let him try to negotiate escort prices. How did that negotiation go? Uh, hi. Do you have two for the price of one vagina rentals? Kagan said, my dad's not really... Kagan said, my dad's not really good with phones at all, like anything electronic. That's why I got to do all his Chrysler stuff. The officer said, Tony mentioned he knows about Facebook messaging. So they did do an interview with Tony at some point, probably February 2017. The officer asked if Kagan was in a relationship, and he said not at the time in February 2017. The officer asked what a certain girl, unknown, 
thought of the house raid after Vegas. Kagan said, I told her, and then I kind of quit talking to her after that. He said he told her it was because of the Delphi investigation. She freaked out, obviously. It was more her quit talking to me. The officer said it doesn't add up that Kagan said he would never show his dad a photo of a hot girl he was chatting with, yet he was negotiating escort prices for him and his dad in Vegas. Page 121, Kagan said, I didn't really talk to a lot of 18-year-olds. I wasn't really getting news from, you know, girls like that because I had, technically, I had a girlfriend, but that's why I never would want to, like, hang out with anyone in person or nothing because I already had a girlfriend. If I wanted to have sex with someone, I'd just have sex with her. It wasn't serious, but we had sex a lot. Yeah, okay. I hope he was being Kagokio when he said that. He said that girlfriend was his age. Page 122. Kagan said he did not delete kick messages but deleted the app because it would look bad. The officer asked him to expand on that thought, and he described the female officer who interviewed him in February 2017. Page 123, Kagan said, She kind of made me real, not really realize, I already knew, but like, it was more of like a motherly type thing when I talked to that lady. How she was like, you know, you're young, you need to, you know, never do this again, and you need to get help, end quote. The officer asked why he lied about his fraudulent accounts and talking to underage girls. I don't know. The anxiety and freaking out about everything is just like maybe if I lied to get away with it or something, you know, probably something like that. Page 124, the officer says he does not understand why Kagan trusted his friend to use his phone more than his dad and doesn't think Kagan's being honest about it. Page 125, the officer said, the Delphi investigation, we found things that you were not honest about. What do you mean? I know you say you don't remember a girl that you ever talked to, but I know you remember Liberty German. Kagan's response was inaudible. The officer said, you admitted talking to her? Kagan replied, I don't think I ever did though. I think I talked to one of her friends like I told him. He said he never talked to her, but later he says he blocked her because she was annoying. I don't know if he's confusing the word talk like on the phone with typing and chatting in an app. Page 126, the officer says, quote, for a few hours at a sleepover, and then you blocked her because she was annoying. You remember that? You're right, yeah. So Libby and Abby had a sleepover the night before they died, which was a Sunday night, and then Libby had another sleepover on Saturday night, plus possibly another one around the beginning of February or late January, when she may have first encountered Anthony Schatz, aka Kagan. So did police ask other girls at the sleepovers what Libby and Abby were doing on their phones and in the chat? Like what apps were they using and what were they saying to these guys? Obviously, I would assume they did. The officer said, that's not what happened. I think you wanted to be truthful and it was hard for you because you were scared. I mean, it's a double homicide investigation. He continues, I'm telling you for a fact, you did not just talk to them during a sleepover. You said I didn't exchange any pictures with them. I don't think I ever did. That's fact, you did, because the Anthony Schatz persona, that fake account, that you admitted to making, communicated with Libby German on Snapchat, um, on Instagram. It was not just for a couple hours. We need to clarify that because right now, what we can officially go with is you saying that, but we know for a fact it was a lie because we have the data. I made the comment in the beginning, Snapchat thinks that it all deletes. It doesn't, okay? So how did you meet Liberty German? You didn't meet in person, but I don't know. I literally don't know. I had to be on Instagram or something. On page 104, he said he used Meet Me and never Instagram. Page 128, the officer says, she added you on Instagram. When was that, would you say? I literally have no clue. I don't remember talking to her really. I didn't even know who she really was until after I saw that on the news and I was like, oh wow, that name. Like, I remembered that name. So this shows they were chatting and he did remember at least her name, even though he acts like he doesn't remember it and he calls her that girl. I don't think he calls her Libby one time in this entire interview. The officer says, that's a lie too, because we know that for a fact, that when you were in Vegas, that on your device you were searching about the Delphi investigation. Yeah, because that's like right by our, you know what I mean? Did Kagan say our house or town, insinuating that he and his dad are involved, instead of just saying it was by my house or town? I might be reading too much into that, so I would ask him, what was it about searching news on the case that you wanted to find out? 
who they were looking for? Kagan continued, that's someone getting killed right out here. So I would have said to Kagan, there had to have been a connection in your brain when you heard 13 and 14 year old girls were killed in the woods since 13 and 14 year old girls were on your mind every day. Also, you knew the name Liberty. What was your first thought? Did you already know they were dead? No one told you on February 13th that they had gone to meet them? Is that why you failed your polygraph because of that question? Which questions did you fail in your polygraph? You have anxiety. What was making you anxious? when you were searching for news on the case. Were you afraid you would be arrested? That police would see on Libby's phone that she had communicated with Anthony Schatz and you'd get arrested? The officer said, it's a news article that you looked at on Safari, which is a browser on an iPhone. Tips pour in after suspect identified in Delphi double homicide. New details in the Delphi killings to be released. The audio clip, you remember the audio clip, right? How many times would you say that you listened to it? Oh, I don't know. Probably a few, I'm not sure. When I read that he said, I don't know, again, I searched this entire document and interview, and he says, I don't know, 47 times. Is he related to Ronald Reagan? Page 129. I mean, trying to hear the guy's voice to see what he said. I don't know, probably five or six, probably, I don't know. The officer says six. It wasn't really that long. So if it was Kagan on the bridge saying, guys, go down the hill, why would he listen six times if he knew what he said? To see if it sounded enough like his voice that people would recognize him? Or trying to see if it sounded like his dad's voice, if Kagan either did know that he was there or did not? But I think it's safe to assume that if Kagan did it, his dad knows, and if his dad did it, Kagan knows. The officer continued, Another article, information sought an investigation into the deaths of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. It was a lot, and you saying that it was a party weekend, nothing but fun in that, that's not what your phone says, it's not what your search history says. Another article, information sought an investigation into the deaths of Liberty German and Abigail Williams. It was a lot, and you saying that it was a party weekend, nothing but fun and that, that's not what your phone says, it's not what your search history says, because I'm searching about people dying, not just people dying, a person that you literally talk to. Yeah, but I didn't realize that at the time, that that's who I was talking to. How do you not? Because I don't think I mean, like I said, I talk to a ton of people. But he said he remembered her name, Liberty, when he saw the first news report. Her Instagram screen name is underscore Liberty underscore with a bunch of R's. And her Snapchat was Liberty.German. He's such a liar when he says he still does not remember her name. The girl he's being accused of murdering. So Kagan continued. And then once I realized, I was like, whoa, what the F? The officer then asked, when would you say that you realized that Liberty German, the girl that you were talking to, was killed? I don't know. Probably, I mean, a little bit after. Probably happening. Inaudible. I mean, probably after it happened and I saw, like, her face and saw her name. Then. Kagan would have seen her name and face in the first media report when he was still in Peru the prior week, not when he was in Vegas. So why does he say probably after it happened? I realize that that's probably the only way you can really answer that. So I thought, is it possible to figure out a way to set up a question so Kagan would agree that he already knew that Libby and Abby were dead on the afternoon of the 13th, even before there were any news reports saying that they were missing to show that Kagan was involved in the murders. Page 130, Kagan says, Yeah, I don't remember talking to her. I remember talking to one of her friends, I thought. How could he remember Libby was there with her at a sleepover, but he didn't chat with her? Anthony Schatz didn't have a lot of followers. Libby was one of them. He had to have been surprised when a teenager started following his Instagram account and he probably would have clicked to find out more about her and see her photos. I mean, that's what he's into, young girls and their photos. The officer called him out and said, you just said you remember talking to her. I remember her being there, like, with her friend, but I don't remember ever talking to her. What you told investigators was you had talked to her the night of the sleepover. So was this the February 12th sleepover or a few weekends prior? Kagan said, this is three years ago. I don't remember everything I told them. And he continues, that was the most traumatic experience of my life and telling me that I killed people. So yeah, why would I ever think about that? Kagan said that he did not think that he lied to investigators during his polygraph test in 2017. The officer asked, why did you tell them that you only talked to her one night when that... Because that's probably all I remembered. I mean, I talked to hundreds of people. I don't remember talking to one girl. Then why care what happened? It is, I mean, that's two little kids getting killed in a town that's right by me. And that person's out here somewhere? The officer said, and one of the girls that got killed, you talked to, including the day of. Okay, then, I mean, a lot of people get killed and then people talk to them. 
What do you mean? That doesn't mean that I killed them. You're implying that I know something about that, and I'm telling you the truth. I get that you don't believe me, okay? But I'm telling you the truth. Whether it's my whatever psyche telling me to put that out of my mind that I don't remember it, I don't remember what I told them referring to investigators, three years ago. I don't remember ever talking to her. Why would Kegan's psyche tell him to put that out of his mind? The officer said, you said you had never sent her any images? I don't think I ever did. There's an image that you sent to her in a Ferrari that says, inaudible sports car. Yeah, because I have a Ferrari. The officer says, well, Anthony Schatz did? Kegan says, okay. Is he insane? How can he say he has a Ferrari when he didn't have a job? Like seriously, does he have a mental illness? Multiple personality disorder? Could that be the reason that he never remembers anything? He hated Kegan Klein so much. He tried to transform into Anthony Schatz and felt better about himself when girls would give Anthony compliments they would never give to Kegan. Did he start writing chat messages in two different styles that made police think it was maybe two different people? Probably not. It's probably just Tony not using punctuation. Page 133, the officer replies, right, Anthony Schatz had a Ferrari. I don't know. I don't remember that. The officer says, here's another one that you had sent to her. I hate how long it takes for this to warm up. Ferrari. Here's another one. Okay, like, I would send to everyone, like, I would have a Ferrari. What do you mean? I didn't... You're acting like I remember every little piece of, like, every little thing of every girl that I ever talked to. I forgot even about that name until you said that 10 minutes ago. I forgot even about that. About what name? Anthony Schatz? Or Liberty? How can he say that he does not know the name of the girl he was accused of murdering and that February 25th was the most traumatic thing in his life where they interviewed him about Liberty German? Duh! The officer says, so Kagan Klein was not talking to Liberty German. Anthony... Kagan says, right. Anthony Schatz was, right? Right. Yeah. I can't with this guy. Page 134. Only 60 more to go. The officer says... So, Anthony Schatz, so when they were asking you, did you send her images, you said no because you didn't, but Anthony Schatz did. No, because I don't remember sending them anything. Well, I'm telling you, here's three off the bat. Here's another one. Here's a couple more, actually. And then here's one you sent specifically to her. Quote, is it bad that I'm super into you? Kagan, inaudible. Like, I would say to every one of those girls, I mean, it was the same thing with every one of those girls. So did Kagan seek out girls who had low self-esteem and said things to them that would make them feel good to get what he wanted? Libby's Instagram bio stated, low on self-esteem, so you run on gasoline, which is a lyric in the song Gasoline by Halsey. Kagan said, I don't remember ever sending her anything. I don't remember ever even talking to her. I remember talking to her friend. Like, you're like think you're going to catch me in a lie, and I'm not really lying to you at all. I don't remember it. The officer and Kagan go back and forth about remembering and lying, and Kagan says, so I am not lying. The officer says, I'm not going to argue with you about these little itty-bitty word sentences. It's not itty-bitty when you're telling me that I know something about people that have died. Then they go back and forth again about lying and remembering. Page 136, the officer says, Anthony Schatz communicated with Liberty German, and it's a fact that it wasn't just for a few hours at a sleep over. You said, well, we never sent any pictures. And then the very next couple sentences, you said, well, I knew they were at a sleepover because they sent pictures to me. Yeah, she didn't. Her friend did. You knew that they were there and you said that she had sent a picture. I remember that specifically. He's referring, I think, to the 2017 interview where he reread it back to prepare for this interview. Page 137, the officer says, it's a fact that you're communicating to her, Libby, multiple days at a time, including up to the day that she went missing, right before. And what I want to know is, you would communicate with her on what? The iPhone 5 was your primary device, right? Yeah. What other devices would you communicate with her on? I don't know. I have no clue of even talking to. What other devices would you communicate with anybody else on at that time? Inaudible. iPhone? Yeah. The officer says, well, on February 13th, which is the day they were murdered, this would have been logged in a little bit earlier. So that would have been eight o'clock in the morning at your house where you and your dad lived, two separate devices. See the numbers here? How they're the same? Log in, log out. Log in, log out. One device. Log in, log out. 
all within minutes of each other, to the same Anthony Schatz Snapchat account. What two devices were these? These, this is a fact. So the police are saying he used a phone to log into the Anthony Schatz Snapchat and then would log out and then sign into the Anthony Schott Snapchat on another phone. Kagan said elsewhere that Tony would wake up at 1 or 2 p.m. So was Tony awake at 8 a.m. on February 13th? Kagan would log in and out of Snapchat as Anthony Schatz and Kagan, his other profile. But police said he was logging in as Anthony Schatz at 8 a.m. on two phones on February 13th. Could this have been him preparing to use another phone for the meetup or murder? Was he going to leave his iPhone at Country Club Road to have somebody looking at adult sites for his alibi while he brought the other phone to Delphi to communicate with Libby on Snapchat, thinking that the messages would later delete? Did the other phone's GPS signal remain in Peru all day? Probably since law enforcement said that Kagan's phones did not ping in Delphi that day. Against this theory is if Kagan connected the other phone to the cell tower or internet in Delphi, it would have shown up on the police report like it did in Peru, unless he had some other burner phone that nobody knew about. Kagan said it had to be the Samsung Galaxy then or something. The Samsung did not have a swipe password or pin, so Tony could have accessed that one. The officer said, why would you log inaudible devices? That makes no sense. Kagan says, talking, having my Snapchat, my actual Snapchat open at the same time. Page 138, the officer says, this is the exact same snap. This is the Anthony Schatz account. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying like using two different devices. Mine, and then using another phone at the same time. Talking, you know what I mean? Yeah, but why would you do that? I mean, to talk to more girls. It's the same account, but you're using two devices. No, but what I'm saying is I logged out of that to log into my other phone. It has to be that, Galaxy. There was like a Samsung Galaxy S, I think, or something. I don't know. An S what? Which one? It was white. I'm not sure. I don't know. It had like a cracked screen real bad because I sat on it. The officer says, okay, another fact then. You said, I did not talk to anyone about them missing, about the girls missing. Right. The officer says, Snapchat return. You talked to one of her friends who said to you, who was I talking to? That you were talking to the whole time? Absolutely correct. That's who I remember. She said, did you hear about Liberty? You responded on Anthony Schatz. OMG, what happened? That's talking to someone about the two girls that were missing and then wound up dead. So why would Kegan reply, oh my god, what happened? If Libby's friend was going to just say that Libby got grounded for sneaking out at night or something like that, that was small, why was Kegan's oh my god reaction so extreme? Libby's sister Kelsey messaged Anthony Schatz to see if he knew anything about where Libby was on the night of the 13th. So I'm curious to know, when did this other conversation take place? Before or after Kelsey sent a message to Anthony Schatz saying that something had happened to Libby? At some point, I questioned if the oh my god what happened discussion was before or after the murders were revealed. But on page 139, it said it was about the girls missing before they wound up dead. Kagan replied, right, I guess you're right, yeah. Same person, or the girl that you were talking to, says that Anthony Schatz was meeting up with Liberty German. That's the facts. A total lie. That's a total lie. And then, that's a total effing lie. In that conversation, it goes, that's a total lie. It's a fact. That's a lie. You need to listen. It's not a fact. Officer says, same conversation of the oh my god what happened. Da 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 da. Anthony Schott says, yeah, we were supposed to meet, but she never showed up. So what did the girl say that he replied, yeah, before he says they were supposed to meet up? I don't know if police have the exact wording of this conversation or just the other girl telling what she remembered of the conversation. The police never specified the day or location that Anthony Schatz told the girl he was supposed to meet Libby. So if Kagan, aka Anthony Schatz, meant he was supposed to meet Libby on February 13th, but she did not show up, that would mean he was at the trails or somewhere else, the gas station, and he did not see her. If Anthony Schatz and Libby said they were going to meet at the trails that afternoon, wouldn't they have sent messages on Instagram or Snapchat saying where they were or if they were running late? Or was this supposed meeting on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday at a different location? How was Anthony Schatz or Kagan going to get there if Kagan didn't drive and his dad worked on Friday, Saturday? Kagan says, that's an effing lie. That's a damn lie. How do you know? How can you? Because I know for a fact I did not ever talk to. You don't know a lot of things about all this stuff, but all of a sudden, you know for a 100% fact 
Because I didn't effing murder someone. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. For an effing fact that I don't know anything about what happened. The officer replies, Have I one time said that you murdered? Kagan says, You are implying... Kagan seems to start cursing when he's lying, although he's always lying. So on page 141, this is interesting. The officer says, I can honestly sit here and I'm telling you, I do not believe that you killed Liberty or Abby. Okay, thank you. But you need to tell me, I don't know anything. Who was logging in to these accounts? I do not now you don't know again. I told you I logged in from two different phones. I had two different phones. I was, so who was talking to the girl about you were supposed to meet Libby? I don't remember ever saying that. I never effing told her I would hang out with her. I never said anything like that. The officer says, you remember certain things and then certain things you don't remember. It's awfully convenient, Kagan. It's really convenient. Okay, who's redacted? I went to school with him. So page 143, there are various redactions likely asking about a girl Kagan was friends with through her brother who he went to school with in middle school. I wasn't sure reading this if the only other girl mentioned, Libby's sleepover friend, who was referenced in this interview, was the same as Ski Mask Girl, but it looks like the officer asking who is at this point means they are two different girls. I referred to her as Ski Mask Girl, but she was not wearing a ski mask. It's just easier to say. Page 144. So what's your connection with that entire family? I used to actually stay with them a lot when I lived redacted. Stayed with? Kagan says, the family redacted name was really like, really one of my good, real, real good friends in like sixth grade, fifth grade, seventh. Do you remember? I already know where you're going and you're right. I did talk to her. Yes. Who? Not say like that I remember when you say it's that girl redacted. I did talk to her back in the day. Like you dated her? No, like I tried to talk to her. And that's like where you said a little bit ago about the family or whatever. Yeah, that would be, I guess, an instance of me knowing a family and, you know. So a person associated with that family, directly associated with that family, was talking to Anthony Schatz. Right, probably redacted, right, had to be. The officer says, and was looking to hook up with Anthony Schatz. So she gives an address to Anthony Schatz because she's coming home after school and she wants to hook up because parents are not home after school for a couple hours. When I read this, I'm like, what are these young girls doing trying to hook up with a 19 or 20 year old guy when they're in eighth grade or ninth grade? I don't know what grade this other girl is in, but apparently you'd have to assume she's not 18 or else Kagan would not be interested. Kagan asked, who's that? Redacted. The officer says, someone associated with the blank family, this girl, gets off the school bus and there's a guy with a ski mask peering in her bedroom window. Kagan says, okay, so you're trying to say that's me or something? The officer says, no, I'm not saying it's you. I'm just saying there's another coincidence that we have a girl talking to Anthony Schatz's account. Then she gives an address, Kagan inaudible, to Anthony Schatz because she wants to hook up with him. Kagan says, see, I don't even remember her give ever giving me an address. She did, and in fact, there was actually a police report filed when it happened because... Kagan says, right. The officer on page 146 continues. She comes home from school, sees this guy with a ski mask looking in her bedroom window directly after giving this address to Anthony Schatz. As a matter of fact, that's the incident that started everything else last time. That's how everything started last time was this incident. So are police saying the reason they started looking into Kagan and Anthony Schatz was because this girl told them that that account was the person that she gave her address to? This incident was Monday, February 20th, 2017. It seems odd that Kagan or Tony would have killed two girls and then seven days later would have been continuing to do creepy things when the Delphi case was all over the news with like the police and FBI in that area. So I wondered, can't police subpoena Apple, Google, Waze, and other kind of map apps to see who input the address of that girl's home into their phone GPS to drive there that day. I submitted that tip to police in case it reveals the identity of the killer, but they did not respond. Not that I really expected them to, but I think it's a good idea to at least look into that to try and find out who was looking at this person's address. It's like, who else would be doing that other than the person who was in the ski mask? So Kagan says, that's crazy. I mean, I know how bad. Hang on. And on top of that, you searched about the redacted, possibly her family member's name on February 19th, 2017. What do you mean I searched? The day before that happened, your phone shows that you searched the redacted family. What do you mean? I'm telling you, your phone searched. Like on Facebook or something? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. 
another coincidence. Yeah, I see what you're trying to put together, but I swear to God, I was not looking into someone's effing, we didn't say that. Will you stop? You are implying that I, God, we're trying to get, I know what you're trying, to understand our picture. I know what you're trying to do, but I'm telling you, I was never in a ski mask looking in her effing house. No, I've known them. I could literally call, redacted, her dad right now and go over there. But they do not know your Anthony shots. Exactly, but I'm saying if I wanted to get her or whatever, I would effing just go over there. But she, myself. So the officer was saying, but she wouldn't give it to Kagan, but she would give. To which Kagan replied, she would though. She's told me before that she liked me. That's the whole reason why I would talk, try to talk to her because I knew she liked me. That doesn't mean I'm in a ski mask at her effing house. Like I said, this police report is not available, but I really want to know, like, what happened. So did this girl spot the guy in the ski mask when she got off the bus and saw him outside her house? Or had she gone into her home and inside her bedroom and saw him looking in when she was in her bedroom? Anthony Schatz would not have known the address, so he would have had to ask. Why would Anthony Schatz even get her address and maybe agree to hook up? It makes no sense for Kagan to show up as himself because she would have freaked out that she thought she was talking to Anthony Schatz and Kagan shows up. It's possible that her family had moved since the last time Kagan knew where they lived. Wouldn't the girl have been able to identify the body of the ski mask guy and if it resembled Kagan or Tony? Had the girl previously given other males her address? The whole ski mask incident seems odd if it was Kagan or Tony. What would the man in the mask have done if the girl was in her room or her house alone, which she was? Were they going to sexually assault her? What did the guy in the ski mask and the girl do after she got off the bus? Did he see her and run? Did she run to a neighbor's house and call police? Would it have been logical that Kagan would have searched the local news for the ski mask incident if he was the guy and he wanted to know if the police report was filed? Kagan didn't have a car, as far as I know at that time, so how would Kagan have gotten there? Or was it Tony? The officer said, what were you so concerned about with when you're in Vegas, or let's even go before you were in Vegas, about being somehow connected to Liberty German? Kagan replied, because I talked to her friend on the phone. So he spoke to her using his Kagan Klein cell phone number? Is he saying that he did not talk to Libby, meaning verbally, on the phone as opposed to just text and chat? Page 148, Kagan says, But, I mean, if someone got murdered, I would tell him, you know, anyone that I've ever come in contact with recently, you know what I mean? Yeah, but it went more than that. Kagan, you were very concerned. I mean, the search is in your phone. Yeah, I'm concerned. What do you mean? Someone gets killed around us. I'm concerned. Yes. Again, his use of us instead of me. Was Kagan concerned because he was dealing with another guy online who's a stranger who Kagan gave Libby's info to, and then Kagan was afraid that that guy could also kill him next? The officer asked, Do you know what? When you gave your polygraph that you said Liberty, like, what's her name? I don't, I don't remember her name. And then after you spent all that time reading over it? Because my brain is going crazy, what do you mean? What I mean is there's no way you didn't know what her name was, and you sitting there, that Liberty whatever, whatever her name is in your polygraph I don't remember that before the polygraph you are looking up articles about it even before you guys went to Vegas you guys are you know foul foul play suspected um yeah I mean I update that's crazy on page 149 the officer continues reading headlines that Kagan was looking at foul play suspected Another one, Delphi community concerned Kagan says right so everyone that looked that up is a suspect I didn't say that I know, but I'm saying, like, just because I, you know what I mean, I'm freaked out about someone dying. It makes sense for us to question you about looking that up when you're one of the last people to ever spoke to her before she wound up dead. Or, excuse me, Anthony Schatz was one of the last. The Anthony Schatz account. But you're searching about can law enforcement trace IP addresses from social media. Anybody who searches that is guilty of something. Kagan says, well, yeah, why wouldn't I look that up? If I'm looking at stuff on the internet, that's not concerned in your area. That's because you knew that you were talking to her. I'm talking about I would look that up because of what I'm doing. You know what I mean? I'm talking to underage girls, so why would I not? The officer reminds him, and including the one that got murdered. Okay, right, that makes sense. I did not look that up because of that. No. Then the officer continues with what he searched. Internet server, uh, John, murder of John Benet Ramsey, OJ Simpson after that. Why that? Those are unsolved cases. What do you mean? So was he looking to see the similarity of how the killers of John Benet Ramsey and Nicole Simpson, Ron Goldman, got away with murder to see how he could get away with murder? Or did he want to see photos of John Benet dead since he was into little girls? The officer says, how'd you know? I mean, this is a... 
how do I know they're the most popular? How do you know that this case was going to be unsolved? Because this was a few days. Because they put out the picture of him. They put out a picture of him on the bridge and a voice. Yeah, someone murders someone and they have a picture of them or their voice. I'm going to look to see if I know that person. Like, why? What do you mean? The guy's on there telling me, telling everyone in the state guy or the state police department guys on there, telling everyone, if you know anyone that looks like this or anything, call in. The officer says, what we want to know is who had access to the Anthony Schatz account? Me. On two different devices. Yes. At the same time. Yeah. So if you are the sole owner of that account, the only one that had access to it. Kagan says, I mean, on those day, that, that just looks like me logging into one of my phones. I was logged in on that phone. I logged out, logged in on my other phone. That's what that looks like. So you were the one that sent these pictures to her. You are the one. I mean, if I, that talked to her before, have to, I, that talked to her before the sleepover. You're the one that talked to her all that weekend. And you're the one that talked to her, one of the last people to talk to her before she was murdered. That's what you're telling me. So this says that they talked all that four day weekend that she had days off on Friday and Monday. So it's likely that Libby maybe mentioned that she had off four days and possibly one of the things that she was going to do was going to the bridge. Page 152. Kagan says, I guess, yeah, I mean, you got to understand from our inaudible, that's inaudible. Kagan replies, right? A hundred percent. I mean, I'm going to buy this for you, right? I'm going to take you, right? Out in cars. I mean, that's the whole purpose of Anthony Schatz. Right. So Kagan was trying to impress Libby to get what he wanted, but did she ever send him nude photos? The officer continues, which whether you, inaudible, he's targeting, inaudible, looking for a girl that is one, going to believe the story, right? Two, going to give you what you want. Mm -hmm. So you were trying to get nude images from Liberty and spoke to her, actually. I mean, one of the very, any girl I talk to, it's not just one girl. It's any girl I ever talk to. It's a girl that wanted a inaudible man. Right, right, inaudible. The reason this is a big deal, Kagan replies, inaudible, serious. The other one's not dead. She's dead, right, right. I mean, the biggest case in Indiana, right? The media attention. There's no stone left untouched turned in this investigation, right? And the only thing of all the investigation, all the hours put into this, and you have to think of yourself, you're a juror, right? In this scenario, and you're just listening to the evidence, right? The officer says, you have a guy, that's small town USA, right? Small town USA, you know, so if you're from a small town, you get it. If you're not, you don't, right? Yeah. You know your dad is Facebook friends with some of Abby's mother's friends, right? So that's the kind of stuff you would expect to see in small town USA, Kagan says, right? Page 154, the officer continues, your current girlfriend is friends on Facebook with one of Liberty's ex-boyfriends, small town USA, right? So there's still stuff that you know that maybe like if we were in Chicago or something, you look at and okay, that that's it, right? So it's good to see that the police behind the scenes were looking at all these Facebook connections trying to solve it. But I'm wondering, who was Libby's boyfriend? And what ages were they when they were dating? So Kagan says, right, officer asks, you know the redacted family, right? They're at a sleepover at a redacted residence. And that's, you know, the whole thing with Liberty. When she was speaking to Anthony Schatz, they redacted. Kagan redacted. Officer redacted. Kagan says, yeah. The officer says that the family that Kagan Klein knows, not Anthony Schatz knows. Kagan says, right. So now we're worried about grooming. We have a guy that has troves of CSAM on his devices. We have Liberty being groomed. And unfortunately, she was completely enthralled with Anthony Schatz. Completely. Like, thought, you know, I'm talking to this rich, hot guy. She is completely in love with Anthony Schatz. Kagan says, right? So in my first video, I mentioned maybe the importance of Valentine's Day. And after reading this stuff, I'm just wondering, did Valentine's Day have something to do with Libby wanting to have a boyfriend and she went to the bridge to meet him? It seems odd that she would think it was a good idea to meet a 19-year-old. Although there was a rumor and a photo that Abby may have been dating an 18-year-old and she was only 13. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But there was a rumor about that and there is a photo with Abby and a younger, taller guy. Kelsey said that Libby was was not dressed up very nice and she asked Kelsey to go to the trail so that kind of goes against 
Libby thinking Anthony Schatz was going to be there and that she had to impress him. The officer continued, so this account that you set up, you know, and I'm sure that you've seen our social media had said something like, you know, waiting for Peter Pan to come. And it was like this, like almost like a little hanging fruit statement for someone that would target girls. You probably see that and think this is going to be an easy target. Kagan says, I don't get what you mean. What more of a targeting thing, right? Like a more, maybe you didn't go into that depth. I don't know how much depth you went into looking for girls you wanted to get nude images from as Anthony Schatz, inaudible, just like buckshot method and see who comes back. But regardless, she bought the story. She bought the account. So we have a friend saying that she knew that she was trying to meet up with Anthony Schatz. Did Libby say she sometimes hangs out at both Marathon Gas Station and the bridge? And that is why Kagan searched for the Delphi Marathon Gas Station the day of the murders? Kagan said, see, I don't remember ever saying to meet up with me though. Okay, but I'm telling you, this is what we had, right? Yeah, inaudible. We have that, right? Kagan lies so much, so it could have been that he said to Libby that he would meet her just to get her to continue talking until he was able to get some CSAM images from her without really intending to meet her in person. Like, how would a 14-year-old girl meet a guy who lives 40 minutes away who does not have a car? How would Kagan get to Delphi? Page 156, the officer says, we have multiple device logins from your house. Kagan says, right, on Canal Street for a Snapchat account within minutes of one another, right? We have the day that you gave your polygraph and your interview. You were steadfast in, quote, I met them in the beginning of February, like the first or second. I never spoke to her beyond February 1st or 2nd. I looked online and February 1st was a Wednesday in 2017. This next part is about Kagan's 2017 police interview. And the guy says, look, we know you spoke to her the day she was murdered. You said, absolutely not. I blocked her. She was annoying me after the first or second, right? We have these images. This transcription of this next sentence does not make sense at all to me. So it says, you saying that's not, you know, what you inaudible, that's a nude. What are you for? I don't know what that was supposed to mean. We have these grooming pictures. We have the money, the Anthony Schatz money account going to her. So this starts to stack after a while. I mean, small town USA, independent of each other. Why did Kagan give Libby money? So Kagan says, right. He's been saying right a lot and agreeing over these last few pages. The officer says, yeah, but then it starts to stack, right? We have the kick messenger messages with all these my daddy references. So were these Kagan talking about Tony? or talking about another older man that Kagan was getting CSAM for in exchange for money or weed or other CSAM. Kagan says, right. The officer continued, with regardless of what you say, there are two different authors of those messages, regardless of what you say, right? They're both not you. They're both your devices. They're mixed. But the phrasing is different. It changes. And to me, what stands out, like I said multiple times before, Tony does not use punctuation. It is not the same person. This next part was a transcript typo, not me. So we now have multiple account logins with Snapchat. We have two different people using Kick Messenger talking to people from your residence. I mean, all, all that 100% sure. We know it. We know it for fact. So remove yourself from it, inaudible BS, and trying to pick our every individual piece. It starts to stack. It just keeps stacking. The phone, your phone that you had, every all your search history was deleted from February 10th to the 15th. There's nothing in between. So now what's interesting about that is all those other phones have complete history. Nothing's gone. The police said Kagan deleted his February 10th to 15th searches. So how did Murder Sheet recently say that he searched Marathon Gas Station on February 13th? Was it not on his iPhone 5? Was it on a computer or a Samsung or another phone? So was the possible older guy killer at the Klein's house that morning and he drove Kagan to Country Club Road and then he went to Delphi? I'm talking about a potential other guy other than Tony. Regarding the missing February 10th to 15th search history, why can't police ask the client's internet service provider to show which websites were visited? If you search a term on Google, the results pages always show that exact search term in the results URL. So if Comcast has a list of all the websites that were visited and connected to through the client's Wi-Fi or their internet, it would show like google.com and then the slash would be marathon gas station would be in the URL for the results. Kagan says, okay. The officer says, so during the time frame where this grooming would have been built up to meeting, it's gone. It's wiped away from your phone, but your other devices are complete. So now it all starts to stack. 
The complexity of your Anthony Schatz persona, the cars, the influence of Lamborghinis, Ferraris. Yeah, it's not you. It's not your idea. You and I both know it's not your idea. Kagan says, what do you mean? That's not my idea to take pictures of money and stuff and send them to people? The complexity of it, okay? It's not just you. I don't know. Is it? I mean, like I said, the only other person that had access to my phone is him, in reference to his quote-unquote friend. That's literally it. The officer calls him out and says, not at that time. No, I promise you, anytime. Not in Vegas. Page 158, Kagan says, right, not in Vegas, yeah. The officer continued, when you're searching nonstop about the Delphi investigation, when you're supposed to be on vacation, when you're still actually sending Snapchats to Liberty, when you know she's dead, messages, Kagan interrupted, I never, I don't ever remember doing that. Like, that could be me sending that message to a ton of people. Like, on Snapchat, I would do that all the time. Send them to 40, 50 people at once. So when I read that, I thought, wouldn't Kagan have unfollowed Libby if he or his dad had just killed her? The officer said, but again, that one in there that, and Kagan interrupts, I know what you mean. I had nothing to do with that. I know. I get she's dead, and I get you guys want to find someone, but I literally have no clue inaudible. When you walked in here and said, I'm not a car guy, I'm not. And the officer says, look at, and then I think he showed Kagan a car photo. Kagan says, I know what a Lamborghini is. What do you mean? A Lamborghini 458 Italian. That's what that car is. And I'm not a car guy. I don't even have my license. No, I'm a broke guy. Tony is a car guy. The police obviously saw Tony's Facebook is full of car photos. Maybe they are trying to get Kagan to implicate his dad. Why does Kagan say he doesn't have a license, but he also said he is currently driving and owns a 1998 Grand Am? Page 159, Kagan continued, I have no cars. But he previously said, I have a Ferrari, and he currently has a Grand Am. The officer said, Let me ask you, why would you, after you fail the polygraph about knowing about Delphi investigation, come home, delete your Snapchat and your Instagram, which you used to communicate with Libby, and then you searched, how long does DNA last? Why would you do that? They say Kagan failed about knowing about the investigation, but did he pass when they asked, did you kill those girls? Later in the interview, they say he also failed when they asked if he knows who killed the girls. It leads me to think that Kagan may not be the killer on the bridge if he only searched this on February 25th. If he was the killer, wouldn't he have searched it between February 13th and the 24th? Obviously, it was more on his mind since the police now had his DNA to try and match up to the crime scene, so he could have worried they would make a match with him. Kagan says, I have no clue. I don't know. Because probably because they DNA tested me, right? So they obviously have DNA on that body because why else would they DNA test me? So why would you worry about DNA beyond that body? I wouldn't. Then why did you search? Kagan, inaudible. Maybe he said, it's a common question. That's just a common thing to freak out about. Like, why, you know what I mean? No, I don't, because you giving DNA, right, so you obviously know I didn't do it, the officer says. But then you're starting to think, inaudible, why would you search? Page 160, Kagan says, saying you want people to do that, but I wasn't, why would you care how long DNA lasts? What if it lasts 100 years? What would it matter to you if it was on the body? Then it would matter, right? But you knew 110% your DNA wouldn't be there, right? Right? So why does it matter how long it lasts? Because I wondered if the person had DNA on their body, if they actually knew who the person was. That doesn't make sense. How doesn't it? Because it doesn't. You, it doesn't. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, these people think I killed someone. So if they actually have DNA on the body, they're going to know that I didn't do it. But if there's no DNA on the body, then it's obvious that like, okay, well, that's weird. Why does Kagan only refer to the murders about Libby and not also about Abby? I think Abby has kind of gotten lost in this whole discussion, not discussion, but this whole horrible situation. Since the Anthony Schott stuff came out at the end of December 2021, most of the focus has been on Libby and possibly her interaction with Kagan and Anthony Schatz. But it's just important to remember that Abby is obviously another victim of this. So the officer says, but again, and then Kagan says, fail the polygraph. The officer says, that just adds to it. Everything he just said, it's stacking, this whole thing. Kagan says, it's not though. If you get what I'm saying, I mean, it's really not. I literally have no clue how that girl died. I don't know anything, anything to do with it. Yeah, that is a weird ass coincidence that I happened to talk to her. Like, I get that. Why can't he call her Libby or Libby and Abby instead of that girl? To me, this indicates some kind of association with these murders. Like he said, his psyche 
is blocking out certain things that are traumatic. So is Kagan blocking out the names Libby and Abby because of what he knows happened? The officer says, and then we go again, something else that stacks on top of this is when you talk to investigators, I mean, this is fresh in your mind. You just got back from Vegas. You've been nonstop searching this stuff. You've been talking about it with other girls that knew Libby. You've been searching it before you went to Vegas. And then you tell investigators, I was with my dad all day. We went to grandma and grandpa's at noon. So the investigator said, I guess they have evidence that Anthony Schatz was talking about the murders with other girls. I don't know if he used plural on purpose. Was there one friend of Libby who was talking to Anthony Schatz after the murders? Or were there more than one? Even before the murders was Kagan talking to Libby's friends and did he ask those girls questions about Libby? Did they reveal that she lived near the bridge and that she and other teenage girls would go to the trails? Kagan said, no, I told them I didn't know what. I mean, I don't ever leave, so like, yeah, I'm probably out at his house, really, but I mean... So it seems like maybe in Kagan's earlier interview, he did not emphatically say that he and Tony were at his grandparents just so he would have an alibi. It seems like the police were maybe pressing him, and Kagan's like, well, the only other place I'd be other than my dad's would be my grandparents. The officer says, I'm telling, again... I don't remember everything I did. Well, I'm refreshing your memory. Like I told them that I would go and see my grandma and grandpa, like, a lot. Recently online, somebody named Julie Melvin apparently said that she talked to Kagan's grandma, and she said they only saw each other on holidays. The officer says, no, for a fact, audio video recorded on your interview, Kagan inaudible, you told them a few days after this happened, you know you were with your dad all day, and you know... Kagan inaudible. From your interview, you either said 12 to 2 or 12 to 3, and then you came back home. That's what you said. Kagan says, right? That's not a, I don't remember. That's a, that's what you said, right? Kagan says, no, because he was like, hey, you really need to think about this. So I'm wondering, what did the grandparents tell to the police about whether Tony and Kagan were there from noon to three on the 13th? Page 162. The officer says, well, your phone does not line up to that. And again, that's another fact. You don't have to remember it. Kagan, okay, where was my phone at? Please tell me. So it was at your residence. Kagan says, 67 East Canal, all day, because I don't ever leave there. The officer says, until. Kagan says, until when? You went to somewhere near your grandparents' house, but you did not go to your grandparents' house. Kagan and the officer have some redacted lines, I think, about this address. The officer says, okay, and Kagan says, that's the only other place I go. He sold me weed. That's literally the only other place I go. And the officer asks, so why lie? Kagan inaudible. The officer says, several times. Kagan says, B, I don't, I didn't think I ever lied. But I'm saying if I left my house on that day, it was to my grandparents or to, and it says the redacted, but probably the name of the friend who's a drug dealer, Kyle Titus. So how does Kagan get there? The officer says, you said in an interview, audio recorded to two law enforcement officers, including an FBI agent. Kagan says, right. The officer says, you said I was here at home from this time to this time. Then I went to my grandparents and then we went right back home and I was with my dad the entire time done. I know that for a fact because you said it and that's what you said. Okay. But now you're telling me you, Kagan says, where were you last Monday at 7 45 PM? And then they go back and forth about remembering everyday things or not. Kagan says, when I had nothing to do with it, so why would I even remember what I was doing? But if I did, don't you think I would know exactly where I was at? Yes. And that's why you told people. Kagan says, exactly. The officer says, but it was a lie. So where was my phone at? Page 165. The officer says, I told you it was at your house. Exactly. And then it went to where? Kagan inaudible. It wasn't grandma and grandpa's. Where was it? I'll tell you that much. Where was it? In Peru? Yup. So police have not said that Kagan's phone showed in Delphi any time on the 13th. Don't you think if it did, they would have called it out in this section? Kagan says, exactly. The officer has a redacted name and says, whose house is that? Kagan redacted, I have no clue. That's where my grandma lives. I mean, I mean, my grandma lives on out by... Kagan and the officer have some redacted sections. The officer says, right, it wasn't there. Kagan redacted. The officer says, I understand that, but you connected to a Wi-Fi source that was in that house. How do they know his phone connected at that house on February 13th, but they can't figure out what he searched February 10th to the 15th? Kagan said, no, I did not. I'm telling you 1,000%. I don't go anywhere besides redacted friend and my grandma's. The officer asks, so why did you tell investigators that you went there when you didn't? Because I, well, he was like, well, where do you ever go? That's the only place I go. 
Page 166. I don't know what I was doing on that day. Two weeks ago, I don't effing know. It's like if someone asked me right now, what were you doing two weeks ago on a Monday? I have not the slightest clue. So then with your logic then, back then, when you said that maybe you weren't with dad all day then. I think this is a typo in the transcript or maybe in the Tom script. <laughs> I think the court reporter miswrote this line instead of when it should be would. So the officer says, so then with your logic then, back then, would you say that maybe you weren't with dad all day then? Right, right. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I went to my, could be possible. Yeah, I mean, the only time I ever really left my dad was when I would go to redacted friend, really, and get weed. That's about it. The officer says, and would you search Kagan said, I didn't have a car in Audible. So he's saying in February 2017, he did not have a car to get to Delphi or anywhere else. There's some back and forth here. And then the officer says, would it be normal for you to look up porn at grandma and grandpa's house? Page 167, Kagan says, no, because that's what you were, Kagan in Audible. Because that's what you were doing on your phone at that time. You said you, Kagan says, that's fine. Said you were there. Kagan says, I wasn't doing that. Then who was? Kagan says, redacted friend's name. That's what I'm saying. I'm telling you, I don't, it's not. Hang out with no one besides friend's name. The officer says, so how do you know friend did it then? Because you don't remember what happened. Kagan says, this is ridiculous what Kagan's about to say. All this pointing to him like more and more, like the more you keep saying, like, I'm like, I'm not at my grandma and grandpa's house. I'm not with my dad. I would be at friend's house. Did I get effed up that day? I have no clue what I was doing. The officer had two redacted words. Kagan asks, why's that? Huh? Why's that? Who was redacted? The friend I went to school with. So it seems like police are saying around noon to three-ish, Kagan was in Peru at a friend's house looking at adult movies on his phone. So that is why they are saying they don't think Kagan was on the bridge at 2 p.m. So why do they think Kagan's dad was on the bridge? Page 168, the officer says, he's like one of your best friends as well, is he not? I mean, he's a good friend, yeah. How come when you rattled off your list of friends you'd known previously, you admitted redacted? Kagan says, why would I? Yeah, he's like pretty much like seeming like one of your best friends, if not your best friend. Yeah, I mean, he was a good friend of mine. The officer says, so you gave them a list of your friends twice when they interviewed you previously and you completely omitted redacted. You didn't even mention him. And even today, you still haven't mentioned redacted. And you even asked me why when I asked you. Kagan says, because there's a reason. Why don't you look up redacted, which is Kyle Titus, Indiana, look that up. Because Kyle Titus and his dad got arrested at the end of 2017 for marijuana charges. In Kyle Titus's mugshot, it says he's from Logansport and not Peru. So I'm not certain that he lives on Country Club Road. The officer says, no, tell me why. I don't have no idea. Kagan says, because he's a drug dealer, big time. I don't want my name associated with someone that sells pounds of weed. I don't want that. I don't want to say that. And then the Peru Police Department be like, okay, well, he messes with someone that, you know, sells large amounts of weed. Let's watch him. Let's arrest him. Kagan doesn't want to be associated with a marijuana dealer while he has 30 CSAM charges. Okay. The officer says, you just said, Kagan inaudible. The officer says, but you just said, redacted friend sells you weed and you're fine with associating. Kagan redacted one word, associating with him. Kagan says, I mean, friend number one, don't have no weed and I really don't inaudible. You said he sells you weed. Yeah, but I'm saying like, but you associate with him and you, okay, well, an ounce is a lot different than a pound. Why? The cops aren't going to come raid his house over an ounce of weed. If he's selling weed? Absolutely. Well, you guys need something better to do if you're raiding people's houses for an ounce of weed. The officer says, so he just gets one ounce, he gets it, and he inaudible, and he puts it on the table and goes, that's for Kagan. One ounce, that's... That's how I'm going to make my money as a drug dealer. I'm going to sell one ounce to one particular. Kagan says, did I say that? You said only all he has is one ounce of weed. I inaudible. What I'm saying is a small time drug dealer is a lot different than someone that's selling pounds of weed. That's a big difference. Then why were you good friends with him? Why you think? I had no job. I mean, put it together, you know, figure out if the officer asked, why did you blow him off in Vegas? Kagan redacted one or two words, because I, inaudible, get the weed or nothing. I could not get anything he wanted. And I looked for it out there. And I'm sure you looked at my phone when I met that guy, right? I'm sure you know about me meeting some guy in Vegas, right? The officer says, I think the more thing that I'm concerned about over a guy that you're meeting, Kagan, I'm saying like, I met the guy to talk to him about weed. Okay, but what I'm more concerned about of that is, boy, did we just give him something from 2017 that you were able to remember just like that? Because I know, redacted, he's my best friend. 
but yet you know nothing about a girl that was murdered. You remember, yeah, because I didn't know her. Yeah, I don't. I don't spend years of my life with the person that got murdered. Yeah, I know redacted friend. Like, that is like my good friend. Yeah, I know stuff about him. What do you mean? That's totally different. The officer says, but then you just told us, well, I don't want to associate with him. Kagan, yeah, I don't want to tell them his name. What do you mean? I don't want to be like, yeah, I know, friend. Okay, and they would have just said, okay, redacted. Kagan says, no, you can put wheels in motion. I mean, it's not hard to find out who he is and what he's been arrested for and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So like I said, the friend was arrested in November 2017 for selling marijuana. The officer says, and friend too has never been arrested. Kagan says, well, I don't think so. No, not that I know of. He went into the military. I don't think he ever got arrested. The officer asks, what do you mean when you said all this was pointing towards the friend? Kagan says, like, do you see how I'm on someone's country whatever you said? Redacted, but I think it's Country Club Road. On someone's Wi-Fi? I've never been to anyone's house on Redacted, but like I said, I think it's Country Club Road. Ever. I don't even know where that's at out there. I just know that those roads meet, or it's something country. Redacted. I literally have no clue. Like, I don't know anyone. I don't know anything about that whole case. Like, yeah, it looks terrible, but I promise you, like, I know you guys are looking for that person, and it's not me. I know absolutely nothing. And I get the whole redacted thing is like weird too, but I swear I don't know anything. I don't even know what to say about this. Some people say Tony or Kagan's cousin lives on that road, but I'm not sure if that's true or if they're talking about Kyle Titus, his friend who's the drug dealer. And apparently Kagan's cousin, Travis Trexler, just got put in jail for some, I think, old DUI charge. So Kagan has sworn several times he knows, quote, absolutely nothing about the Delphi case. So it'll be interesting to see if his CSAM plea deal reveals that this was all a lie. I wouldn't be surprised since he lies so much. So in response to Kagan saying he knows nothing about the Delphi case, the officer says, yes, you do, man. I swear to God, I don't. Yes, you do. I really don't. Yes, you do. I don't. The officer says, I can't wrap my head around why you're willing to put all of this on you. Why are you protecting somebody else? Who am I protecting? What are you talking about? I think they want him to blame Tony. I mean, obviously, you said that you didn't kill them, right? Yeah, what the F? Yeah. Okay. Of course. Okay. You think I know who killed them? Absolutely. Oh my god. Absolutely, because, and you know why I know that? Well, you're obviously terrible at your job. If you really honestly think that, you're absolutely terrible at your job, sir. I'm sorry to say that, but do you know who killed those girls? No. The officer says, uh, hang on. I'm not literally asking you right now. So I think at this point, the officer who is asking him this question looks at Kagan's previous interview where they asked him this following. Do you know for sure who killed those girls? And maybe Kagan said, no. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. So he says, you did say no both times in your polygraph. And guess what? That was deception. Kagan's defense was, hey, a lot of people fail those lie detectors. What are you talking about? Why do you think they can't use those in court? There's a reason that you can't use a polygraph in court. Because people fail like me who have anxiety problems that are freaking out. Page 173. The officer says, but those people that fail for other cases or whatever you're referencing weren't talking to the victim of a crime the day of, weren't grooming them. Kagan says, O.J. Simpson. Yes, he was. The officer says, well, you looked that up too. Yeah, I know about what do you mean? You don't know who O.J. Simpson is or no? The officer continues, weren't sending pictures to the victim. Didn't say, is it bad that I'm super into you? I just don't understand why you're protecting the person. I mean, was... Was it as simple as that? She just said, hey, I'm going to Highbridge and you told somebody? I literally have no clue about anything about that. But yet you were. You can come in here and literally talk for 24 hours straight. I don't know anything about that. But yet you remember 110% that you had a conversation with a guy in Vegas on, yes, February 23rd, because I'm supposed to make thousands of dollars, yes, about buying weed? Kagan says, yes. The officer asked, buying to get? To smoke weed? No. You said you talked to sell weed. The officer said something that was inaudible, and then they go back and forth in redacted comments. Kagan said, because I couldn't get it, I met up with that guy. That's the only guy I could find. Met him on Craigslist. So I thought if Kagan was using Craigslist in Las Vegas to get weed, I'm almost certain he would have been using Craigslist in Indiana to get weed. So was he exchanging CSAM for weed? The officer asks, why not? And Kagan says, it's literally, why not meet and tell him that? Yeah, I couldn't go party and have fun. Kagan says, because he's waiting on it. If he's waiting on me, hey, I need you to find me this. The officer asks, are you scared of somebody, what they're going to do? 
I swear on, the officer says, is he scared if he says something? Kagan says, no, I literally don't know anything. Like, I was supposed to make thousands of dollars by finding him that weed. That's it. Just to be clear, I think this interaction between Kyle and Kagan was when Kagan was living in Las Vegas. So I don't understand how this entire situation was supposed to go down that Kagan is trying to talk about. So like Kyle Titus, his friend, was visiting Las Vegas and he wanted Kagan to find him a lot of weed and then he would pay Kagan thousands of dollars for it? How would Kyle get it back to Indiana? Online, it said Kyle was arrested November 2017 and his case was decided March 2018 and he got probation when Kagan was in Las Vegas. The officer says, I'm not talking about weed anymore. I know, but I'm saying like, that's what I'm saying. Who are you afraid of to tell that was using the Anthony Schatz account? Nobody, I told you. And Kagan says his other friend's name, not Kyle Titus. And I'm only revealing Kyle's name because he's been in the news because he's been arrested. That's the only other person that could have my phone. That's literally it. And again, the officer says, not in Vegas. And Kagan says, okay, he's not talking to Liberty. I don't remember talking to them. Okay, then who was? I don't know. Obviously it was me, but I don't remember it. You know what I mean? I just don't remember talking to him. Why wouldn't Kagan just give the name of his dad, a friend, or a screen name of a guy online if he told somebody the girls were going to the bridge that day? It would get police to stop accusing him. Even though Kagan always lies, I wonder if he truly had nothing to do with it and Bridge Guy the killer was someone not related to the Kleins, not doing CSAM, and not catfishing Libby. It's interesting after the investigator tried to get him to name his father as the killer, the next line below starts a story that is about an actual event that happened with Tony and his stepson, Kagan's half-brother, and Kagan's mother. So the officer goes into this random side story, but it's not so random. The officer says, We had this case a while back, and this guy, this freaking little kid, was in the bathroom, and he overflowed the toilet. So he yells for help, and the dad gets pissed off, comes at the kid, the mom intervenes. The dad punches the mother. You know, she runs away. He chases her down, hits her, bites her in the stomach, runs back inside, slams the kid's head into the toilet, fractures his orbital socket, which is his eye, puts him upside down and starts dunking his head into the toilet that was overflowed. So this is the story of what Tony Klein did to his third grade stepson. So did Abby or Libby have bite marks or something on their stomach that they think maybe Tony is related? Kagan says, Jesus Christ. Now, what would you think about that guy? He should get hung right now. He should be killed. So that guy should get killed. Yeah, 100%. What do you think that person is capable of? So during this next exchange, just remember that the police officer is thinking of Tony Klein. Now, what would you think about that guy? He should get hung right now. He should be killed. So that guy should get killed. Yeah, 1000%. What do you think that person is capable of? What is that person capable of? Yeah, what would you think a person like that is capable of? Probably anything, because he killed some kid. He didn't kill the kid. The kid lived. Oh, well, I mean, he obviously tried to kill his kid, whether he lived or not. I still think he should die either way because he obviously attempted murder on the kid, so... The officer said he was going to step out for a second. I'll be right back. So one of the two officers in the room left. So Kagan's half-brother and sister are older than him, obviously, so he never heard of this story above. The remaining officer says, I appreciate you. Kagan replies, and I want you to know I'm literally not lying to you. Like, I know this is your job and you're, I swear, I know, no. Like, I get how bad. Kagan, look, no, will you please listen to me for one second? I know how bad. The officer said something inaudible. I know, okay, all right. The officer said, hard for me to listen. Kagan says, because people lie to you every single day. I, inaudible. Well, it's not only just people, but I sit here and you, and I hear you say that, right? I'm truly hearing you say that, right? Okay. And my gosh, is it familiar because you said the same thing to investigators when they talked to you about this before? Exactly. And I'm not talking about the Delphi stuff. I'm talking about the CSAM and the child solicitation. You talked to underage girls. You said the same thing to them before you admitted to it. So that's why it's hard for me to believe that because I hear what you're saying and you said the same thing when I know for a fact you are lying because then eventually you told the truth. Is Kagan a pathological liar? It's not just the CSAM and Delphi, it's music, tours, cars, jobs, UNLV, etc. Kagan says, well, yeah, eventually you did. Well, yeah, page 178. Once they put the pictures out and they're like, hey, here's the evidence we got. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, of course, absolutely, right? The officer says, and that's why it's hard for me to believe that. And you have this whole stack. And I mean, you can argue like the small town thing again, absolutely. You can argue that you are a concerned citizen. That was, this happened in your backyard, close. 
You can argue that for sure. But when you throw into that, you literally talk to her right before she was killed. Kagan says, I get you say that. I understand. I get how that looks. Trust me. Then that you tell investigators that you only talked to her once and you blocked her. That's what I remember. Officer inaudible. Kagan says, okay, I get what you're saying, but what I'm saying in my memory, that's what happened. I don't remember ever talking to her like that. I remember, so why do you have altered memory? I feel that you feel somewhat responsible. For what? For them dying. Why would I feel responsible for something I know nothing about? What do you mean? You don't, when you tell me I know nothing about this, Kagan inaudible, the officer says, right? That doesn't make sense because you researched it. You research, Kagan says, I did not read, oh my God. So every single person that like Google searched about them dying is a suspect? But those people don't tell me, well, I know nothing about this case. I don't know anything about this case. I never talked to the girl that died because I don't remember ever talking to the girl that died. Page 180, the officer says, I'm telling you, you did. Okay, I get what you're telling me, but I don't remember that. So I'm not lying to you. If I don't remember it, how am I lying to you? Okay, so I'll give you a scenario and you tell me, you sit in my shoes, okay? I know, trust me. I want to give you a scenario and I want you to tell me your honest opinion, okay? So you're working a case, let's say it was a gas station robbery. So when I see this reference to a gas station, plus the recent rumor about Kagan possibly looking up a Delphi gas station on the day of the murders, I wondered, since law enforcement seemed to have Tony's toilet story prepared to share with Kagan, why did they share this gas station story? So Kagan says, right. So the officer says, you're the investigator and you see the video camera of this guy walking in. He robs the place and he shoots somebody and kills them, okay? Then you need to talk to him. And he goes, I don't remember that. What would you do? I mean, I'm not saying you killed anybody, but right? What would you do in my shoes? Right, right. I would investigate it. You have him on video, right? You have evidence. You have all this evidence showing that it was him. Yeah, but he tells you he doesn't remember. So where's any of the evidence that you have? Just inaudible. So I think that was Kagan asking, what evidence do you have that I'm involved with Delphi? And the officer said, just inaudible. And I was wondering if he said Snapchat or Instagram. Kagan said, that's not evidence. That's me talking to the per... That's not evidence of me killing anyone. I've never even... I can't even remember a time I've been to Delphi. So this was August 2020. But in his December 2021 headline news interview, he said he went to Delphi for a football game in high school. So another case of him lying to the police. The officer said something that was inaudible and Kagan said, and I, and the officer continued, again, I didn't say you did. I know. I don't know anyone that did. Listen, so again, we're talking evidence, right? Right. We have evidence. Court of law evidence? Physically talking to a girl that was murdered, right? The officer says, right before she died. And we have witness statements that talk to Anthony Schatz that said they were talking about meeting up, even to the point so far that she said Anthony Schatz told her when they said, oh my God, what happened? Hey, I was supposed to meet her, but she didn't show up. That's evidence. So here, the way he worded it was witness statements she said. So do they have screenshots or recovered conversations, or is it just the friend's recollection of her conversation with Anthony Schatz? Kagan says, I don't think I ever said that. Page 182, the red stuff is kind of irrelevant. And then the officer continues, and so if you don't remember it, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I'm not saying that you did it, but we need to know why did it. Yeah, and the only you do. Person right now that you're telling me had access to the Anthony Schatz account was you. And the only person that used your phone for the Anthony Schatz account was you. So Kagan says, yeah, that doesn't mean I killed two people. The officer says, I didn't say that, but you did sure tell her then that you were supposed to meet her and she didn't show up though. That's true fact evidence, okay? Let's just focus on that one minute detail. That conversation that happened, that went back and forth, and again, I'll refresh your mind, where the girl contacted Anthony Schatz and said, did you hear what happened to Liberty? And Anthony Schatz responded, OMG, what happened? And then she goes and tells him what happened. And then Anthony Schatz says, well, I was supposed to meet that girl, but she never showed up. So let's focus on that one conversation of evidence we know is true. And it doesn't matter if you remember it or not. So I wondered, was that referencing them missing the night of the 13th or that they died on the 14th? If Kagan didn't know who Liberty was, wouldn't his response have been, who is Liberty? 
At one point, I was not sure when the oh my God would happen discussion took place, but it was revealed elsewhere that it was when the girls were missing, so likely the night of the 13th. Also, the Anthony Schatz quotes are different in this section. In the first time, they said, yeah, and here it says, well, and it says, I was supposed to meet that girl, but she never showed up. Kagan says, right. The officer says, but who then would have had access? Who would have said that then if it wasn't you who supposedly is the only one who had access to? Nobody. Who would have... But that's not, we know that's not, Kagan says, I'm saying like nobody had access but me, so I don't, so then it was you who said that. What I'm saying is I don't remember saying that, but it had to be me if I'm the only person that uses it. Right, so why would you say I was going to meet her, but she never showed up? Why would you say that? Why, why would I ever go meet someone? I don't know, tell me. Exactly, I wouldn't, that's like me, so... I don't know, this part is back and forth and it doesn't make sense. So the officer says inaudible, saying that, that's right, I need to know. Kagan says, no, I'm saying I probably said that. But what I'm saying is I would never go meet someone. The girlfriend I have now, I wouldn't even meet. Because I was like so nervous because of all the stuff that happened. I'm just like, the officer asked, so then did you give the information to someone else? I mean, did, no. Was there some sort of, I would, was there some sort of, and I can see that happening. I can see you making a statement of, oh man, this girl wants to meet. She's going to the high bridge today, and then whoever you told that to went to the high bridge that day. Kagan says, I, inaudible, inaudible, about stuff like that. I would never talk to someone about girls I talk to or nothing. That's not what I would do. But then again, we have to go back to that one narrow scope of a conversation we're looking at. Why would you say that to that other person? Why would you say, as Anthony Schatz, I was going to meet that girl and she didn't show up? I don't know. I don't know. The officer revealed, You know, even before that, we have witness statements that Liberty was looking at meeting Anthony Schatz. So again, that's another piece where we're making this even bigger now and looking at this, now we have multiple people saying that. Why would Anthony Schatz do that? I don't know. I really don't have a clue. Like I said, I don't remember talking to her, so I don't know why I would say that. I don't either because he looks nothing like Anthony Schatz and didn't drive. So how is he going to meet somebody and be like, hey, I'm not Anthony, but let's go have some fun in the bushes. The officer asked, do you see why this needs to be cleared up? Yeah, trust me, I know it needs to be cleared up. You need to find the person that did it, yeah. Well, the person that did it, as in sending those messages, was you. I'm talking about the person that killed them. Okay, well, I need cleared up why. I told you for the past 30 minutes, I've told you I'm not lying. I don't know anyone who did this. I didn't do this. I don't know anyone about the, it's redacted several characters long, possibly the last name of the ski mask girl. I don't know any of that. The officer says, you just said you knew the, it's redacted and several characters long, probably the family name. Kagan says, I'm saying I don't know who looked in her effing window, but I don't know anything about that. The officer said, what I'm telling you is we need to clear up the statement of Anthony Schatz. We need to do that because we can, I said it three times now, I never remember saying that. Even if I said it, I don't remember saying that. Page 186. Okay, but as a law enforcement officer, you investigating a murder at a gas station, right? Yeah. Just because the person that you have on video and you have the evidence that did it says, well, I don't know, can you leave it at that? Kagan says, you have to get evidence in a court of law. The officer says, you have video. Kagan says, inaudible. Yeah, is his face showing in that video and everything? Officer, inaudible. Kagan continues, well, then take him to court. What do you mean? We have to clear it up. Just because someone says they don't remember, I know, doesn't mean they didn't do it. Kagan says, I mean, inaudible. The officer replies, that's the point I'm trying to make. I get what you're saying. Yes, I totally understand. Because we know for a fact that Anthony Schatz said those things. Right. And that's why it needs cleared up. Right. And again, you saying you don't know does not clear it up. Kagan says, well, that's what you're going to get out of me because I really don't know. I don't remember saying that. That just goes to show you how serious, like, I like, I've talked to so many girls. I don't even remember saying that. But again, we go back to the whole thing. You talk to a lot of girls, but unfortunately, one of the girls, I understand that, that you were talking to was killed. Okay, yeah. So that's why it needs cleared up. So don't you think maybe I would think about that in my mind? In this part, I'm not sure what he's referencing. Think about what? That he was supposed to meet Libby when the girl said she was missing? The officer says, absolutely. And that's why Kagan says, exactly. So why would I be saying, I don't know? The officer says, and that's why you searched, can you trace IP addresses from social media? That's why you listened to that audio clip. That's why you searched server information to see how much information gets stored on servers because you're thinking about it. Especially on vacation, you're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to be in Vegas having fun. Kagan interrupted and said, that server thing isn't... 
that server thing's about work and stuff. The officer says, right, and Kagan continues. I mean, searching about servers and stuff, that would have to do with something with my work. And I was like, what work? The officer continued, so right after, and I'm talking minutes, that you are searching, police continued to pursue leads in Delphi Girl's murder, that girl's missing after posting Snapchat messages, an article you search, can you trace IP from social media? So were you thinking about the Delphi investigation? Kagan says, I probably was, and the officer interrupts, inaudible. Kagan continued by saying the word constantly, which I wish the officer had not interrupted him so much. The officer said, a few minutes later, there's where you start searching about internet servers, so randomly you're reading all these articles? Kagan said, so I am inaudible. The officer says, about Delphi. Kagan, I was obviously like, well, I talked to her friend and stuff, so they obviously could see that I talked to her friend on Snapchat. That's probably why I searched that, because I was probably like, oh, F, I talked to that person's friend. If Kagan was innocent in Delphi, why would he care there was evidence he talked to Libby's friend? because it would lead to discovering his other chats and CSAM? The officer said, but again, you didn't just talk to that person, you talked to her. I know, but what I'm saying is I don't remember talking to her, so in my brain I was pra and audible. Page 189, the officer continued, you told investigators you did. Okay, but I'm, I don't though, I don't remember that now. Oh my God, he's so annoying. I don't remember even when I told them. I don't even like, I don't remember what I did last week. I don't. But do you see how you're picking and choosing things you remember? No. I wish you would see, from my point of view, the redacted, possibly the family name of the ski mask girl, thing was nothing to do with me remembering anything. The officer says, no, I'm not talking about that. I mean, you sat here. You said that the woman that interviewed with you was very motherly. You remembered that she was very motherly. Kagan says, I do remember her being really nice. You remember that she told you that you need to stop and that you remember what you told her you have a problem. Kagan inaudible. So you remember all these things, but then you just sit here and tell me, well, I don't remember any of that, but that's... Kagan says, I never said I didn't remember about the lady. The officer says, the interview. She was a part of the interview. Okay, she's the one. And Kagan says, so was the other guy screaming at me the whole time, trying to be the good cop, bad cop. He did not scream at you in that interview. Okay, maybe not scream, but you know what I mean? He's trying to do the whole thing, get in your face and try to get you to... I'm not stupid. <laughs> the officer says... When you're interviewed in the bus and everything like that, no one got in your face. I'm not talking about that. I am. I'm talking about in here. Okay, I am. Okay, well, I'm not. I don't even remember what I said to them. I'm talking about in here. I remember everything I told them. The officer says, you're contradicting yourself. I remember them showing me the pictures in the bus. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I remember. And you remember her being motherly. Kagan says, and I remember her saying, well, if you can't do this, come take a polygraph. And I was like, well, I'll do whatever you want. I'll take DNA. I'll do whatever. That's what I remember her saying in that bus. So why would Kagan agree to do that if he was the killer? The officer says, I'm going to step out. And I mean, I seriously need you to stop picking and choosing memory. You can say that you're not, but okay, I'm not. I'm telling you, you are. I'm really not. And the officer says, okay, and when you're being presented with these facts that we have, and you're telling me that I don't remember, that doesn't make them disappear, okay? Okay, I get that, but I can't rethink. I can't re-remember something. Try, because this is important. Okay. If you're going to tell me that the double homicide of these girls are not important, and when did I say that one time? You don't want to remember it. Is it not worth remembering? Kagan says, I told her everything I remembered. The officer says, okay, well, you need to sit here and you need to start remembering more because this is important. Kagan says, there's nothing else I know. Okay, all right. So the detective left the interview room and another officer entered. He said, all right, brother. Looks like road guy took the comfortable cuff, so I got to put, I got two pair for you though. All right, I'm going to take you over to the county jail. Kagan inaudible. The officer continued, yeah, they'll book you in and everything, all right? You got no bond. Kagan says, all right. So I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but Kagan says, yeah. And then the officer continues, if you unfortunately go to trial and this is all found guilty or whatever, this will probably be 40 some years, be your last, last trip outside. So because you won't bond out. So at the end of this, they just talk about putting the handcuffs on and at the end of this, Kagan goes to the Miami County Jail where he's been sitting for over two years. I guess we'll find out in the coming weeks and months whether Kagan finally got sick of sitting in jail and thought, well, maybe I'll tell some more so I'm not in here for the next 40 years. 
Next up, I'm going to do a review of the highlights or the lowlights of Kagan's interview with Headline News and Barbara McDonald. This took place on December 9th, 2021, which was three days after Indiana State Police said they were looking for information about the Anthony Schatz profile. So I watched this video on YouTube and then I rewound to the beginning. And I noticed that Kagan's face looked like this at the end of the interview. But when I skipped back to the beginning, it looked like this. So I made this comparison so you can see on the right, it's towards the end of the interview and the left is the beginning. I don't know, what's that skin condition called? Guilty? They only aired a small portion of this on TV, but it was recorded by the jail and the transcript was entered into the legal system and released. So I'm just going to read back some of the important points. So at this point, Barbara asked, do you think your dad could have been accessing that profile, which is the Anthony Schatz profile? And he said, yeah, I do. But in his 2020 police interview, Kagan said on page 93, no, my dad wouldn't even be allowed to do that. I wouldn't let my dad have my phone for long periods of time or nothing like that. The police asked, did dad know your passcode? And he replied, no. There's stuff on there that I would never want my dad to see. Barbara then asked, do you think that your dad could be involved in what happened to Abby and Libby? No, because I was with him that day. So you were both at home in Peru. Yeah. Kagan said that on February 25th, 2017, during the police raid of his father's house in Peru, I asked them, hey, what is this for? And they told me to shut the hell up and get in the car. <laughs> he said his friend from Texas sends him text messages, which is an approved form of communication in jail. Police wanted to give him another polygraph on December 6, 2021, the Monday before his December 9th headline news interview, but they ended up only asking questions without a polygraph. He said he offered to take the first polygraph and DNA test in February 2017 because he was innocent. The only time he ever went to Delphi was for a football game in high school, but he told police that he had never been there. He said law enforcement showed him all his GPS locations from February 13th, 2017, and Delphi was not listed. Quote, and he's shown me, he's shown me that day all my GPS locations, you know, and Barbara said, and none of them were in Delphi. No, not even close. So if police saw that Kagan's GPS was on Country Club Road in Peru, wouldn't it be expected that he'd have his phone turned on and cellular service at Monon High Bridge if he or Tony were meeting Libby? to communicate with her or check for messages about her location or if she's running late. It doesn't seem like the GPS pinged in Delphi or at the bridge at 2 p.m. If Kagan somehow gave information that Libby was going to be at the bridge alone to another man, and he went to the bridge in hopes of only meeting or hooking up with Libby, thinking that she'd be alone, he probably would not have turned off his cell phone after he parked because he would not have anticipated his encounter with Libby turning into him murdering her and her friend in a police investigation with a cell tower GPS search. So whose phones pinged at 1.30 to 2.15 near the bridge? Do you think investigators are thinking your dad could be involved in the murders? Well, I know about three Fridays ago, they raided him and I'm not sure what it was about, but on the news, I saw them show the house and then his neighbor talked to the reporter and said that he was raided. But I've tried to contact him. He won't contact me back. So I don't know. Up until about two, three weeks ago, he would talk to me every day, come out and visit with me all the time. This is the house in Peru where a neighbor told me federal agents and local police visited just a couple weeks ago. And they asked me a few questions. That whole parking lot was full. There was at least 12, 12 cars there, unmarked vehicles. They were all trucks and SUVs. Um, they went in his house and they took his dog. Why was Tony's house raided again at the end of 2021? It had been so long since the murders and Kagan's online activity. What could possibly be in the house to take? I tried to do some calculations and I think that their raid was on November 19th, 2021. The neighbor said that Tony's dog was taken, but I'm not sure if it was returned later. Did they take the dog to test its hair against hairs at the crime scene? Kagan said that Tony stopped talking to him from August 19th, 2020 when he was arrested until April 2021. Then he started talking frequently and sent money and visited, but stopped when his house got raided. So why would he stop talking to Kagan at that time? Barbara asks, so tell me about the 13th. What were you guys doing all day that you know for sure he was with you the whole day? Well, he doesn't work on Monday, Saturday, and or Sunday and Mondays. So we would always just hang out at the house, go to my grandparents. But I remember that day we watched a wrestling pay-per-view that night. He was at my grandparents with me around five and six and then the rest of the night, but he usually sleeps, you know, because he works third shift. He normally sleeps until about one or two, and then we wake up, get lunch. So you know that he was with you from one or two, Monday the 13th. Right. Throughout the evening. Right. Yeah. So I researched what wrestling pay-per-view event was on February 13th, 2017, and there was not. 
I found this and it shows that it was the day before on Sunday, February 12th, 2017. There was a smackdown, which hopefully another prisoner will reenact with Kagan. And it started at 8 p.m. Indiana time. So was Kagan lying or was he misremembering which day that event took place? If they're both big wrestling fans, you would think that they would watch it live. I mean, they have nothing better to do. How do you reconcile this in your head, this focus on you? I have no clue. I've asked them. I'm like, what else do you want me to do? And it's like, they're harassing me. They will not stop. It's like, I've done everything they want. They went through all my phones. They know everything about me. They've talked to people that I know. It's like, they will not stop. One of those charges was trying to solicit a child to meet you for sex. That's what they said, but the evidence on in my thing doesn't show anything like that. Maybe somebody else was using that profile and trying to do that? Right. But your dad would be the only other person who would have access to that profile? Yes. But in Kagan's 2020 interview with police, he said that his dad would not have access to his phone and he pretty much tried to blame it on his friend. What would you like to ask your father right now? I texted him the other day and just asked like, why are you believing everyone over your own son? You know what I mean? Like, I don't get, I'm his only son or and daughter. I'm an only child. It's like, why are you just giving up on me over nothing? Well, I get it's not over nothing, but why we were fine two weeks ago and then they raid you and it's like, now you're not going to talk to me? Tony is probably blaming Kegan's CSAM charges for maybe the police now looking into Tony for CSAM charges and Delphi. Kegan said the police came to him December 6, 2021. They released the public announcement about Anthony Schatz that night. Later in the interview, Kegan said he found out about it on the news the following night. I was supposed to do a polygraph test that day. And you said you agreed, but then they didn't follow through? Yeah. Three or four times I said, are you going to do it? And he just keeps dragging it on and dragging it on. I told him, hey, I'll do it right now. Just give me the polygraph test. And he wouldn't. And then they asked three guys out of my cell block down there to ask them questions about me that night. Do you know what they said? I don't know. I'm not sure. I guess he doesn't have any friends in jail if none of the guys told him what they were asked about from the police. Have you followed the case of Abby and Libby at all? No, not really. Since it happened? No. Uh-uh. -uh. He's currently the biggest suspect in the murder of two girls, and he hasn't followed it? Bitch, please. What do you want people to know about you? That I'm innocent of this and would love to find out who did it. That's two kids that died. You know what I mean? And I just want them to know it's not me, and I gave everything to the state police that they've asked. Everything. This is marked as inaudible in the transcript, but I believe Barbara asked, they took all of your cell phones? Yeah. And one phone you said you found a few days later, and you called them and you said, I have this? It was immediately after I got home. They did a whole interview with me and then took me home. An officer did, and it was right on the counter. And I was like, what the hell? So I called them immediately from my dad's phone and told them, hey, there's a phone that you guys didn't get. They came the next day and got it. He's a liar. So this is a discrepancy that he just said compared to his 2020 interview, where on page 79, he said it was in the kitchen somewhere. It was like on the top of the microwave, I think. Pretty sure I had my dad call the State Department, or maybe I did. I can't remember. Kagan said he thinks it was the next day when the call was made. The officer asked why did he wait. I don't even think I found it that night. I'm not sure. The officer said at 9.19, Kagan uninstalled Snapchat and Instagram from that phone. The next day, on February 26th, he deleted the Meet Me app. He deleted Snapchat again, and it wasn't until two days later that he called the police about the phone. And you had deleted some things from some of your electronics? I deleted an application, yeah. And what app was that? Uh, I think it was Kik. K-I-K. And why did you delete that app? I don't know. I really don't know. But they got me for obstruction of justice for that. There was a woman that I talked to there. She was with Child Protective something, and, uh, I was like, well, if I... I am, she goes, just be done with it, and was like, well, I'm going to delete everything, and she goes, yes, that's fine, just, so I did, that they still hit me with obstruction of justice two times for that, even though she said it was okay to do that. I told her, hey, this is a big wake up, you know what I mean? After this happened, did your father follow this case at all, do you know? Not that I know of, no. Weren't they discussing it when they were together in Las Vegas when Kagan was googling all these articles? after their house was raided for being connected to the case? I mean, come on, dude. Kagan admitted to her that he is guilty of the CSAM charges. Why would he be honest about that, but not any involvement in Delphi? Obviously, there's murder charges and murdering girls and the death penalty. The police obviously don't have solid evidence to charge him with Delphi like they do for the CSAM on his phone. But he could make a plea deal for his Delphi involvement. I believe he and the police were working on some kind of plea deal, possibly in spring 2022, but it may have involved him implicating his father and he wouldn't or couldn't do that 
So those discussions stopped at some point in 2021-2022, but seem to have maybe started again in August 2022. Did you own a marijuana delivery business at some point? Yeah, in Las Vegas, yes. What years was that operating? 2017 to 2018. When did you move out to Las Vegas? Like June of 2017, which goes against the mother of the roommate who said it was March 2017. Okay, and you worked as a casino dealer out in Vegas as well? Uh, no, I didn't. She only asked him that question because he had posted on his Facebook on February 12th, 2017, the day before the murders, that he had just started a job as a casino dealer in Las Vegas when he was in Indiana. I'll talk about that again in a different section. What about armed security guard? Did you ever do that? No, but I worked. Well, not really. No, so no. But I did uh, help one of my friends. I was a bounty hunter out there. Bounty paper towels? But no, I wouldn't say that. I didn't pay taxes or anything for it, so... <laughs> Somebody called the IRS. Were you carrying a weapon? Uh, yeah. Barbara asked him about viewing CSAM. I didn't discuss any of that with any of my friends or nothing like that. But that was something you and your father both shared? You knew that about him? He knew that about you? I wouldn't say that he knew that about me. Wouldn't, because he told the officers that he didn't know. So, I don't know. Barbara's next question is inaudible, but I believe she said, You were into CSAM? Or was he into CSAM? And Kagan replied, right. And how long have you known that about your father? I can remember being around 20 years old and him having sex with one of my friends that was underage. I was about 19, I say, and she was about 17. And he's a grown man. He's in his 40s probably by then. Do you know what age he prefers? I do not, no. But he likes young women. Right. And he has been violent with some of these women? Yeah, his ex-wife, yeah. He's been to jail over beating her up. Yeah. And does he have any substance abuse problems? I mean, um, I know, um, I know he takes prescription pills. I'm not sure if he's abusing them or not. Does he drink alcohol or use any drugs? Not anymore, but I know he used to. Yeah. When did you first find out that your name was out there? Was that yesterday or the day before? So she's referencing the December 6th police announcement about Anthony Schatz. Tuesday night at 7 on the news. It was what opened the news was my face and them talking about me. And what went through your mind when you saw that? That that's crazy. That they're putting this out there because they've done this to a few other people with the Delphi case. Put their face out on the news and everything. And so you think you're just the latest target. Right. How would Kagan know that other suspects have been put out there if he said he has not been following the case? Kegokio, you're getting bigger. In this interview, Kagan said he was 5'11 and about 300 to 310 pounds in February 2017 at the time of the murders. He said his dad is about the same height and weighs about 280. Would your father be capable of going out and walking this bridge and killing two girls? Would he physically be capable of doing that? Yeah, yeah, he hunts and he's got to pull out deer, so I mean, yeah, I would think he would be capable of doing it, but yeah, but you know he was with you. Yeah. Barbara wrapped up the interview asking, Is there anything I have not asked you about that you want people to know? Just that I'm innocent, that's it. And do you think you're going to be charged with anything related to Abby and Libby's murder? No, no I don't. Do you feel like they're trying to get you to pin this on your dad? Yes, I do. And that's probably why he's not speaking to you? Right. Because when I first got arrested, they told me that they knew it was my dad, and if I tell them, all my charges will be dropped. They told you that last year? which would have been August 2020. Like, go, not dropped, but go away. Pretty much is what they said. Inaudible. And they told you that last year when you were arrested. Yeah, August 19th. So I'm curious to know, what evidence do the police have that implicates Tony that has not been released? This is my draft of questions that I thought of while reading Kagan's interviews and thinking about the case and what I would have asked him if I was in law enforcement or if I could interview him. He already answered some of these questions or said he didn't remember when he was nervous talking to police, but maybe he'd be more open to talking to someone who is not in law enforcement or media. At some point, I did want to interview him, but recently I heard he wants three to four hundred dollars to answer questions, and I was like, no, nah, I'd rather save my money for Taco Bell. I try to organize these into somewhat similar subjects. I have so many questions. It's a 13-page Word document that I transferred to PowerPoint so it's easier to read, but I'm not spending an hour reading question after question. It's going to be so boring for people. So I'm just going to show each of these slides from this section for about five seconds on the screen. So if you are interested in reading these questions, just pause for each slide. If not, just click on the next chapter in the YouTube video. So here we go. This section is about after the murders.
In this section, I'm going to give some facts about Tony Klein and hopefully give some insight into the type of person he is. His full name is Jerry Anthony Klein, and he was born in 1968, so he was 48 at the time of the murders. He has diabetes and problems with his foot, which may have been partially amputated in recent years. On May 11, 2021, he said, back to the doctor today, my foot hurts. On August 5th, 2021, Tony posted on Facebook, thank you family and friends, so glad to be home, been in hospital, all right, first of all, can somebody please put out an Amber Alert for Tony's missing punctuation? Because this guy does not know how to use a period or a comma. Anyway, thank you family and friends. So glad to be home. Been in hospital for 14 days and nursing home 20 days, five surgeries and lost 28 pounds. Been a rough month. So ready to ride my bike off into the sunset. Diabetes sucks. Much love. On May 22nd, 2021, I saw that he said that he can't walk and he rented a scooter to get around. Some people think that the killer on the bridge in Delphi had a problem with his walk or his foot. I don't know if Tony had a problem with his foot in 2017. He also has a skin condition on his left arm. I'm not sure what it is. Does anybody know? People who know Tony say that he was known as a peeping Tom for a variety of incidents. Can we change that to a peeping Tony? Tony has a pretty extensive criminal history, going back to even when he was in high school and he followed a girl home. She said she was wearing her cheerleading uniform and saw him following her to her home. Then he was in the bushes. When she got home, she yelled at him that he had to leave or she would tell her parents or call the police. There are a few stories about assaults on his family, including his wife and his two stepchildren. In the 2020 interview with Kagan, police kind of alluded to an incident that happened with a young boy in a toilet, and that was based on a police report where an incident happened where Tony's stepson was in third grade. He overflowed the toilet and told his mother. Tony apparently grabbed him, broke his orbital socket in his eye, lifted him up and dunked his head in the overflowed toilet, and then he bit his wife in the stomach and assaulted her. There's also a story, I think, about him shooting a BB gun at his stepdaughter and also killing the family cat. In 1998, Tony was charged with theft from two restaurants. In 2005, he was charged with battery against a woman. A month later, a protective order against Tony was instated to keep him away from the woman's 11-year-old daughter. Apparently, Tony and another man were in his truck and followed the daughter who was out on her bike. In 2009, he was charged with making harassing phone calls against two women. Apparently, he would moan and make sexual sounds and ask them to get him off. Tony admitted that it was him on the phone, but the calls continued, and one of the women had dated Tony. He had financial problems, including in 2005, there were a bunch of credit and foreclosure charges, including Chrysler, Midland Credit Management, Harley-Davidson, and mortgage foreclosure. For instance, he owed almost $10,000 to Daimler Chrysler. Tony has been divorced twice. The first divorce was filed on February 28, 2003. And 12 years later, in February 2015, Tony filed to stop child support payments for Kagan and get refund on overpayments, I guess since Kagan was living with him. His second divorce was in December 2012. He also had a variety of speeding and driving without a seatbelt charges. So if you're familiar with the case, you obviously know that police have asked to help identify the driver of a vehicle that was parked at the CPS building between noon and 5 on the day of the murders. So what kind of car did Tony have in 2016 and 17? Looking at his Facebook, in January 2015, he bought a red Jeep Wrangler. In October of 2015, he posted a photo of an older black pickup truck. In March 2016, he bought a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Four months after the murders in June 2017, Tony posted a photo of a black Chevy Z71 truck on Facebook and said, traded my truck, got new one. Over the years, Tony has posted photos of a black hot rod car in a garage but he does not have a garage that I can see in his house, so I'm not sure where this is. A user on Reddit posted four vehicles that they said they found were registered to KK and JK's address in the past. JK might be Jerry Klein, which is Tony's real name. It listed a 1994 Chrysler LeBaron, a 2006 Dodge Ram 1500. This is the truck that has been shown in front of Tony's house in a few news reports. I'm not sure if he has had that truck since 2006, which is 11 years before the murders, or if he bought it used before or after the murders. This is a folder I created where I saved all of Tony's pictures of his vehicles. This shows the white Dodge in June 2022. In November 2016, a few months before the murders, he said he took a friend hunting that day, and he posted a photo of the deer in the back of a pickup truck that has a white lining. 
but I do not know if that was Tony's truck. The two other cars listed were a 2008 Chrysler PT Cruiser and a 2012 Chrysler 200. So was one of these cars parked at the CPS building from noon to five on February 13th? At the 2019 police press conference, they said that they were looking for the driver of the car parked at CPS. The car we're looking for was on February 13th. It may have been said the 14th before. It's February 13th. The vehicle was parked at the old CPS DCS welfare building. Abandoned on the east side of County Road 300 North, next to the Hoosier Heartland Highway. That was between the hours of noon and 5 on February 13th. Is there a description of the vehicle? I do not have a description. Somebody posted a video on YouTube where somebody in the crowd mentions that their friend drove by CPS building every day, and you can hear what she said. My friend saw the white truck, and he's the one that told me about it. He drives by there. I do know there was a white truck there. In this section, I'm going to review Tony's Facebook. He has at least two Facebook profiles, but one of them only has one post from January 19th, 2015. I wonder if police have searched Tony's Facebook Messenger activity, as well as how he has edited his post to see what he's hiding. On February 12th, 2016, Tony posted a Facebook photo that has Klein Photography with a photo of Tony's Jeep in Colorado. Klein Photography was the name of Kegan's YouTube channel and the name of his phone that he said he found in the rental car in Las Vegas in 2017. Tony seems to like to take selfies and post them on Facebook, but it seems like there was a large gap between his photos that he posted. On October 15th, 2016, he posted a photo with his dog, but the next one showing his face was June 17th, 2017 for Father's Day, but it's not certain that that photo was taken in June 2017. The next photo he posted of his face was on February 21st, 2018, when he was visiting Kagan in Vegas. I noticed that neither Tony nor Kagan posted any pictures of their faces from their 2017 Vegas trip, but they did post a few photos of their faces from Tony's February 2018 visit to see Kagan in Vegas. I noticed that on August 8th, 2022, at 2.50 a.m., Tony edited some of his Facebook posts, including his 2017 trip. This seems to indicate that he removed one photo, but it seems kind of odd that he was looking back at this at 2.50 a.m. and started deleting pictures. Here's another one. If you click these three dots on a post on Facebook, you might see view edit history, which means that somebody went in after they posted it and updated something. So what could have happened around August 8th that would make Tony want to go back and edit these posts? On August 3rd, 2022, Kagan's trial was postponed from September 2022 to January 2023. So maybe Tony heard that Kagan is working on a plea deal and Tony started to delete stuff. Tony posted a few times during their February 2017 Vegas trip, but like I said, it was never showing their faces. Some of Tony's other 2017 posts were on March 23rd, 2017, a photo of his dog, which was the next photo after the raid of their home on February 25th. On August 7th, 2017, Tony posted a photo of Kagan saying, so proud of my son, just finished school, and now he will be a blackjack dealer in Las Vegas. On August 11th, 2018, Tony posted, my son is coming home for a week tomorrow, hasn't been home in two years, can't wait to see him. This would mean that Kagan had not been home since at least August 2016, but it's been proven that Kagan was in Indiana until at least March 2017. In my first Delphi video, I tried to analyze what was going on, and I said I thought it could be a white rope hanging out of the killer's jacket, but in one frame, it looks like it could be writing, like a white company name or logo. And I mentioned that there was a motorcycle club I found in Indiana, and one was called Outlaws. So I thought it was interesting that I saw that Tony posted a photo with a hat that says, support your local outlaws. I think the white thing in the killer's jacket is a rope and not an outlaw scarf, but I thought it was interesting when I zoomed in. You know I'm zooming everyone and everything. Tony went to Vegas again on February 18th, 2018 to visit Kagan, and his mom and sister said to give Kagan a hug. He also returned in May 2018. Tony randomly posted on August 7th, 2019, pics of Vegas, but I don't think he went back at that time. Kagan posted a photo with his girlfriend on June 20th, 2019, and the next post is August 11th of Treehouse Collective logo. Then August 30th, he updated his profile photo to all black. There were a few results online for Treehouse Collective. One is a dispensary, and another one is for music tracks for sale. So why was Tony posting two Vegas photos randomly? Kagan was arrested and jailed on August 19th, 2020, and Tony posted on Facebook the following day, so it's not like he went into hiding mode. He also posted from the racetrack three days later. Earlier, I discussed about his foot problems, and in September 2021, he said another doctor's appointment. Tony had been a pretty prolific Facebook user, but he has not posted anything since February 17th, 2022. 
2022 until the time of this recording in September 2022. Apparently he's getting a lot of private messages and I guess he's sick of the attention. Somebody posted a YouTube video allegedly showing some private Facebook messages between Tony and another user. I cannot verify whether these are real or not, but he does not use punctuation, so maybe it is Tony. This one is from February 13th, 2022, saying, Your son is all over the news. I'm sorry. Tony apparently replied, Insane my dad is dying. They gave him one week to live. It's the four day. I hope you're doing well. I sure miss you. Keep your head up. Be there for your parents. I know this has got to be stressful for you. Sending your family prayers. Very stressful. Thank you. On February 18th, he said, my dad passed this morning. From April 7th, 2022, he replied, you believe that? Really? He did live in Vegas. I just put money on his books. I did take a lie detector test that I passed, gave them my DNA, and told them to go F themselves. Like I said, I don't know if these are real, but if they have Tony's DNA, why can't they match it up to the killers? Like I showed earlier, Tony apparently had an iPhone 6, but there's mention in the law enforcement documents about a Samsung. So I saw the selfie Tony took, and I thought maybe I could figure out what kind of phone he was holding up using the reflection of his sunglasses. And to me, it looks more like a Samsung than an iPhone, but I'm not sure. Tony had a mustache and goatee in winter 2018, but it wasn't full, and he usually has a clean face. Tony's house got raided in 2021, I believe around November 19th. So did police take his dog to check the dog hairs to see if they matched any hairs found at the crime scene? In Ron Logan's warrant, it said, During the processing of the crime scene, investigators located unknown fibers and unidentified hairs, which may later be used for comparison of similar fibers or hairs. I saw in one interview that Libby's grandmother said that on the day of the murders, Libby was playing with their dog before going to the trails. So I'm not sure if police were aware of that when they wrote Ron's warrant. Poshmark is a website where I guess mostly women sell used clothes and shoes. And both Kagan and Tony have their own profiles. One page is Kagan Klein 420 as the username, but it has Tony's photo as the profile picture and said the category is women. He follows about one man and 289 women who are selling women's clothes. So why is Tony on this website? I noticed that Mondays are kind of significant in the Delphi case. And apparently Tony Klein is off of work on Mondays. Quite a few of the law enforcement press conferences and releases were released on a Monday. And some of the big announcements were the Monday after Easter in 2019 and 2021, possibly signifying some kind of religious connection. So I made a list of eight important dates. And as you can see, seven out of the eight were on Mondays. Monday, February 13th, the girls were killed. Monday, February 20th was a ski mask incident. Wednesday, February 22nd, 2017 was when police released the screen capture from the video showing the killer. Monday, July 17th, 2017 was when sketch one was provided by someone who saw the suspect around the time the girls were slain, but only recently met with an FBI sketch artist. Kim Riley said it was a composite from several witnesses. Monday, April 22nd, 2019, police asked for info on the car at the CPS building. They also released the video and additional audio with guys. Sketch 2 was drawn on February 17th, 2017 by different artists and was based on the description of a person who saw something that the person felt needed to be reported. Monday, April 5th, 2021, there was a news release that the reward was increased to $325,000. On Monday, December 6th, 2021 was when the Anthony Shots announcement was made. And on Monday, April 11th, 2022, there was another announcement that the Anthony Shots account was also using the Yellow and Yubo apps. So what do you think? Is Tony capable of doing this? And if all the evidence seems to point to Kegan being behind Anthony Schatz, why do police think Tony is the one who did the murder? And what evidence could they have that has not been released? Next up, I'm going to talk about the ski mask incident, which may not even be related to the Delphi murders, but there is a possibility, so I just want to review it. It occurred on February 20th, 2017. Like I said in a different section, the day before this happened, Kagan was on Facebook and searching the names of this girl's relatives. Both the Delphi murders and this incident happened early afternoon on a Monday. Tony Klein is off on Mondays and Kagan is off every day. It occurred in the city of Galveston, 20 minutes from Peru and 35 minutes from Delphi. The police report is not available according to what some people have posted online. So who was this girl? There are not a lot of details, but apparently Kagan knew her in real life because he went to school with her brother in at least middle school. He said he could go to her house and the parents would be okay with him there since he was friends with her brother. He said the girl told Kagan that she liked him, but Kagan used the Anthony Schatz account to chat with her, probably to get nude pictures of her. 
I'm not certain if this is the same girl that Libby had recently had a sleepover with and who may have made Libby aware of Anthony's shots. It's unlikely since they are 35 minutes apart, but like I said, I'm not sure. On page 144 of Kagan's 2020 police interview, the officer said, the girl was looking to hook up with Anthony Schatz. So she gives an address to Anthony Schatz because she's coming home after school and she wants to hook up because her parents are not home after school for a couple of hours. Kagan replied, who's that? And said a name that was redacted. The officer replied, someone associated with the redacted, which I think is the family name of this girl that he's friends with. This girl gets off the school bus and there's a guy with a ski mask peering in her bedroom window. On page 146, Kegan denied that it was him looking in her window. He said, she's told me before that she liked me. That's the whole reason why I would talk, try to talk to her because I knew she liked me. That doesn't mean I'm in a ski mask at her effing house. So these are some questions that I have about this incident. Why did this teenage girl agree to meet Anthony Schatz at her house six days after two teenage girls were found murdered a half hour away? It's crazy to me that these eighth grade girls and these younger girls are talking to this guy who they think is 19 to 20 years old and they're looking to hook up. Since there isn't a police report, I'm really curious to know what happened when the girl got off the bus and saw him. Was she outside or inside her house when she saw him? Where did she go? Did he see her? Did he run? Did she see what kind of car he had? If police knew that Anthony Schatz had gotten that girl's address the day before the incident, why didn't they charge Kagan or Tony with stalking? Police said that this ski mask incident is what connected Kagan to the Delphi case. Also, in Kagan's affidavit, it stated, quote, While working the Delphi case, the FBI sent information to the ISP Cybercrimes Unit that an adult male was soliciting female juveniles on Snapchat and Instagram. The adult male was using the username Anthony underscore Shots. Subpoenas were sent to Instagram and Snapchat for the Anthony Shots account information. So did the Galveston police tell the FBI about the girl's encounter when she filed a police report? Or were they separately looking into Kagan and Anthony Shots? Anthony Shots would not have known the address, so he would have had to ask her. It's possible that the family had moved since the last time Kagan knew where they lived, so that's why he had to get the address. But how could Kagan show up as himself? She would freak out that she thought she was talking to some stranger named Anthony, and then Kagan shows up. Kagan says that he suffers from anxiety, and even he would know that would be an awkward situation that likely would cause tension when she realized he had been tricking her. If the Anthony Schatz account and the girl were meeting to hook up, how would Kagan have revealed it was him? Was part of their plan to hook up maybe that she was supposed to be in a blindfold in her bedroom? and either Kagan or Tony thought they could do something to her anonymously? Wouldn't this girl have been able to identify the body type of this ski mask guy, and if it resembled Kagan or Tony? Kagan does not have the model body of Anthony Schatz. He doesn't have six-pack abs. I mean, it's like his midsection resembles an actual keg of beer. I wondered if this girl had previously given other males her address, and this incident could have been related to one of those guys. The ski mask incident seems odd if it was Kagan or Tony. What would they have done? broke in and sexually assaulted her or murdered her or taken something from her? How would Kagan have gotten there if he doesn't have a car? Could it have been somebody other than Kagan or Tony? If the man in the ski mask was not Tony or Kagan, who could it have been? If the man in the ski mask was also the killer in Delphi, that kind of goes against the possibility of the Delphi murders having been a trucker who left the area or a homeless person who probably would not have had access to a cell phone for communicating with girls in the area. So I was thinking of ways to identify the guy in the ski mask and I wondered who entered her home address in GPS. The guy had to figure out how to get there. So maybe a Google Maps search or on their phone, wait, Apple Maps. I sent that tip to police because I think it might be a good idea, but years ago they said they don't want tips on how to do their job, so I never heard back. If it was Kagan or Tony, what would their motives be? Did they feel like they needed to do something to this girl before they left for Vegas the following day? What were they planning to do? Kill her? Take her phone? Sexually assault her? Were they afraid she would tell police that she was chatting with Anthony Schatz? Against this is how would they know that she hadn't already told police that between February 13th and 19th? So doing something to that girl on February 20th may have already been too late to prevent her from revealing Kagan's identity. If the Kleins were not involved in the Delphi murders, why would one of them go to this girl's house when she would be expecting Anthony Schatz? Were they afraid of her telling police that she chatted with Anthony Schatz and it would lead to them getting arrested for CSAM charges if she had sent photos or if police looked into Anthony's online activities and Kagan's cell phone? This was one week after the murders and five days before the raid on the Kleins' house. So Kagan did not know if the police knew about him other than Kelsey's message to him the night of the 13th on Instagram. If the clients were involved in the Delphi murders, why would they risk getting caught in a ski mask outside another teenager's home seven days after murdering two girls? 
Schatz. I guess the same thing. Were they afraid she was going to reveal the Anthony Schatz identity to police? I'm curious to know what other people think about this incident. Was it related to Delphi? Was it possibly Kagan or Tony? And why would they be there? I tried to think of a variety of motives. I don't necessarily believe that these are possible. People focus on the Libby aspect of this, but it's not certain that these murders were because of her online activities. But it does seem suspicious that soon after they arrive and get to the end of the bridge, there is a guy walking towards them with his jacket stuffed and he kills them within a few minutes. Plus, the items in the killer's jacket indicate it was probably planned. The intended scenario may not have been to kill Libby. It may have been a sexual assault or kidnapping or some other reason. So if Tony and Kagan are involved, what could have happened in two weeks that Kagan would give Libby money and he or Tony would want to kill her and were able to plan an elaborate murder that has eluded police arresting them for five years? So I tried to think of motives for the clients to kill Libby. It's important to remember that Libby was still chatting with Anthony Schatz on the day of the murders. This would indicate that Libby had not figured out that it was a catfish account that Kagan and maybe Tony were behind, and rules out any motive related to the client's true identity having been revealed before the 13th. So I tried to think of possible motives that could apply to the clients, but I also thought of potential reasons why it might not make sense. So feel free to share your ideas in the comments. What is the theory police are working if they're telling Kagan that they know his dad did it? So this is something I thought of, but I'm not sure that it's valid. I'm sure all of you will let me know. So in the 2020 interview, Police referenced Kagan's 2017 interview and said he lied about being at his grandparents' house from noon to three and that he was with his dad the whole time. Police said Kagan's phone GPS showed it was near his grandparents' house at either his friend's or cousin's house and he was searching adult movies on his phone. Kagan later admitted that he lied because his friend was a drug dealer and he did not want police to know that he was there. But Kagan does not drive. So do police think Kagan told Tony that Libby would be at the end of the bridge alone on Monday expecting Anthony shots or just there hanging out not expecting Anthony shots? So Tony dropped off Kagan at his friend's house to do drugs while Tony thought he could go to the bridge and do something sexual with a teenager. Tony got angry when he saw Libby brought a friend and it led to murder when Tony thought the girl girls would call police with a description of him, thinking Tony made the fake Anthony Shaw's profile and was talking to underage girls. Maybe at some point Abby and Libby ran, and his instinct was to prevent them from being able to tell on him since he has a history of violence against women and children. Kagan has had to go along with his dad's alibi because he was the one who set it up. Some things against this are, I think Tony is probably too tall for being the bridge guy. Everyone who knows him says his voice is too high. If Tony went to the trails just to get some kind of sexual satisfaction from Libby, thinking she'd be there alone, when he saw that another girl was with her, he could have easily walked in the other direction. But he does have a history of abuse of children and power over females of all ages, so maybe he got angry and wanted to prove something to her. I want to show the time of how this could have happened. So on the screen, I have Google Maps from Tony's house to the bridge, which shows it's about 37 miles, 37 minutes. During my research, I looked up how far it was from Kagan's grandparents' house to the bridge, and that map showed us 46 to 57 minutes, depending on which way you go. So that's at least 90 minutes round trip, plus possibly 10 minutes to get from the CPS parking area to the end of the bridge, 10 more minutes to get back, plus the time it takes to murder and stage the scene is a minimum of 10 to 15 minutes. So two hours is the shortest amount of time that the clients would have needed to go from Peru to the bridge and back. But supposedly the killer was seen as early as 1.30 and after 3 o'clock. And police asked about a vehicle at CPS from noon to 5. A local said their friend saw a white truck at CPS, but I don't know if Tony had his white truck in February 2017. Police could have easily asked Tony's parents if he and Kagan were at their house the afternoon of the murders. So was this retaliation for Libby not showing up to a prior meeting? Anthony Schatz said, yeah, we were supposed to meet, but she never showed up. So did Libby and Anthony Schatz make prior plans to meet maybe on Friday when she was off or Saturday or Sunday, and Kagan or Tony got so mad that she did not show up, possibly at a different location, that they went looking for her on the trails on Monday to teach her a lesson? Against this is it seems extreme to murder two girls because one of them did not show up to meet a guy who wasn't even real. Could it have been a fear of a CSAM arrest for Tony or Kagan? Tony works at the Chrysler plant in Kokomo, which is about 30 minutes from Peru. On Friday, February 10th, somebody named Elliot Schaffner was arrested by the FBI in Kokomo, and the story was online at 10.30 a.m., but at that time, it did not state the reason for his arrest. It ended up it was because an FBI agent chatted with him on Kick Messenger app on February 4th, and Elliot sent CSAM to the agent 
and said he was going to abuse a five-year-old girl on February 10th, a girl who he had previously abused and taken CSAM of. So did the news of this story make its way to the Chrysler plant, and Tony found out and feared that he or Kagan would be arrested for getting nudes from Libby? Kagan was trading CSAM on Kick, the same messenger app where this guy got arrested, and that the FBI was using to catch these guys. Tony is bipolar and maybe he panicked at the thought of getting arrested and losing his job and thought of this plan. Against this, why Libby and not all the other girls that they got photos from? Was it maybe because Libby said that she lived near the bridge and that she would maybe go there during that weekend and the ski mask girl gave her address voluntarily, whereas all the other girls never told where they lived? Also against this, it's kind of unrealistic to reason that you can avoid jail for CSAM by killing all the girls you catfished. Money or blackmail? One theory is that Libby sent nude photos and Anthony Schatz told her to reset her phone to wipe evidence of CSAM against Kagan, although her family said the phone was freezing. Also, Libby and Anthony Schatz continued chatting up until the day of the murder, so it kind of goes against that being a reason why she reset it. If Kagan or Anthony Schatz said, delete everything I sent you and reset your phone, you would think that he would stop talking to her. Did Kagan say Libby was annoying because he got what he wanted if and when she sent nude photos, but she still had a crush on Anthony Schatz and kept sending him messages? I just want to make it clear that it is not certain that Libby ever sent any nude photos to anybody. If she did send inappropriate photos to Anthony Schatz, did she regret it and then say to him in chat messages that he had to prove who he was in real life or she would go to tell the police? Why did Anthony Schatz send Libby money? On page 156 of the interview, they say, we have the money the Anthony Schatz money account going to her. I wanted to see if I could find a transaction with Libby and Anthony Schatz, since some transactions on Cash App remain public for anyone to view the reason why the cash was given. I could not find an account for Anthony Schatz or Libby on Venmo or Cash App. On Cash App, there is a Kagan Klein who joined May 2019 after the murders. He has a screen name Treehouse2015, but I'm not sure it is him. But I did see that Kagan posted an image of Treehouse Collective on Facebook on August 11, 2019. But there are no transactions listed for that account. The avatar is a treehouse with smoke coming out of it, so it might be Kagan. I did find Kagan on Venmo as Kagan-Klein, but there were only three transactions and all of them were after the murders. You can fake a profile name like Anthony Schatz, but you can't fake your bank account information or name. It's possible that the Anthony Schatz money account on Venmo received payments for maybe selling CSAM or trading it or other items and used that balance to pay Libby and other girls so it did not reference Kagan's personal bank account information if he had a balance that was not funded by Kagan's true bank account. So did Anthony Schatz send Libby money because she was blackmailing him? I'm not saying that Libby is the type of girl who would have done this, but I'm just trying to think of different reasons. Did Libby see Anthony Schatz flaunting his wealth and sent him a message like, send me $10,000 or I'll tell police you had me send nude photos? She could have said it jokingly or just as a threat to get Anthony Schatz to prove that he was real, so she did not regret sending photos. Possible things against this theory being true is that these private messages would probably still be visible on Libby's social media account for her family and law enforcement to see, unless it was one of the deleted Snapchat messages. If the blackmail angle is accurate, Libby may have revealed in a deleted Snapchat message the prior week that she lived near Monon High Bridge and would be there at some point on Monday, and that is why the killer was there starting at noon per the police statement. So they killed her to keep her quiet about CSAM and to show her that they were in control, not her. Against this is why would they risk a murder charge or a double murder charge compared to CSAM? And like I've said earlier, why kill Libby and not the 100 other girls that they were exchanging messages with? I've never heard anybody suggest this next one, but maybe there's a reason for that because it doesn't make sense. But it did pop into my mind that it could have been maybe a CSAM photo shoot. So Kagan did not have a job and he could have used CSAM to make money. So was Kagan selling videos or photos of underage girls to make money or selling login information to the Anthony Schatz account? Kagan was obviously addicted to looking for and trading CSAM. So did the killer go to the trails, assuming Libby would show up alone at some point, and planned to use a gun to get her to a remote area to take pictures or video of her in sexual positions and then sell or trade that CSAM to other men online? I thought of this scenario because of all the things stuffed into the killer's jacket and wondered if it could possibly include sex toys or possibly the white rope at the top of the jacket or other signature items that were maybe left at the scene to be used in videos or photos. However, this scenario 
could probably not involve using the rope or other items that may have the killer's DNA that remained at the crime scene. If this scenario is true, maybe when the killer saw that Libby had another friend, he was fine with it to think that he could get videos of two of them. But when they did not cooperate, he killed them. Some reasons against this that I thought of is Kagan was getting plenty of photos and videos by sitting in his home. Why would he venture out thinking he needed to do like some kind of photo shoot in the woods? In planning this scenario, how would a killer have thought they could show their face to Libby and she would not go home and then call the police? Possibly they could have threatened her that she had already willingly sent her nude photos and they would send them to her family and friends if she went to police. Also against this, what kind of phone or camera device would the killer have used to take photos or videos of his criminal act? It's not really smart to have photos like that on your phone. Also, his phone would have probably shown up connected to the cell phone tower. In an extreme case, there are what is known as snuff videos, I think where a woman is sexually abused and then killed on camera. Some people have speculated that these murders were maybe photographed or videotaped and then put on the dark web. I'm not sure that that is true. It's been over five years, and you would think that if somebody posted that online, even in the dark web, that somebody would have made a connection that it was Abby and Libby and informed the police. Was this a planned sexual assault? Was this supposed to be a meeting with Libby and Anthony Schatz? Maybe she thought she was just saying hi, but the killer planned to sexually assault her and brought rope, knife, and a gun to control her, as well as possible other signature items. But when he saw that she brought Abby, he got angry. And instead of going back home, he wanted to teach her a lesson. Tony obviously has a history of violence against women, including young girls. Kagan told the girl he previously met at the park who brought her friend, quote, I should cut your throat for this and watch you bleed out. Why would you bring someone with you, end quote. And he said he knew where she lived, end quote, I could kidnap you if I really wanted to. If this initially was not planned to be a murder, it ended up being difficult to keep two girls from identifying him, so he had to kill them. Against this, a girl would likely not go to meet Anthony Shots in sweatpants and would want to look her best. And she would not have invited her sister Kelsey unless she knew that Kelsey would say that she could not stay due to her work. It seems more likely that the killer knew that Libby would be there, but she was not expecting Anthony Schatz or anyone else. Some people have speculated over the years whether Snapchat had some kind of feature where somebody knew that Libby was at the trails. I looked online and Snapchat Snap Map showing a user's location was not introduced until June 2017, several months after the murders. Next up, revealing the client's true identity. So Kagan logged in and out of his phones and accounts a lot. Did he mistakenly reveal something using his true Kagan client account? Going against this, Libby thought she was chatting with Anthony Schatz on the day of the murders. And even though Kagan deleted messages from his Snapchat, I would assume some of those might still be on Libby's phone. There are other chat messages where Kagan would ask the girl if she'd be interested in his dad. So did Anthony Schatz ask Libby if she would be interested in Anthony's dad? And Kagan sent a real photo of Tony and maybe Libby replied that he looked nothing like the father of a model or Anthony Schatz and maybe said that the only modeling Tony looked like he could do is a before picture of an advertisement for dental veneers, and he was so insulted and angered that he wanted to teach her a lesson? It seems unlikely, but if they feared their true identity would be revealed, it could be a reason. Could it have been a kidnapping? Kagan did not have a job and would sit at home all day. So were they going to kidnap Libby and lock her in their basement as a sex slave? Against this is their house is so close to other homes, it would have been difficult to smuggle her in, and they did not do that with any of the other girls that he chatted with. And it seems even more unlikely that they could kidnap two girls. The last possible motive I thought of was weed and CSAM trading. Did Kagan know an older guy he did weed with, and he told the guy that he gets CSAM, and they made a deal where Kagan would upload Dropbox images in exchange for cash or weed? Something against this being true is why have police not tracked down the Dropbox downloader and identified him as the killer? Even if Kagan made money by selling access to the Anthony Schatz account, he would still see messages the other users exchanged once he would log back in, unless they deleted them, but obviously some girls would still be responding between the last user login and Kagan logging in, so I'm not sure that this theory really makes sense. I'm curious to know what other people think. What kind of motives would the clients have to even do this? or to even be at the trails that day, even if it was not for murder, why would they be there? As I go along in my research, I kind of write down reasons for and reasons against why the clients could be the killer. In the end, I kind of compare which side has more evidence, either for or against, whether they're innocent or guilty. And if I was on a jury, is there enough evidence for me to convict them, regardless of what other horrible things they've done in their lives? So I'm going to start with reasons for Kagan or Tony as suspects 
for being the guy on the bridge who killed Libby and Abby. Kagan obviously had a major CSAM addiction, looking for girls the same age as Abby and Libby and even younger. Kagan allegedly catfished another girl and met her at a park, and he later violently threatened her because she brought her friend. The Delphi murders could be a similar situation where Kagan or Tony thought only Libby would be there, and they got really angry that she brought a friend. Kagan communicated with Libby on social media the day of the murders. Kagan supposedly messaged another girl after the murders saying that he was supposed to meet Libby, but she did not show up. Kagan sent Libby money. Allegedly, per Murder Sheet podcast, Kagan searched Marathon Gas Station in Delphi on the day of the murders. There are court filings from August 19th, 2022, indicating Kagan may be revealing more information in hopes of a plea deal. There is also a rumor that Kagan was removed from jail for a few hours or a few days, and he may have revealed evidence was thrown over a bridge into a river near Tony's house. Why would investigators ask questions about the Delphi murders during Kagan's August 2020 interview about his 30 CSAM charges if they didn't think he had anything to do with it or his dad? The investigator said he did not think Kagan killed them and was not in Delphi that day, but there would have to be more evidence that would cause police to ask Kagan to identify his father or someone else as the killer. Tony had off on Mondays and could have been in Delphi and at the Galveston ski mask incident seven days later. Tony has diabetes and a foot problem. The killer's gait was only on video for a short time, but it could be interpreted as an unnatural walk, although the bridge is difficult to walk across. On February 12, 2017, the day before the murders, Kagan posted on Facebook that he started a new job as a table games dealer in Las Vegas. Did he know that the following day, either he, his dad, or an accomplice were going to murder Libby and he needed an alibi? Why would he post that he started working a few states away when he was in Indiana? Did he go to his friend's or cousin's house in Peru the afternoon of the murders and leave his phone there during the murders as a pre-planned alibi? Kagan failed his February 2017 polygraph about knowing about the Delphi investigation. Kagan said that police said to him that it was either him or him and somebody else who killed two girls. They tried to say that I failed a polygraph and that I did it, me or my dad. The detective said to Kagan, do you know for sure who killed those girls? You did say no both times in your polygraph and guess what? That was deception. Kagan searched multiple things related to the Delphi murders while he was on vacation with his dad in Las Vegas, February 21st to 25th, 2017, as well as the investigator referencing his searches, can you trace IP addresses from social media? That's why you listened to that audio clip. That's why you searched server information to see how much information gets stored on servers and other suspicious online activity. Kagan reset his iPhone after he got home from his polygraph and he informed police he found the phone two days after the police raid did not capture the phone. His search history from February 10th to 15th was missing, which could indicate it would reveal something related to the murders, but it was deleted by Kagan. August 11th, 2018, Tony posted on Facebook, my son is coming home for a week tomorrow, has not been home in two years, can't wait to see him, which would have been August 2016, but Kagan was at his dad's house until March 2017, which is one year and five months. So was Tony posting false things on Facebook to give Kagan an alibi? Maybe Tony just isn't good at math. I mean, Lord knows he's not good at English. Tony has a history of harassment, stalking, and physical abuse against women and children, as well as having sex with Kagan's 17-year-old friend when he was in his 40s. Kagan and Tony were looking for sex together when they were in Las Vegas two weeks after the murders. Law enforcement said, quote, we have the kick messenger, messages with all these my daddy references, end quote. Kagan refuses to say the names Libby and Abby. On page 160, he said, quote, I literally have no clue how that girl died. Her Instagram screen name is underscore Liberty with a bunch of R's, and her Snapchat was Liberty.German. It's a really unique name. Anyone who is accused of murdering two teenage girls would know the names of the people they're accused of murdering. Is he refusing to say her name as a way to disassociate from his guilty role in their murders? Law enforcement asked him, when would you say you realized that Liberty German, the girl that you were talking to, was killed? He replied, I don't know, probably, I mean, a little bit after, probably happening, inaudible. I mean, probably after it happened, and I saw, like, her face and saw her name. Then, probably after it happened? How could he have realized she was killed before it was announced on the news? Did he know that she was dead before the police were called on February 13th? The wording of his response saying probably a little bit after is kind of odd, but so is every other answer he gives. Tony's house was raided again in November 2021, and his dog may have been removed to check for hairs and DNA matching those found at the crime scene. If Tony is the killer on the bridge, why has Kagan not turned on him yet? 
Is it because Kagan is going to be in jail for many years for his CCM charges? And Kagan does not want to be stuck in the same jail with his father, who he turned in, for possibly CSAM charges as well as the murder charges? One user commented under my live chat in June that he went to jail and his relative was also in the same jail, but they were separated due to their family relationship. Although Kagan might not know that that's a possibility. Now I'll review reasons against Kagan and Tony as suspects. Their physical traits. Kagan is about 5'11 and at least 275 pounds. Tony is about 6 foot 280 pounds. The teenage witness who described the killer on the trails was 5 foot 6 and she said the killer was about an inch or so taller. If she passed somebody on the trails who was 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, she would not estimate their height at 5 6 or 5 7. The killer seems to have a lot of things stuffed into his jacket, so it's giving a false impression of what his midsection looks like. When the killer lifts his leg, it gives a better idea of the real size of his leg and thigh. To me, the killer does not look like he's over 250 pounds. Kagan's face looks bloated in almost every photo, but the face of the guy on the bridge does not look too wide or having a big head. I tried to make this face comparison between the Kleins and the killer. In the middle, I have two different screen captures from the killer on the bridge. The one on the right is towards the end of the video, and the one on the left is a little bit earlier, and it looks like he has a mustache. It looks like he has bangs, and to me it really doesn't look like either Tony or Kagan. I also tried to make a comparison photo between the guy on the bridge, Tony, and Kagan. This was the only photo of Kagan I could find that shows his entire body standing up, and it's from December 2018, so he could have gained weight. Even though to me it seems like they're both taller than the killer, I tried to adjust it so their face was at the same level as the killer. And like I said, the killer has a bunch of stuff in his jacket that's making his midsection look bigger. To me, it really does not look like either Kagan or Tony's body. It's important to remember that these camera angles are different. Libby was probably sitting at the end of the railroad tracks, whereas the photos with Tony and Kagan were by somebody who was standing up. I tried to do a comparison photo to see how tall Tony and Kagan are. Tony Klein likes to go to the car racing track a lot, and he's friends with a guy named Dave Darland. So I found an older photo with Dave Darland and race car driver Tony Stewart, who online it says he is 5'9". So I pasted another photo to the left of him where he's not wearing a hat. So you can see the top of somebody's head who's 5'9", is around Dave Darland's eyebrows. And Tony is a little bit taller than him. And on the left, you have Kegan, who looks like he's maybe about 2 to 3 inches shorter than Tony. And I tried to match up Kegan's face where he's not wearing a hat. So if the teenage girl on the trails said that the guy is about 5 foot 6 or 7, Kagan and Tony are nowhere near 5 foot 6 or 5 foot 7. In some frames, the killer looks like he has a large, dark mustache, but Tony and Kagan do not have prominent facial hair. I later found this 2021 photo with Tony Stewart standing next to Tony Klein. So again, Tony Stewart is about 5 foot 9. Here's a photo with Tony Klein and Steve O, who online says he's 5 9 or 5 10, but you can see his right arm is over Tony's shoulder, which is making him look taller. Why did police state at the 2019 press conference they are looking for someone who looks like the younger sketch? That sketch looks nothing like the Kleins. A witness said the killer had reddish hair and the video appears to show bangs, but neither of the Kleins have them. Tony's hair is shaved on the sides and spiked on the top. Kagan's hair is short and black. None of the witnesses seem to have confirmed to law enforcement that the man on the trails resembled either one of them. Obviously, we don't know that for sure. But I would assume any witness is following the case, and if they saw a picture of the clients, they would make a connection if they saw them on the trails. Kagan told Headline News that he gave DNA, a hair follicle, and failed a lie detector. He said he would do whatever investigators wanted. In a supposed Facebook chat with Tony, he said he passed a lie detector test, and he gave his DNA. So they've had both of the clients' DNA for quite a while, but they have not arrested either one. So there obviously was not a strong match to the DNA found at the crime scene, or they would have been arrested. Kagan searched how long does DNA last after his February 25th, 2017 police interview. He said he searched it because police took his DNA that day, and he thought the real killer's DNA would clear him when it did not match his because, quote, in my mind, I'm thinking, these people think I killed someone. So if they actually have DNA on the body, they're going to know that I did not do it, end quote. So if he knew that he killed them, would he really use the above excuse? He lies all the time, but this leans toward innocence to me, at least for him being on the bridge or killing the girls. He could have been there or been involved without getting his DNA on their bodies. There is also the issue of the possible dog hair at the scene that may match the client's dog. Libby's sister, Kelsey, said that on the night of February 13th, when she was at the police station, she messaged several people who Libby had been in contact with, and one of them was Anthony Schatz on Instagram. Kelsey recently posted, I'm not sure why people are so upset about it. I've said many times that there are things I am still remembering to this day, and as I remember them, law enforcement is made aware immediately. 
I contacted several people that I found Libby had been in contact with the evening of February 13th as we were sitting in the police station. I was trying to get as much information as I could to figure out where the girls were. Anthony underscore shots ended up being one of the accounts I messaged. Law enforcement has the details of that conversation, but just know that the short discussion I had with the account threw up no red flags and gave no indication that the account knew anything of Libby and Abby's whereabouts. It was a five minute conversation. I never talked to the account again and didn't think about it again until years later. So even if he was not involved in the murders, Kagan knew the night of the 13th that Libby was missing. But if Kagan was involved in the murders of Abby and Libby and left them in the woods, presumably dead, about six hours later, he gets an Instagram notification that Libby's Instagram sent him a message. What is an appropriate reaction to getting that? The message obviously said it was her sister looking for them, and he always lies and acts like he doesn't know anything. But wouldn't you have deleted the profile right after you murdered the person you communicated with on that app? Kagan did not do that. Police said on February 27, 2017, two days after the raid, that they ruled out the individuals at the client's home as having anything to do with the murders. Why did they clear them so quick? And what has changed since then? Police said Kagan's phone pinged in Peru that afternoon. Did Tony's ping close to Delphi? Couldn't they have gotten that information by February 26 to determine Tony's location? Was this the reference in the April 2019 press conference about, quote, for two years, you never thought we'd switch gears to a different investigative strategy, but we have. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you, end quote. But why would they release a sketch that same day of someone who looks nothing like Kagan or Tony? Tony was over 40 at this time. It's been two years since Kagan was arrested and his police interview where it was revealed that prior police interviews said law enforcement thinks his dad was the killer. So why has Tony not been arrested yet? Kagan deleted the apps for Snapchat, Instagram, and Meet Me on February 25th, 2017 after his police interview. If he had killed Libby or was involved and knows his dad was involved, wouldn't he have deleted the apps and the profiles the afternoon or night of February 13th, not two weeks later? His Instagram Anthony Shots profile was never deleted, so he only deleted the app. It still shows up on Instagram. Wouldn't he have deleted that account if he was the murderer? He should have deleted it after his CSAM arrest, unless police changed the password so he does not have access to it. If Kagan or Tony were the killer, why was Kagan still using the Anthony Shots accounts several days later to chat with Ski Mask Girl and get her address. Wouldn't he not want to draw attention to himself and be worried he was going to get arrested for murdering two girls seven days prior? Or was that the reason that he or Tony went to her house to prevent her from revealing Kagan was behind the account? Since Kagan was using his iPhone 5 and possibly a Samsung to communicate with Libby, wouldn't they have thrown out the phone and got a new one or used one of Kagan's older phones to get rid of any evidence between the time of the murders and when their house was raided on February 25th? Kagan says he has anxiety and he seems like the type who would be afraid to get caught for the murders and go into hiding. Although he was 22 and never had a job, so essentially he was always in hiding in his house. Kagan said the February 25th, 2017 CSAM raid was the biggest wake-up call of his life. If Kagan had some involvement in the murders, wouldn't the guilt of that plus the FBI and police looking for him, have been the biggest wake-up call before the raid? Kagan did not have a license, so how would he have gotten anywhere to meet Libby? Tony Klein is a fashion icon. Have you stopped laughing yet? I'm not making fun of him. I mean, there's nothing wrong with shopping at NASCAR T-Shirts R Us. But my point is, people usually have a similar style of clothes in their closet, but neither Kagan nor Tony have the same style of clothing as the killer on the bridge, who wore some nondescript clothes. Most of Tony and Kagan's shirts, sweatshirts, and hats have some kind of writing on them. People have said that every man in Indiana dresses like bridge guy, but obviously they've never seen the Kleins. This was the only photo of Tony that I found where he's wearing jeans and was posted when Tony joined Facebook in 2013. This is the only photo of Kagan wearing jeans and it does not match the killers. And people say that his face looks thinner in this photo, but his stomach doesn't, compared to the killer on the bridge. Kagan also usually wears shorts and t-shirts with writing on them or some kind of sports t-shirt and big baseball hats with a large rim. This is Tony's winter jacket, at least as of 2018, and it has HD for Harley Davidson written all over it. Tony is almost always wearing shorts, but sometimes he also wears black sweatpants or running pants. Although I think the only running he does is from the law or running errands. And I did not see him wearing any shoes that match what the killer was wearing. It could be argued that Tony or Kagan planned this murder and got jeans, shoes, and a jacket that they never previously wore. But even though Kagan came up with his catfishing schemes and Tony prank called and stalked and abused women, I really don't see either of them as being intelligent enough to plot out the perfect murder of two girls, but maybe I'm wrong and maybe they got lucky. 
Kagan said he did not even have his license, and one of his friends from high school that I contacted said he never saw Kagan operate any motorized anything and said Kagan was always bumming rides off of his friends. And his Las Vegas roommate's mom said Kagan did not drive in Vegas. He posted one photo from Vegas where he's on the passenger side of the car. So how could Kagan have gotten to Delphi 40 minutes from Peru? His dad drove him? Another guy? How did Kagan's phone ping on Country Club Road in Peru if Kagan was in Delphi? Kagan said law enforcement showed him all of his GPS phone locations from February 13th, and Delphi was not listed, not even close. So if Kagan was at the trails in Delphi to meet Libby, wouldn't he have turned his cell phone on to see if there had been a change in plans or where she was? So his phone would have pinged in the wireless data collected by police. Why would Tony freak out and cry after Kagan got home on February 25th after his police interview? I understand most parents would be shocked that their 22-year-old possibly killed two teenagers and their home got raided, but what if Tony was involved in the CSAM and or Delphi? Why would he cry? So if Tony was the killer, was he upset that Kagan did something to reveal their involvement? They had to have known that the Anthony Shaw's account would trace back to them. Was he angry to find out that Kagan even was considered a suspect? But wouldn't a father ask Kagan why he was a suspect? Kagan said he did not tell his dad about his CSAM, but wouldn't he have had to tell his dad he was chatting with Libby and that was why he was a suspect in the killings? Tony would have seen in the news that she was 14 years old. Wouldn't he have asked him, why are you chatting with 14-year-olds? Police said they told Tony about the underage content, but Kagan said he never told his dad and Tony never brought it up between February 25th, 2017 and August 2020 when Kagan was arrested. That seems odd to me that they would never talk about it. Kagan said he was shocked to learn that they told his dad, but law enforcement reminded Kagan that he was told several times prior that officers told his dad about it. What do viewers think? Why would Tony freak out and cry after Kagan got home? Does it indicate Tony's guilt or innocence in the CSAM or Delphi? Or is it just a natural reaction that a parent would be upset? Kagan chatted with and got nude photos from over 100 girls in his area, but he did not kill them or meet them in person, other than that one girl who said she met him at a park. So what would have made Libby different? They'd only chatted for approximately two weeks, so what could have happened in two weeks that either Kagan or Tony thought she needed to be killed? Kelsey said Libby was not dressed nice as she went to the trails, and she put on a black and gold Delphi swimming sweatshirt as she exited Kelsey's car. So if Libby thought she was meeting Anthony Schatz, would she have dressed better? I mean, I know it's not like she's going to wear high heels and a gown to cross the bridge, but it doesn't seem like a girl preparing to meet a rich, hot model for the first time would wear what Libby was wearing. And why would Libby have invited Kelsey to the trails if it was supposed to be a secret meeting with Anthony that her family knew nothing about? In comparing the voices of Tony and Kagan to the killer on the bridge, to me, it's not a match. Kagan's half-brother said it did not sound like Tony. He has a high-pitched, weird voice. It's not deep at all. He did say it sounded like Kagan. Kagan's half-sister said it does not sound like either of them. And Tony has a womanly slash high-pitched voice. Kayla, the girl who met Kagan at the park, said it did sound like Kagan, but I don't know how much she heard his voice in person or on the phone. The mother of Kagan's roommate in Las Vegas said it does not sound like either Tony or Kagan and that Tony has a high-pitched voice. People say that voices change in different situations and they're outside. Libby probably had the phone in her sweatpants pocket, so it would not match up exactly what Tony or Kagan sound like in real life. So I did a test with my phone. I put it in my sweatpants pocket and turned on a video, and I put my sweatpants on my bed a few feet away. Don't worry, I was wearing jeans. So I moved my phone in different directions in the pocket, and I changed my voice high and low, and it still sounded enough like my voice that somebody who knows me would be able to identify it. Somebody called Tony's phone, and apparently this is his voice, but I just want to stress that this is not confirmed that this is Tony. Kagan gave an interview in jail, and this is what he sounds like. He's a huge idiot, but sometimes he speaks like he's starring in a Shakespearean play. So what is my final verdict? If I was on a jury, and I have the evidence that I've seen so far, could I convict either Tony or Kagan as being the guy on the bridge? There's obviously some evidence for it, some against, and disregarding every other horrible thing that these two have done, could I say for sure that it is either Tony or Kagan on that bridge? I would have to say not guilty of being on the bridge, possibly guilty of being involved in another way. And if in a few months police charge Kagan or Tony as being the guy on the bridge and the murderer, I will be so happy to be wrong. And I can always just delete this video. <laughs> These are some of the things I reviewed for Ron. I looked at the satellite images that I got last year to see if Ron's truck was visible in his driveway at 12.58 p.m., but it was too blurry. I added Ron's full body next to the killer on the bridge 
just for comparison. I tried to find Ron's height, but I was unable to find it online even after I looked for his mugshot and arrest record, which did not list his physical attributes. So I tried to match up Ron's body over the killer to see if it matched, and I really don't think it's that close. You can see Ron's mustache is gray, whereas the killer has something more dark under his nose. During an interview Ron did with Inside Edition, they asked him to say down the hill, and he agreed, and it does not sound like him in my opinion. Here's the voice comparison I made. Here or anywhere else anymore. You just cannot believe this terrible thing that happened to the community and the families actually happened here on my property in my backyard. Down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. To me, the voice of Ron does not match the killer. If you were a casting agent for voiceover acting, and you needed the voice of a really old man in his 70s or 80s, who would you pick, Ron or the killer? I would pick Ron because the killer does not sound like he's in his 70s or 80s. To me, Ron does because there's that distinct older man tone to his voice that the killer does not have. Next, I'm going to review a timeline I made. Quite a few of these times I got from the search warrant. On the day of the murders on February 13th, Ron drove to something called a transfer station, which is where the locals bring their trash and recycling items. Cameras at that location picked him up from 11.53 to 11.58 a.m. It's about a 10-minute drive each way, so approximately from 11.40 a.m. to 12.10 p.m., Ron was at least away from his home going to dispose of those items. At 2.09 p.m., he called someone on his cell phone, which appeared to be in or around his property, although his exact location could not be confirmed. The tower data showed his cell phone was in the Delphi area, in the area of the Monon High Bridge Trail. 2.09 was two minutes after Libby posted the Snapchat photo of Abby, and four minutes before Bridge Guy encountered the girls. I saw online that people said it takes about seven minutes to slowly walk across the bridge. So the timing doesn't really add up unless he called somebody while he was on the bridge at 2.09, and the girls were at the other end looking at him. Also, I wonder how many minutes did the phone record show that he was on the phone, from 2.09 to what? So if it was more than five minutes, it's highly unlikely he was the man on the bridge, unless he left his phone on while it was connected to somebody and left it in his pocket, but that seems really unlikely to me. At 5.21 p.m., there was a receipt that was timestamped from Aquarium World in Lafayette, which was found in Ron's home on March 6th. The store is 22 miles or 30 minutes away. The next important time is 6.30 p.m. that night. These were Ron's comments on the murders during one of his TV interviews. And this time frame probably was the 6.30 p.m. when Orange Truck Guy knocked on his door. This is Ron's quote. When they said the two girls were missing, I never thought the worst. I just figured, well, they got into the car and got with someone else like teenagers do. For them to get from there, the bridge, to all the way here, his property where they were murdered, with that rough territory they had to walk. You couldn't carry them in a million years or drag them or drop them off. They had to walk. So if Ron thought they were with friends, why did he think he needed an alibi from his cousin when he called him at 9.20 the following morning? I'll get to that in a minute. But if he was guilty or knew anything about them being murdered at 6.30 p.m., why would he say, I never thought the worst? I'll get to that later also. At 7.56 p.m., Ron sent a text from his cell phone. The initial exam of this analysis indicates Logan's phone was likely outside of his residence and in the proximity of where... Libby and Abby's bodies were located. So who did Ron send a text to and what did it say? Who else was searching that area of his property that night at 7.56 and 10.16 p.m. when he received a text? The language is vague and it's possible he could have been inside his house and the author of the warrant crafted their language to try and get the warrant approved. At 10.16 p.m. Ron received a text, which I'm also curious to know who it was from and what it said. The initial exam of this analysis indicates Logan's phone was likely outside of his residence and in the proximity of where the girls' bodies were located. Like I said, this terminology seems like it was exaggerated to get the warrant approved. So the following morning on February 14th, at 9.20 a.m., Ron called his cousin and asked him to provide an alibi that he came to Ron's home between 2 and 2.30 on the 13th to pick him up because Ron had been on probation since 2014 for driving while intoxicated. So 9.20 was three hours before the girls' bodies were found. But there were police and other citizens present near his property for the prior 16 hours looking for the girls. 
So Ron probably knew that police were going to question him, and likely he was worried about his aquarium visit because he knew he violated his probation by driving there by himself. On February 17th, Ron met with law enforcement on his property and walked up and down the hill without any problem. On February 27th, Ron drank alcohol at a Pizza King restaurant, which violated his probation. On March 6th, a search warrant was executed at his home. Quote, the search was limited to the discovery of firearms and included only his main residence. So why would the police only look for firearms? Does that mean that the police know that a gun was used in the murder? Or at least it was mentioned on video that he was trying to control the girls by showing a gun. On March 6th, Ron told police that he was picked up by his cousin around 3 p.m. and taken straight to the aquarium store in Lafayette and then driven straight home. The warrant said, these statements are found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive law enforcement officers. On March 7th, his cousin was interviewed and said he was with Ron on February 13th and drove him to the aquarium store in Lafayette. Yeah, I know, I just pronounced it Lafayette. Pick one and go with it. March 8th, a former romantic partner said Ron was abusive and a stalker. She said that he threatened to kill her and, quote, no one would find her body. She said he carried a gun in a fanny pack, and she thought that the bridge guy photo looked like Ron. On March 9th, police had a second interview with Ron's cousin, who admitted that he lied to protect Ron because he knew Ron drove while he was on probation. The cousin said that Ron did not ask him to lie for when he drove to the transfer station earlier in the day. I was thinking about why he would not ask for an alibi for that, and it could have been that that trip was a shorter trip, which is closer to his home, and he thought maybe he got away with that one. Also, the cousin may not have had an alibi that he could have lied about during that noon time frame. On March 12th, there was another interview with Ron's cousin. He said that Ron called him on the morning of February 14th and asked him to provide the alibi for Ron's drive to the aquarium in Lafayette. Like I said, that 920 phone call was made prior to law enforcement's discovery of the girl's deceased bodies. The warrant said, based on the investigator's experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability or knowledge of the crime. The cousin said that he thought the photograph of Bridge Guy looked like Ron. On March 14th, two former romantic partners were interviewed and they said negative things about Ron. One of them thought he could be involved in the murders due to his past behavior. On March 17th, there was another search warrant of Ron's home, which is a lot more extensive. They referenced guns and knives again, so I imagine a knife was the murder weapon, and maybe a gun was used to get them to cooperate. So during the investigation into Abby and Libby's murders, police obviously found out that Ron was driving when he was not supposed to and also drinking. So on April 10th, he was sentenced to three and a half years at the Department of Corrections for operating a vehicle after being a habitual traffic offender. He served about one year in jail and the remainder on house arrest. And on January 24th of 2022, he died from COVID. Just some other things I want to go over. So on March 17th, Ron told Inside Edition he was not home the whole time it was going on and that he was in Lafayette buying tropical fish and got home at approximately 6.30 p.m. And then a neighbor, which was Orange Truck Guy, for people who are familiar with this case, asked if he could look on Ron's property for the girls. And Orange Truck Guy was the guy who spotted the girls through his phone the next day. So was animal hair at the scene? The warrant talked about unknown hairs and fibers. So was animal hair at the scene? Did it come from the killer's jeans or jacket and rubbed off onto one of the girls or nearby? I think Kegan and Tony had a dog in 2017, which I'm going to get to them later. Ron had horses and a dog, so could that have come off of his jacket? Could the killer have been a deer hunter and the deer hair came off? Could the killer have been a cow farmer? Or was it hair on the ground from deer or skunks, etc.? that have walked over that spot where the girls died and shed in the prior years. I looked online to get more information about DNA and animal hair, and it said, DNA in a hair can be identified and compared with a known sample. The general DNA pattern will tell a forensic researcher what species the hair came from, such as a dog, cat, mouse, or human. Once it has been determined what type of animal the hair came from, the specific individual dog, cat, or human can be identified by comparison with other DNA of that individual. So why would Ron have needed an alibi before police found the girls? They were last seen on the opposite side of the creek on the bridge. It's unlikely anyone would have assumed they crossed a cold creek onto Ron's property. Couldn't Ron have lied and said he was home and didn't hear or see anything unusual? Wouldn't the average neighbor have assumed that the girls were somewhere else with a friend instead of having been murdered or died falling off the bridge? So Ron really wouldn't need an alibi? I know in the comments already people are going to say, there's no average neighbor. Tell that to Mr. and Mrs. Roper. 
These are some outstanding questions I have. Why did it take almost a month for police to execute a full search of Ron's house instead of on the 13th or the 14th? The girl's dead bodies were found on his property. Was the delay because the cell data later showed he was near the bridge and the bodies and that data was returned around early March and then police coordinated the search warrant then? Even without the phone data, it seems like police should have searched his home immediately. This is going back to what I just talked about. Some of the items in the warrant to be searched and seized, animal hair samples. Does this mean that police found hair at the scene that was tested and it was not human? Libby's grandmother said in 2022 that Libby was playing with her new puppy a few hours prior to going to the bridge. But I'm sure the family already informed the police of this, so it's not like she had her puppy's hair on her sweatpants and police are confused. Tony Klein's house was raided on February 25th, 2017, but also there was a rumor that it was raided again in November 2021 and supposedly included police taking his dog. So maybe police found dog hair at the scene, which was not Libby's puppy. So did Ron only go to the aquarium to have an alibi and a receipt for later in the afternoon because he was involved in the murders? Did he throw out his murder clothes somewhere along that route? Did he think no one would find the bodies and he would have time to think of a place to bring their bodies that night? So he had time to get an alibi around four to six, but he thought he could have time to do something with the bodies later. Here are a few hypothetical scenarios I thought of. If it was Ron on the bridge, who was the guy the teenage girl saw on the trail at 1.30 near the Freedom Bridge entrance? And why would Ron be that far from his house and the bridge if that was him, who was also by Freedom Bridge? If this teenage girl saw Ron on the news after the murders, obviously she could identify him in the days following the murders. She supposedly said that the guy she passed was approximately 5'6 to 5'7 because she was 5'6 and she said he was about an inch or so taller. But Ron seems to be a lot taller than 5'6 to 5'7, even though I was not able to find his exact height online. Or was Ron the killer on the bridge and the man that the teenager saw was just some random guy? If Ron had planned to abduct girls across the creek that day, why did he not wear his boots on the bridge? I saw him wearing two different types of boots, and I would assume that if he knew he was going across the cold creek, he'd want to wear the bigger boots. But bridge guy did not seem to be wearing big boots. If Ron somehow was the killer, did he have the girls go into his house or the barn until 10.15 p.m. or so, and then he killed them? Which is around the time he sent one of the texts. The warrant said there was a lot of blood at the crime scene, so if they were killed elsewhere and dragged, there wouldn't be a lot of blood at the crime scene. And if he killed them at 10.15 in his barn or something, the people who were searching for the girls likely would have heard them screaming or seen him somehow being murdered at his house. Also, the police searched his barn later on and they did not find any blood. So this theory does not make any sense. So why did I include it? Because I've seen people talk about why were the girls not found that night? And people speculate were they taken somewhere else, like the Mears barn down the road or Ron's barn. But that does not really add up to me even though I know it's kind of weird that they were not found for so long. If Ron killed two teenage girls on his property in the afternoon, what would his thought process likely be? I'm immediately going to Lafayette to dispose of clothes and have an alibi? Did he panic and not know what to do and left them there not knowing who or when people would start to look for them? Why would he stage them? The warrant said that they were staged, so why would he stage them at 2.30 or somehow during the middle of the night while people were still searching. He would have had to put the bloody clothes in his truck, but police confiscated that a month later and didn't find any blood or DNA. Is it possible that Ron got a flashlight and searched his property the night of the 13th and found them, but did not report it? Then he knew police were going to be questioning him, and he knew he had driven for over an hour, and police would have asked, did you hear anything? And he couldn't lie and say he was home the entire day, because if the girls had been shot and Ron wasn't there to hear the gun, it would have seemed odd if he said he didn't hear anything. So he needed an alibi to avoid prison for violating his driving offense. And some people question if that's a valid reason, but he was 77 years old. You obviously don't want to risk dying in prison, so I can see how he wanted an alibi, but why did he want it for after two and not before noon at the transfer station? Like I said earlier, the only thing I can think of was that the amount of time he was gone from his home, the transfer station is a 10 minute drive each way, and he was only there for five minutes and probably thought he got away with that, which was 25 minutes total, without needing an excuse or an alibi. So like my prior video for Delphi, as I'm researching different things, I write down notes and different thoughts that pop into my head and I come up with different reasons why somebody could be the killer and why somebody could not. So my reasons for Ron possibly being the killer, 
The bodies were found on his property. He had a history of abuse toward women, but only those he was in a relationship with. The warrant included guns and cutting instruments, which would indicate the girls were injured or killed with a knife, and Ron owned guns and knives. Like I said, the morning after the murders at 9.20 a.m., Ron asked his cousin to lie to the police that the cousin came to pick him up between 2 and 2.30 because they went to the aquarium store in Lafayette and returned at 5 to 5.30. This was three hours before the girls' bodies were found and before police saw Libby's video showing the killer interaction occurred at 2.13. Although Orange Truck Guy's wife may have seen a Facebook post asking for help looking for the girls on Monday afternoon. I remember seeing a screenshot of a Facebook post where a woman said that the girls were missing but I can't find it, and I'm not sure if it referenced the time that they were last seen. However, on March 6th, Ron told law enforcement that the cousin picked him up around 3. So if he wanted a murder alibi, wouldn't he have said that the cousin picked him up before 2? Ron did not ask his cousin to provide an alibi for his drive to the transfer station from 1153 to 1158. Like I said, for the third time now. <laughs> that was probably because it was so close in a shorter time span that he thought he could get away with it. Continued reasons for Ron being the killer. The day after the murders, he told law enforcement he, quote, did not know if evidence would lead to his home needing to be searched. If he did not have anything to do with the murders, he probably would be sure there was no evidence connecting him. But it is possible to not know if there might be something found that could cause police to want to search your home. His cell phone data showed that he was at home or near the bridge at 2.09 when he placed a call. His cell texted someone at 7.56 p.m., and the warrant said it was likely he was outside his home, in proximity of where the girls' bodies were found. He received a text at 10.16 p.m., and he was outside his home in proximity of where the girls' bodies were found. A woman who was in a relationship with Ron said he became physically abusive, including pulling her by her hair out of a car, and said he could kill her and no one would find her body. He also stalked and harassed her after their breakup. These are the reasons I came up with against Ron being the killer. So why he is not the killer, in my opinion. And also some facts. Yeah, it's always good to remember to, you know, pay attention to facts, not feelings. So Ron wore prescription glasses. The killer did not seem to have glasses on. In the Bridge Guy video, the sun would maybe have reflected off of Ron's glasses or somebody who was wearing prescription glasses. Although his glasses were thin and don't show up when I took a screenshot of him walking from far away. He probably could not see well, and it's unlikely a 77-year-old man with an alcohol problem and no glasses, would be walking on that high bridge. Also, his ex-wife wrote on Facebook that, quote, Police have time-stamped videos of his whereabouts at the time the girls went missing. He was terrified of heights. You couldn't pay him to walk across that damned bridge. He would never walk three feet out on it. She was using exclamation points, but I'm not a big exclamation person. She continued to say, The voice is totally different. He's not the guy. She talked to him for four and a half hours after the murders and said he was so upset. Also a bit of an unrelated note, she also said that Ron found a guy cooking meth at the cemetery next to his property prior to the murders, but she did not specify if it was the weeks, months, or years before. Ron had gray hair on his head and mustache. The killer's hair was described as reddish. Ron wore big boots up to his knees, although he may not have worn them if he did not know he would be crossing the creek that day. He wore another pair of boots on Inside Edition that do not match up to the killer shoes. Also, Ron's shoes and feet look bigger compared to Bridge Guy's. Continued reasons against Ron being the killer. Ron's waist and stomach looks bigger, and that's without a coat. The jeans he wore on March 17th on Inside Edition are darker blue than the killer's jeans, and his left pocket appears to be worn out from him constantly having his wallet or other items in there. His cell phone seems to be in the other pocket. Most 77-year-old men don't have a large selection of jeans, and the pairs they have are the same style and color. I don't think the killer's and Ron's jeans are similar. And some people just put their fingers on their keyboard to write a comment that they disagree with me, which I'm fine with that, but I just really feel like most older men don't have a huge selection of clothes, and the clothes that they do have are similar, and in this case, they do not match what the killer was wearing. Ron's camouflage hat seems to be his everyday hat, and it does not match the killer's hat. If Ron wore that hat in the bridge video, wouldn't he throw out the hat with the other clothes used in the murder? Obviously, the killer did not know he was on video, so there wouldn't have been a reason for Ron to throw out the hat 
until the two photos of Bridge Guy were released on February 22nd, but he was still wearing it in March when he was doing multiple TV interviews. The white pin on his hat does not match up with the white on the killer's hat. Also, witnesses described the killer's hat style was a painter's hat, not a baseball style hat with a large brim in the front like Ron had, which covered his face when he looked down. The SS means I have a screenshot of that. Why didn't police arrest him in five years? That means they didn't think it was him. Why did he agree to do multiple TV interviews, including saying down the hill if he was guilty? The witnesses on the trail likely would have followed the case and would have recognized Ron as the man they saw on the trail. Here are even more things against Ron being the killer. The April 2019 press conference introduced the younger guy sketch. So why would police say the suspect looks 20 years old if you think a 77-year-old man did it? If police had fibers, hairs, and DNA from the crime scene, they easily could have collected DNA from Ron's home and pets to compare. Two internet sleuths, you gotta watch out for those people, stopped in Ron's driveway and recorded audio asking him questions, and he said, quote, I don't understand why they did not find them the night before. Where did they take them? End quote. So if he was involved in the murders and he knew the answer, or he had encountered their bodies the night of the 13th searching on his own, why would he ask this question? Several weeks after Ron's death in 2022, Doug Carter said this about the killer, quote, they're watching, we'll get him soon. If police thought it was Ron, why would they say that when he's dead? In May 2022, Doug Carter continued, quote, I would like to remind the public that this is an active and ongoing investigation, and we will do everything we can to protect its integrity and to not try it in the court of public opinion. We cannot publicly convict someone, it seems like he was alluding to Ron, based on a single document, Ron's warrant, which was not released by investigators because it was released by a podcast. Gotta watch out for those podcasts. Continuing even more with reasons against Ron being the killer. The warrant said that the girls' bodies were staged. So if Ron killed them at 2.30ish, why would he stage them at 2.30 to 3 if he thought he would move them later during the night? This is using a possible scenario of him killing them, then immediately thinking he needed an alibi for that time, so he went to the aquarium store to get a receipt. Knowing that the action of driving there while suspended would get him arrested for a probation violation, and then thought he could maybe come back during the middle of the night to move them, but it just doesn't make sense if he was the killer for him to stage them at either 2.30 or during the night. If you're confused about that one, so am I. Let's move on. <laughs> what would have been Ron's motive to kill the girls? Not wanting teenagers on the bridge or his property? Why would he murder them? He lived on that property for 53 years since he was 24 years old. Wouldn't there have been stories around town of him stalking teenagers over the prior five decades? He probably saw hundreds of people on the bridge from his property over the years and decades, but I doubt many crossed over onto his property. So he would have assumed that two missing teenage girls who were last seen on the bridge did not end up crossing a cold creek in February or go back over the bridge and then walk into the woods onto his property. If anyone heard the murders, it probably would have been Ron. He was home at that time. How long did his 209 phone call last? Did phone records show it was 15 minutes or more? So if he was inside talking and listening to someone on the phone, he would not have heard someone yelling outside since it was February and his doors and windows were likely closed. If he was outside with his animals, it is likely that he would have heard something. I'm not sure how loud the creek is from his house. This is my last slide of reasons against Ron being the killer. If police say his phone pinged at the bridge murder site, where did it ping between then and the Lafayette Aquarium? When did he leave home? The killer wore a somewhat similar jacket and colored hat as Ron, but they are not identical. The bodies were left on his property, so was someone trying to frame Ron and wear similar clothes to him? I know True Crime Jesus had a theory that some guys, flannel shirt guy, his brother, and the archaeologist, wanted to get Ron in trouble so his property would have to be sold and they could have it. I'm not sure that that was the reason, but it could be possible that some guy went there that day and planned to kill any young girls who went to the end of the bridge and tried to blame it on Ron. But that seems kind of hard to believe, although obviously people come up with the stupidest ideas. Ron said something in his interview in his driveway with those two women that seemed to show surprise that no one found the girls in the woods the night before. So why would he say that if he knew that he did it? So my final verdict is that Ron is not guilty. 
He is not the killer. He is not the guy on the bridge. Start typing your comments. In this section, I'm just going to review a few various topics. At the 2019 press conference, a woman in the audience said her friend drove by the CPS building every day and he saw a white truck parked there on the day of the murders. The language was kind of confusing where they said it was abandoned on the east side of County Road 300 North next to the Hoosier Heartland Highway. So I was confused, was it parked at CPS or was it abandoned on the right side of that road? Looking at an aerial map, so this is Hoosier Heartland Highway, CPS is around here, and 300 is here. So they said it was abandoned on the east side of 300. So instead of the east side of this road over here, I guess they meant it's on the east side of Hoosier Heartland Highway, and this is west side of 300. Tony Klein does have a 2006 white truck, but I'm not sure if he owned it in 2017. There were a lot of items in the killer's jacket. Wouldn't his DNA from inside the jacket and the shirt he was wearing have transferred to the items or signatures that he left at the scene, if he indeed left any kind of physical objects at the scene? This is a screenshot from the Indiana State Police website, and if you look here, there seems to be a white object that I've never really seen before to the left of his zipper. I did a negative image of it, and you can see here it's more noticeable, but I'm not sure what it is, or if it might be some kind of pixelation from the low quality of the video. Also, I was looking at the video again, and it seems kind of weird on the back part of his shoulder on the right side, it seems to separate. So is there something else back there? It doesn't seem like he could have a backpack on or anything from the back part of his jacket. It might just be pixelation. Was the killer really spotted on the trails after the murders? I don't think there has ever been any confirmation from police other than witnesses, but they did not say if it was before or after the killings, other than the one rumor about the 130 sighting by the teenage girl. So if Abby and Libby were killed over here, why would he go back over here and then take the trail all the way back here, passing a bunch of people as he goes back to CPS? Which police said the vehicle may have been there until five o'clock, two hours and 45 minutes after the killer encountered and killed the girls. So instead of the trails, did he maybe come back over here and go around and then come back up here and wait until he thought nobody was around Freedom Bridge and then he went back over to CPS? There has been some speculation that a motorist may have seen a guy walking on the side of Hoosier Heartland Highway, which may have even contributed to the sketch, but it's like, how can you see somebody's face if you're driving this way and they're walking this way, or if you're driving this way and it's on the other side of the highway? I'm not sure what to think, to be honest, but it seems odd if police think that he was there until five o'clock, so long after the murders. The initial wanted poster looking for the suspect said the height was 5'6 to 5'10, and weight was 180 to 220, with reddish-brown hair. I don't know that any of those three apply to the Kleins. This March 16th, 2022 article said, the FBI has confirmed it's removing personal identifiers about the man who is wanted in the Delphi deaths investigation. They're doing this at the request of Indiana State Police, so the public will focus on the sketch, picture, and voice recording. This means the current height, weight, and age of the man identified in the investigation are being removed from the current posters. Is it possible that they also removed it because they think it does not match up with Tony and they don't want him to have this as a defense, that they said that they were looking for somebody who does not match up to his stats? The Seeking Information poster for the FBI about Libby says the killer was wearing a hoodie. It does not mention a hat or the rumored painter's hat that witnesses said he was wearing. If you have followed the case, you may have heard about an incident where a woman was driving that night and she saw a man on the side of the road saying he was waiting for his dad to pick him up. People have wondered if that was the killer. According to the YouTube channel Fig Solves, he said he believes it was this guy, Aaron Roswarski, and that police have cleared him as a potential suspect. So if the Kleins are not involved in this, who else could be the killer? It seems like police are only looking into Kagan and Tony as potential suspects, and if it turns out not to be them, then police are clueless about who it could be. And if police thought it was someone else, why would they waste time in the 2020 interview with Kagan saying that they think it's Tony? And why would they ask the public for help in December 2021 with the Anthony Shaw's profile and asking to submit to the Delphi tip line? The killer had an unusual amount of items in his jacket, so he was likely there to do something out of the ordinary, whether a kidnapping, sexual assault, or murder. There was a rumor that Libby had clothing removed, could she have been the premeditated target? If premeditated against one of the girls, why did it have to happen that day? And if it was not the Kleins, how would the killer have known that she would be there that day? Was he also there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, hoping that she would show up? We've all seen the viewpoint of Libby filming the killer, 
But I tried to think of the perspective of the killer seeing two teenage girls at the end of the bridge. What would he have been thinking? What was his motivation? A kidnapping seems unrealistic to get two girls to walk back to a car at the CPS building or at the cemetery even, and hoping that there would be nobody else on a 10 minute trail. If it was a planned murder, why would a man, young or old, be so angry that he wanted to kill eighth grade girls? Is it the same guy who killed the Evansdale cousins? If Libby's motivation was to have a boyfriend, possibly by Valentine's Day, the day after the murders, it makes sense that she would be chatting with multiple guys, not just Anthony Schatz. So was the guy on the bridge another catfisher? If you saw my first video, you know that I tried to get a satellite image of the CPS building to see if you can get a clear image of what kind of vehicle was there, and unfortunately it was too blurry. With the latest developments about whether Kagan and his dad were at the grandparents' house, Kagan's house, or possibly another country club road house, I tried to get satellite images even though the quality is not good, and obviously as you can see, it's horrible. This is Tony's house, and the only available image is from 3.46 p.m. on February 13th, 2017. I noticed that Libby created her Facebook when she was only seven years old. So who knows how long she had been dealing with catfishers or maybe older men trying to solicit photos from her. On August 3rd, 2022, a new law came into effect called Homicide Victims Families Rights Act of 2021. So this bill establishes a framework for immediate family members of a victim of murder under federal law to request a review of the victim's case file if the murder were committed more than three years prior, the murder was investigated by a federal law enforcement entity, all probative investigative leads have been exhausted, and no likely perpetrator has been identified. This law probably applies more to some older cold cases that may have been ignored for decades, and it allows victims' families to request another review by another agency. I'm not sure that this would apply in the Delphi case. Some unanswered questions. Was Abby dating an 18-year-old? I saw a photo online with her and a taller guy, and some people speculated it was her boyfriend, but I've never seen confirmation. Were there photos on Libby's iCloud that were inappropriate that were dated recently before she reset her phone? I would assume that law enforcement looked at all of her photos, including iCloud, in case somebody other than the clients had sent her a photo. From December 2021, why are police only looking for girls who chatted with Anthony Schatz when Kagan's fake Emily Ann 45 profile initiated a lot of these conversations? So it looks like police may be making some progress with the clients and searching the river and maybe Kagan doing a plea deal, but there's been no confirmation from police that that is accurate. So how can this be solved? If there are certain objects that were left at the crime scene that are very unique, they need to release photos of the product. If somebody knows someone who had that same item, that could be a huge clue. It's been unsolved for over five years. So if the police only need one person to say, oh yeah, this guy in this area had that same unique item, that could stop wasting all this time trying to solve it other ways. Also, instead of just asking and putting out a press release to see if people dealt with Anthony Schott's account, law enforcement should be getting on those apps in that area and start sending messages to all the girls who are 18 to 24 years old, who were teenagers at this time, to ask them if they had dealt with Anthony Schatz or somebody else. That may lead to identifying the killer. I don't know if they are doing that or not, but it seems a lot more proactive instead of just hoping one of these girls might see a press release. So that's it from me and all of my latest updates. Hopefully somebody got something out of this because I spent so much time on it. And hopefully there will be a resolution soon. Thanks for watching.